Psalm 1 of Expositions on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Blessed is the man that hath not gone away in the counsel of the ungodly. This is to be understood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord man. Blessed is the man that hath not gone away in the counsel of the ungodly, as the man of the earth did who consented to his wife deceived by the serpent, to the transgressing the commandments of God, nor stood in the way of sinners. For he came indeed in the way of sinners, by being born as sinners are, but he stood not therein, for that the enticements of the world held him not, and hath not sat in the seat of pestilence. He willed not an earthly kingdom with pride, which is well taken for the seat of pestilence, for that there is hardly any one who is free from the love of the world and craves not human glory. For a pestilence is disease widely spread and involving all or nearly all. Yet the seed of pestilence may be more appropriately understood of hurtful doctrine, whose word spreadeth as a canker. The order, too, of the words must be considered, went away, stood, sat. For he went away when he drew back from God, he stood when he took pleasure in sin. He sat when confirmed in his pride. He could not go back unless set free by him who neither hath gone away in the counsel of the ungodly nor stood in the way of sinners nor sat in the seat of pestilence. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he will meditate by day and by night. The law is not made for a righteous man, says the apostle, but it is one thing to be in the law, another under the law. Whoso is in the law acteth according to the law. Whoso is under the law is acted upon according to the law. The one therefore is free, the other a slave. Again, the law which is written and imposed upon the servant is one thing. The law which is mentally discerned by him who needeth not its letter is another thing. He will meditate by day and by night, is to be understood either as without ceasing, or by day in joy, by night in tribulations. For it is said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. And of tribulation it is said, My reins also have instructed me, even until the night. And he shall be like a tree planted hard by the running streams of water. That is either very wisdom, which vouchsafed to assume man's nature for our salvation, that as man he might be the tree planted hard by the running streams of waters. For in this sense can that too be taken which is said in another psalm, The river of God is full of water. Or by the Holy Spirit, of whom it is said, He shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And again, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And again, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is, that asketh water of thee, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water, of which whoso drinketh shall never thirst, but it shall be made in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Or, by the running streams of waters, maybe by the sins of the people, because first the waters are called peoples in the apocalypse, and again by running stream is not unreasonably understood fall, which had relation to sin. That tree then, that is, our Lord, from the running streams of water, that is, from the sinful peoples, drawing them by the way into the roots of his discipline, will bring forth fruit, that is, will establish churches in his season, that is, after he hath been glorified by his resurrection and ascension into heaven. For then, by the sending of the Holy Ghost to the apostles, and by the confirming of their faith in him, and their mission to the world, he made the churches to bring forth fruit. His leaf also shall not fall, that is, his word shall not be in vain. For all flesh is grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower falleth, but the word of the Lord abideth for ever. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper, that is, whatsoever that tree shall bear, which all must be taken of fruit and leaves, that is, deeds and words. 
The ungodly are not so, they are not so, but are like the dust which the wind casteth forth from the face of the earth. The earth is here to be taken as that steadfastness in God, with the view to which it is said, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance, yea, I have a goodly inheritance. With the view to this it is said, Wait on the Lord and keep his ways, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the earth. With a view to this it is said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. A comparison, too, is derived hence. For as this visible earth supports and contains the outer man, so that earth invisible the inner man. From the face of the earth the wind casteth forth the ungodly, that is, pride, and that it puffeth him up, on his guard against which he, who was inebriated by the riches of the house of the Lord, and drunken of the torrent stream of its pleasures, saith, Let not the foot of pride come against me. From this earth pride cast forth him who said, I will place my seat in the north, and I will be like the Most High. From the face of the earth it cast forth him also, who, after that he had consented and tasted of the forbidden tree, that he might be as God, hid himself from the face of God that this earth has reference to the inner man, and that man is cast forth thence by pride, may be particularly seen in that which is written, Why is earth and ashes proud? Because in his life he cast forth his bowels. For whence he hath been cast forth, he is not unreasonably said to have cast forth himself. Therefore the ungodly rise not in the judgments. Therefore, namely, because as dust they are cast forth from the face of the earth. And well did he say that this should be taken away from them, which in their pride they court, namely, that they may judge, so that this same idea is more clearly expressed in the following sentence, nor sinners in the counsel of the righteous. For it is usual for what goes before to be thus repeated more clearly, so that by sinners should be understood the ungodly, what is before in the judgment should be here in the counsel of the righteous. Or if indeed the ungodly are one thing and sinners another, so that although every ungodly man is a sinner, yet every sinner is not ungodly. The ungodly rise not in the judgment, that is, they shall rise indeed, but not that they should be judged, for they are already appointed to most certain punishment. But sinners do not rise in the counsel of the just, that is, that they may judge, but peradventure that they may be judged, so that of these it were said, the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall then suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. As it is said, medicine knows health, but knows not disease, and yet disease is recognized by the art of medicine. In like manner can it be said that the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly he knoweth not. Not that the Lord is ignorant of anything, and yet he says to sinners, I never knew you, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. It is the same as if it were said, the way of the ungodly the Lord knoweth not. But it is expressed more plainly than this, should be not to be known of the Lord, namely to perish. And this is to be known of the Lord, namely to abide. So as that to be should appertain to the knowledge of God, but to his not knowing not to be. For the Lord saith, I am that I am, and I am hath sent me. End of Psalm 1. Psalm 2 of Exposition on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Why do the heathen rage and the people meditate vain things? The kings of the earth have stood up and the rulers taken counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. It is said why, as if it were said in vain. For what they wished, namely Christ's destruction, they accomplished not. For this is spoken of our Lord's persecutors, of whom also is made mention in the Acts of the Apostles. 
Let us break their bonds asunder and cast away their yoke from us. Although it admits of another acceptation, yet it is more fitly understood as in the person of those who are said to meditate vain things. So that, let us break their bonds asunder and cast away their yoke from us. Maybe, let us do our endeavor that the Christian religion do not bind us, nor be imposed upon us. He that dwelleth in the heavens shall laugh them to scorn, and the Lord shall have them in derision. The sentence is repeated, for he who dwelleth in the heavens, is afterwards put, the Lord, and for laugh them to scorn, is afterwards put, shall have them in derision. Nothing of this, however, must be taken of a carnal sort, as if God either laugheth with cheek and derideth with nostril, but it is to be understood of that power which he giveth to his saints, that they seeing things to come, namely, that the name and rule of Christ is to pervade posterity and possess all nations, should understand that those men meditate a vain thing. For this power whereby these things are foreknown is God's laughter and derision. He that dwelleth in the heavens shall laugh them to scorn. If by heavens we understand holy souls, by these God, as for knowing what is to come, will laugh them to scorn and have them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. For showing more clearly how he will speak unto them, he added, he will vex them, so that in his wrath is in his sore displeasure. But by the wrath and sore displeasure of the Lord God must not be understood any mental perturbation, but the might whereby he most justly avengeth by the subjugation of all creation to his service. For that is to be observed and remembered, which is written in the wisdom of Solomon. But thou, Lord of power, judgest with tranquility, and with great favor orderest us. The wrath of God, then, is an emotion which is produced in the soul which knoweth the law of God, when it sees this same law transgressed by the sinner. For by this emotion of righteous souls many things are avenged, although the wrath of God can be well understood of that darkening of the mind which overtakes those who transgress the law of God. Yet I am set by him as king upon Zion, his holy hill, preaching his decree. This is clearly spoken in the person of the very Lord our Savior Christ. But if Zion signify, as some interpret, beholding, we must not understand it of anything rather than the church where daily is the desire raised of beholding the bright glory of God, according to that of the Apostle, but we with open face beholding the glory of the Lord. Therefore the meaning of this is, yet I am set by him as king over his holy church, which for its eminence and stability he calleth a mountain. Yet I am set by him as king, I, that is, whose bands they were meditating to break asunder, and whose yoke is cast away preaching his decree, who doth not see the meaning of this, seeing it is daily practiced. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Although that day may seem to be prophetically spoken of, on which Jesus Christ was born according to the flesh, yet as today intimates presentality, and in eternity there is nothing past, as if it had ceased to be, or future, as if it were not yet, but present only, since whatever is eternal always is, a divine interpretation is given to that expression, Today have I begotten thee, whereby the uncorrupt in Catholic faith proclaims the eternal generation of the power and the wisdom of God, who is the only begotten Son. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance. This has at once a temporal sense with reference to the manhood which he took on himself, who offered up himself as a sacrifice in the stead of all sacrifices, who also maketh intercession for us, so that the words, Ask of me, may be referred to all this temporal dispensation, which has been instituted for mankind, namely, that the nation should be joined to the name of Christ, and so be redeemed from death and possessed by God. I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance, which so possess them, for their salvation, and to bear unto thee spiritual fruit, and to the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. The same repeated, the uttermost parts of the earth is put for the nations, but more clearly, 
that we might understand all the nations. And thy possession stands for thine inheritance. Thou shalt rule them with a rod of iron, with inflexible justice, and thou shalt break them like a potter's vessel. That is, thou shalt break in them earthly lusts and the filthy doings of the old man, and whatsoever hath been derived and inured from the sinful clay. Now understand ye kings, and now, that is, being now renewed, your covering of clay worn out, that is, the carnal vessels of error which belong to your past life. Now understand, ye who now are kings, that is, able now to govern all that is servile and brutish in you, able now too to fight, not as they who beat the air, but chastening your bodies and bringing them into subjection. Be instructed, all ye who judge the earth. This again is a repetition. Be instructed is instead of understand, and ye who judge the earth instead of ye kings. For he signifies the spiritual by those who judge the earth, for whatsoever we judge is below us, and whatsoever is below the spiritual man is with good reason called the earth, because it is defiled with earthly corruption. Serve the Lord with fear. Lest what is said, ye kings and judges of the earth, turn into pride, and rejoice with trembling. Very excellently is rejoice added. Lest serve the Lord with fear should seem to tend to misery. But again, lest this same rejoicing should run on to unrestrained inconsiderateness, there is added with trembling, that it might avail for a warning and for a careful guarding of holiness. It can also be taken thus, and now ye kings understand, that is, and now that I am set as king, be ye not sad, kings of the earth, as if your excellency were taken from you, but rather understand and be instructed. For it is expedient for you that ye should be under him by whom understanding and instruction are given you. And this is expedient for you, that ye lord it not with rashness, but that ye serve the Lord with all fear, and rejoice in bliss, most sure and most pure, with all caution and carefulness, lest ye fall therefrom into pride. Lay hold of discipline, lest at any time the Lord be angry, and ye perish from the righteous way. This is the same as understand and be instructed. For to understand and be instructed, this is to lay hold of discipline. Still, in that it is said, lay hold of, it is plainly enough intimated that there is some protection and defense against all things which might do harm, unless with so great carefulness it be laid hold of. Lest at any time the Lord be angry is expressed with a doubt, not as regards the vision of the prophet to whom it is certain, but as regards those who are warned, for they to whom it is not openly revealed are wont to think with doubt of the anger of God. This then they ought to say to themselves, let us lay hold of discipline, lest at any time the Lord be angry and we perish from the righteous way. Now, how the Lord be angry is to be taken has been said above, and ye perish from the righteous way. This is a great punishment, and dreaded by those who have had any perception of the sweetness of righteousness. For he who perisheth from the way of righteousness in much misery will wander through the ways of unrighteousness. When his anger shall be shortly kindled, blessed are all they who put their trust in him. That is, when the vengeance shall come, which is prepared for the ungodly and for sinners, not only will it not light on those who put their trust in the Lord, but it will even avail for the foundation and exaltation of a kingdom for them. For he said not, when his anger shall be shortly kindled, say for all they who put their trust in him, as though they should have this only thereby to be exempt from punishment. But he said blessed, in which there is the sum and accumulation of all good things. Now the meaning of shortly I suppose to be this, that it will be something sudden, whilst sinners will deem it far off and long to come. End of Psalm 2Psalm 3 of Expositions on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Psalm of David, when he fled from the face of Absalom, his son. The words, I slept and took rest, 
and rose for the Lord will take me up, lead us to believe that this psalm is to be more understood as in the person of Christ, for they sound more applicable to the passion and resurrection of our Lord than to the history in which David's flight is described from the face of his rebellious son. And since it is written of Christ's disciples, the sons of the bridegroom fast not as long as the bridegroom is with them. It is no wonder if by his undutiful son be here meant that undutiful disciple who betrayed him, from whose face, although it may be understood historically that he fled, when on his departure he withdrew with the rest of the mountain. Yet in a spiritual sense, when the Son of God, that is, the power and wisdom of God, abandoned the mind of Judas, when the devil wholly occupied him, as it is written, the devil entered into his heart, may be well understood that Christ fled from his face, not that Christ gave place to the devil, but on Christ's departure the devil took possession, which departure, I suppose, is called a flight in this psalm because of its quickness, which is indicated also by the word of our Lord, saying, that thou doest do quickly. So even in the common conversation we say of anything that does not come to mind, it has fled from me, and of a man of much learning we say, nothing flies from him. Wherefore truth fled from the mind of Judas when it ceased to enlighten him. But Absalom, as some interpret in the Latin tongue, signifies patris pax, a father's peace. And it may seem strange whether in the history of the kings when Absalom carried on war against his father, or in the history of the New Testament when Judas was the betrayer of our Lord, how father's peace can be understood. But both in the former place, they who read carefully see that David, in that war, was at peace with his son, who even with sore grief lamented his death, saying, O Absalom, my son, would God I had died for thee. And in the history of the New Testament, by that so great and wonderful forbearance of our Lord, and that he bore so long with him, as if good, when he was not ignorant of his thoughts, and that he admitted him to the supper, in which he committed and delivered to his disciples the figure of his body and blood. Finally, in that he received the kiss of peace at the very time of his betrayal. It is easily understood how Christ showed peace to his betrayer, although he was laid waste by the intestine war of so abominable a device. And therefore is Absalom called father's peace, because his father had the peace which he had not. O Lord, how are they multiplied that trouble me? So multiplied indeed were they, that even from the number of his disciples was not wanting, who was added to the number of his persecutors. Many rise up against me. Many say unto my soul, There is no salvation for him and his God. It is clear that if they had any idea that he would rise again, assuredly they would not have slain him. To this end are those speeches, Let him come down from the cross, if he be the Son of God. And again, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Therefore, neither would Judas have betrayed him if he had not been of the number of those who despised Christ, saying, There is no salvation for him in his God. But thou, O Lord, art my taker. It is said to God in the nature of man, for the taking of man is the word made flesh. My glory, even he calls God his glory, whom the word of God so took, that God became one with him. Let the proud learn who unwillingly hear when it is said to them, For what hath thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why didst thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? And the lifter up of my head. I think that this should be here taken of the human mind, which is not unreasonably called the head of the soul, which so inhered it, and in a sort, coalesced with the supereminent excellency of the word taking man that it was not laid aside by so great humiliation of the passion with my voice have i cried unto the lord that is not with the voice of the body which is drawn out with the sound of the verberation of the air but with the sound of the heart which to men speaks not but with god sounds as a cry by this voice susanna was heard and with this voice the Lord himself commanded that prayer should be made in closets, that is, in the recesses of the heart noiselessly. Nor would one easily say that prayer is not made with this voice, if no sound of words is uttered from the body, 
since even when in silence we pray within the heart, if thoughts interpose alien from the mind of one praying, it cannot be said, With my voice have I cried unto the Lord. Nor is this rightly said, save when the soul alone, taking to itself nothing of the flesh, and nothing of the aims of the flesh, in prayer speaks to God, where he only hears. Even this is called a cry by reason of the strength of its intention. And he heard me out of his holy mountain. We have the Lord himself called a mountain by the prophet. As it is written, the stone that was cut without hands grew to the size of a mountain. But this cannot be taken of his person unless peradventure he would speak thus, out of myself, as of his holy mountain, he heard me when he dwelt in me, that is, in this very mountain. But it is more plain and unembarrassed if we understood that God out of his justice heard, for it was just that he should raise again from the dead the innocent who was slain, and to whom evil had been recompensed for good, and that he should render to the persecutor a meet reward who repaid him evil for good. For we read, Thy justice is as the mountains of God. I slept and took rest. It may not be unsuitably remarked that it is expressly said, I, to signify that of his own will, he underwent death. According to that, therefore, doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Therefore saith he, You have not taken me as though against my will, and slain me. But I slept, and took rest, and rose, for the Lord will take me up. Scripture contains numberless instances of sleep being put for death. As the Apostle says, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, nor need we make any question why it is added, took rest, seeing that it has already been said, I slept. Repetitions of this kind are usual in Scripture, as we have pointed out many in the second psalm. But some copies have, I slept and was cast into a deep sleep, and different copies express it differently, according to the possible rendings of the Greek words, ego te ekamenithein ke hypnoso. Unless perhaps sleeping may be taken of one dying, but sleep of one dead, so that sleeping may be the transition into sleep, as awaking is the transition into wakefulness. Let us not deem these repetitions in the sacred writings empty ornaments of speech. I slept and took rest, as therefore well understood as I gave up myself to my passion, and death ensued, and I rose, for the Lord will take me up. This is the more to be remarked, how that in one sentence the psalmist has used the verb of past and future time, for he has said both, I rose, which is the past, and I will take me up, which is the future, seeing that assuredly the rising again could not be without that taking up. But in the prophecy, the future is well joined to the past, whereby both are signified, since things which are prophesied of as yet to come in reference to time are future, but in reference to the knowledge of those who prophesy, they are ready to be viewed as done. Verbs of the present tense are also mixed in, which shall be treated of in their proper place when they occur. I will not fear the thousands of people that surround me. It is written in the Gospels how great a multitude stood around him as he was suffering, and on the cross, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. It is not said to God, Arise, as if asleep or lying down, but it is usual in Holy Scripture to attribute to God what he doeth in us, not indeed universally, but where it can be done suitably, as when he is said to speak, when by his gift prophets speak, and apostles, or whatsoever messengers of the truth. Hence the text, Would you have proof of Christ, who speaketh in me? For he doth not say of Christ, by whose enlightening and order I speak, but he attributes at once the speaking itself to him, by whose gift he spake. Since thou hast spitten all who oppose me without a cause. It is not to be pointed as if it were one sentence, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, since thou hast smitten all who oppose me without a cause. For he did not therefore save him, because he smote his enemies, but rather he being saved, he smote them. Therefore it belongs to what follows, so that the sense is this, 
Since thou hast smitten all who oppose me without a cause, thou hast broken the teeth of the sinners. That is, thereby hast thou broken the teeth of the sinners. Since thou hast smitten all who oppose me, it is forsooth the punishment of the opposers, whereby their teeth have been broken. That is, the words of sinners rending with their cursing the Son of God, brought to naught, as it were to dust, so that we may understand teeth thus, as words of cursing, of which teeth the apostle speaks, If ye bite one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. The teeth of sinners can also be taken as the chiefs of sinners, by whose authority each one is cut off from the fellowship of godly livers, as it were incorporated with evil livers. To these teeth are opposed the church's teeth, by whose authority believers are cut off from the error of the Gentiles and divers' opinions, and are translated into that fellowship which is the body of Christ. With these teeth, Peter was told to eat the animals when they had been killed, that is, by killing in the Gentiles what they were and changing them into what he was himself. Of these teeth, too, of the church, it is said, thy teeth are as a flock of shorn sheep coming up from the bath, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. These are they who prescribe rightly, and as they prescribe, live. Who do what is written, let your works shine before men, that they may bless your Father which is in heaven. For moved by their authority who believe God, who speaketh and worketh through these men, and separated from the world to which they were once conformed, they pass over into the members of the church. And rightly, therefore, are they, through whom such things are done, called teeth like to shorn sheep. For they have laid aside the burdens of earthly cares, and coming up from the bath, from the washing away of the filth of the world by the sacrament of baptism, every one beareth twins. For they fulfill the two commandments, of which it is said, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, loving God with all their hearts and with all their soul and with all their mind, and their neighbor as themselves. There is not one barren among them, for much fruit they render unto God. According to this sense, then, it is to be thus understood. Thou hast broken the teeth of the sinners, that is, thou hast brought the chiefs of the sinners to naught, by smiting all who oppose me without a cause. For the chiefs, according to the gospel history, persecuted him, whilst the lower people honored him. Salvation is of the Lord, and upon thy people be thy blessing. In one sentence the psalmist has enjoined men what to believe, and has prayed for believers. For when it is said, Salvation is of the Lord, the words are addressed to men. Nor does it follow, and upon thy people to be thy blessing, in such wise as that the whole is spoken to men, but there is a change into prayer addressed to God himself. For the very people to whom it is said, Salvation is of the Lord, what else then doth he say but this? Let no man presume on himself, seeing that it is of the Lord to save from the death of sin. For wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But do thou, O Lord, bless thy people who look for salvation from thee. This psalm can be taken in the person of Christ another way, which is that whole Christ should speak. I mean, by whole with his body, of which he is the head, according to the apostle who says, Ye are the body of Christ and the members. He therefore is the head of this body. Wherefore, in another place he saith, But doing the truth in love, we may increase in him in all things. Who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body is joined together and compacted? And the prophet then at once the church and her head. The church founded amidst the storms of persecution throughout the whole world, which we know already to have come to pass, speaks, O Lord, how are they multiplied that trouble me? Many rise up against me, wishing to exterminate the Christian name. Many say unto my soul, There is no salvation for him in his God. For they would not otherwise hope that they could destroy the church, branching out so very far and wide, unless they believed that God had no care thereof. But thou, O Lord, art my taker, in Christ, of course. 
or into that flesh the church too hath been taken by the word, who was made flesh and dwelt among us, for that in heavenly places hath he made us to sit together with him. When the head goes before, the other members will follow. For who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Justly then does the church say, Thou art my taker, my glory. For she doth not attribute her excellency to herself, seeing that she knoweth by whose grace and mercy she is what she is. And the lifter up of mine head of him, namely who the firstborn from the dead ascended up into heaven. With my voice have I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me out of his holy mountain. This is the prayer of all the saints, the odor of sweetness, which descends up in the sight of the Lord. For now the church is heard out of this mountain, which is also her head, or out of that justice of God, by which both his elect are set free, and their persecutors punished. Let the people of God also say, I slept and took rest and arose, for the Lord will take me up. And they may be joined and cleave to their head, for to this people it is said, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall lay hold on thee. Since they are taken out of sinners, of whom it is said generally, but they that sleep, sleep in the night, let them say, moreover, I will not fear the thousands of people that surround me. Of the heathen, verily, that compass me about to extinguish everywhere, if they could, the Christian name. But how should they be feared when, by the blood of the martyrs in Christ, as by oil, the ardor of our love is inflamed? Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. The body can address this to its own head, for at his rising the body was saved who ascended up on high, led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. For this is said by the prophets in the secret purpose of God, and told that ripe harvest which is spoken of in the gospel, whose salvation is in his resurrection, who vouchsafed to die for us, shed out our Lord to the earth. Since thou hast smitten all who oppose me without a cause, thou hast broken the teeth of sinners. Now while the church hath rule, the enemies of the Christian name are smitten with confusion, and, whether their curses or their chiefs, brought to naught. Believe then, O man, that salvation is of the Lord, and thou, O Lord, may thy blessing be upon thy people. Each one, too, of us may say, when a multitude of vices and lusts leads the resisting mind and the law of sin, O Lord, how are they multiplied that trouble me? Many rise up against me. And since despair of recovery generally creeps in through the accumulation of vices, as though these same vices were mocking the soul, or even as though the devil and his angels, through their poisonous suggestions, were at work to make us despair, it is said with great truth, the many say unto my soul, there is no salvation for him in his God. But thou, O Lord, art my taker, for this is our hope, that he hath vouchsafed to take the nature of man, in Christ. My glory, according to that rule, that no one should ascribe aught to himself, and the lifter up of mine head, either of him who is the head of all of us, or of the spirit of each several one of us, which is the head of the soul and body. For the head of the woman is the man, and the head of the man is Christ. But the mind is lifted up, when it can be said already, with the mind I serve the law of God, that the rest of man may be reduced to peaceable submission. When in the resurrection of the flesh, death is swallowed up in victory. With my voice I have cried unto the Lord with that most inward and intensive voice, and he hath heard me out of his holy mountain, him through whom he hath succored us, through whose meditation he heard us. I slept and took rest, and rose, for the Lord will take me up. Who of the faithful is not able to say this? when he calls to mind the death of his sins and the gift of regeneration. I will not fear the thousands of people that surround me. Besides those which the church universally hath borne and beareth, each one also hath temptations, by which, when compassed about, he may speak these words, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. That is, make me to arise, since thou hast smitten all who oppose me without a cause. It is well in God's determinate purpose said of the devil and his angels, who rage not only against the whole body of Christ, but also against each one in particular. Thou hast broken the teeth of sinners. Each man hath those that revile him. 
he hath too the prime authors of vice, who strive to cut him off from the body of Christ. But salvation is of the Lord. Pride is to be guarded against, and we must say, My soul cleaved after thee, and unto thy people be thy blessing, that is, upon each one of us. End of Psalm 3 Psalm 4 of Expositions on the Book of Psalms. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the end, a psalm song to David. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For this end signifies perfection, not consumption. Now it may be a question whether every song be a psalm, or rather every psalm a song, whether there are some songs which cannot be called psalms, and some psalms which cannot be called songs. But the scripture must be attended to. If happily song do not donate a joyful theme, but those are called psalms which are sung to the psaltery, which the history as a high mystery declares the prophet David to have used, of which matter this is not the place to discourse, for it requires prolonged inquiry and much discussion. Now, meanwhile, we must look either for the words of the Lord man after the resurrection or of man in the church believing and hoping on him. Verse 1. When I called, the God of my righteous heard me. When I called, God heard me, the psalmist says, of whom is my righteousness? In tribulation thou hast enlarged me. Thou hast led me from the straits of sadness into the broad ways of joy. For tribulation and straitness is on every soul of man that doeth evil. But he who says, We rejoice in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, up to that where he says, Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us, he hath no straits of heart, they be heaped up on him outwardly by them that persecute him. Now the change of person, that is from the third person where he says, he heard, he passes at once to the second, where he says, Thou hast enlarged me. If it not be done for the sake of variety and grace, it is strange why the psalmist should first wish to declare to men that he had been heard, and afterwards address him who heard him, unless perchance when he had declared how he was heard. In this very enlargement of heart, he preferred to speak with God, that he might even in this way show what it is to be enlarged in heart, that is, to have God already shed abroad in the heart, with whom he might hold converse interiorly, which is rightly understood as spoken in the person of him who, believing on Christ, has been enlightened. But in that of the very Lord man whom the wisdom of God took, I do not see how this can be suitable, for he was never deserted by it, but as his very prayer against trouble is a sign, rather, of our infirmity, so also of that sudden enlargement of heart the same Lord may speak for his faithful ones, whom he has personated also when he said, I was in hunger, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink, and so forth. Wherefore here also he can say, Thou hast enlarged me. For one of the least of his, holding converse with God, whose love he has shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Have mercy upon me, and hear my prayer. Why does he again ask, when already he declared that he had been heard and enlarged? It is for our sakes of whom it is said, but if we hope for that we see not, we wait in patience. Or is it that in him who has believed that which is begun may be perfected? Verse 2. O ye sons of men, how long, heavy in heart! Let your error, says he, have lasted at least up to the coming of the Son of God. Why then any longer are ye heavy in heart? When will ye make an end of crafty wiles, if now when the truth is present ye make it not? Why do ye love vanity and seek a lie? Why would ye be blessed by the lowest things? Truth alone, from which all things are true, make it blessed. For vanity is of deceivers, and all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor, wherewith he labored under the sun? Why, then, are ye held back by the love of things temporal? 
Life all ye after the last things, as though the first, which is vanity and a lie. For you would have them abide with you, which all pass away, as doth a shadow. Verse 3. And know ye that the Lord has magnified his Holy One, whom but him whom he raised up from below, and placed in heaven at his right hand. Therefore doth he chide mankind, that they would turn at length from the love of this world to him. But if the addition of the conjunction, for he says, and know ye, is to any difficulty, he may easily observe in scripture that this manner of speech is usual in that language in which the prophet spoke. For you often find this beginning, and the Lord said unto him, and the word of God came to him, which joining by a conjunction when no sentence has gone before, to which the following one may be annexed. Peradventure admirably conveys to us that the utterance of the truth in words is connected with that vision which goes on in the heart. Although in this place it may be said that the former sentence, Why do ye love vanity and seek a lie? As if it were written, Do not love vanity and seek a lie. And being thus read, it follows in the most direct construction, And know ye that the Lord hath magnified his Holy One. But the interposition of the Dysalma forbids our joining this sentence with the previous one. For whether this be a Hebrew word, as some would have it, which means so be it, or a Greek word, which marks a pause in the psalmody, so as that psalma should be what is sung in psalmody. But diasama, an interval of silence in the psalmody, that as the coupling of voices in singing is called simsama, so their separation diasama where a certain pause of interrupted continuity is marked. Whether I say it be the former or the latter, or something else, this at least is probable, that the sense cannot rightly be continued and joined where the diasama intervenes. The Lord will hear me when I cry unto him. I believe that we are here warned that with great earnestness of heart, that is, with an inward and incorporeal cry, we should implore help of God. For... As we must give thanks for enlightenment in this life, so must we pray for rest after this life. Wherefore, in the person, either of the faithful preacher of the gospel or our Lord himself, it may be taken as if it were written, The Lord will hear you when you cry unto him. Verse 4. Be ye angry and sin not. For the thought occurred, Who is worthy to be heard? Or how shall the sinner not cry in vain unto the Lord? Therefore, be ye angry, saith he, and sin not, which may be taken two ways. Either, even if ye be angry, do not sin, that is, even if there arise an emotion in the soul, which now, by reason of the punishment of sin, is not in our power, at least let not the reason and the mind, which is after God's regenerated within, that with the mind we should serve the law of God, although with the flesh we as yet serve the law of sin consent thereunto, or repent ye, that is, be ye angry with yourselves for your past sins, and henceforth cease to sin. What you say in your hearts, there is understood, say ye. So that the complete sentence is, what ye say in your hearts, that say ye. That is, be ye not the people of whom it is said, with their lips they honor me, but their heart is far from me. In your chambers be pricked. This is what has been expressed already in heart. For this is the chamber of which our Lord warns, that we should pray within with closed doors. But be ye pricked refers either to the pain of repentance, that the soul in punishment should prick itself, that it be not condemned and tormented in God's judgment, or arousing that we should awake to behold the light of Christ as if pricks were made use of. But some say that not be ye pricked, but be ye opened is the better reading, because in the Greek Psalter it is katenegete, which refers to that enlargement of the heart in order that the shedding abroad of love by the Holy Ghost may be received. Verse 5. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and hope in the Lord. He says the same in another psalm. The sacrifice for God is a troubled spirit. Wherefore, that... This is the sacrifice of righteousness, which is offered through repentance, is not unreasonable here understood. 
what more righteous than that each one should be angry with his own sins rather than those of others, and that in self-punishment he should sacrifice himself unto God? Or are righteous works after repentance the sacrifice of righteousness? For the interposition of diasama, not unreasonably perhaps, intimates even a transition from the old life to the new life. That's on the old man being destroyed or weakened by repentance, the sacrifice of righteousness, according to the regeneration of the new man, may be offered to God. When the soul now cleansed offers and places itself on the altar of faith, to be compassed by heavenly fire, that is, by the Holy Ghost. So that this may be the meaning, offer the sacrifice of righteousness and hope in the Lord, that is, live uprightly and hope for the gift of the Holy Ghost, that the truth in which you have believed may shine upon you. But yet hope in the Lord is as yet expressed without explanation. Now what is hope for but good things? But since each one would obtain from God that good, which he loves, and they are not easy to be found who love interior goods, that is, which belong to the inward man, which alone should be loved, but the rest are to be used for necessity, not to be enjoyed for pleasure. Excellently did he subjoin when he had said, Hope in the Lord. Many say, Who showeth us good things? This is the speech, and this is the daily inquiry of all the foolish and unrighteous whether of those who long for the peace and quiet of a worldly life, and from the forwardness of mankind find it not, who even in their blindness dare to find fault with the order of events, when involved in their own deservings, they deem the times worse than these which are past, or of those who doubt and despair of that future life which is promised us, who are often saying, who knows if it's true, or who ever came from below to tell us this? Very inquisitively, then, and briefly, he shows, to those, that is, who have interior sight, what good things are to be sought. Answering their question, who say, who showeth us good things? The light of thy countenance, saith he, is stamped on us, O Lord. This light is the whole and true good of man, which is seen not with the eye, but with the mind. But he says, stamped on us as a penny is stamped with the king's image. For man was made after the image and likeness of God, which he defaced by sin. Therefore it is his true and eternal good, if by a new birth he be stamped. And I believe this to be the bearing of that which some understand skillfully. I mean that the Lord said on seeing Caesar's tribute money, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. As if he had said, in like manner as Caesar exacts from you the impression of his image, so also does God, that as the tribute money is rendered to him, so should the soul to God, illuminated and stamped with the light of his countenance. Verse 7. Thou hast put gladness into my heart. Gladness, then, is not to be sought, without by them who, being still heavy in heart, love vanity and seek a lie, but within, where the light of God's countenance is stamped. For Christ dwelleth in the inner man, as the apostle says, for to him doth it appertain to see truth, since he hath said, I am the truth. And again, when he spake in the apostle, saying, Would you receive a proof of Christ, who speaketh in me? He spake not, of course, from without to him, but in his very heart, that is, in the chamber where we are to pray. But men who doubtless are many, who follow after things temporal, know not to say aught else than, Who showeth us good things? When the true and certain good within their very selves they cannot see. Of these, accordingly, is most justly said, what he adds next. From the time of his corn, of wine, and oil, they have been multiplied. For the addition of his is not superfluous. For the corn is God's, inasmuch as he is the living bread which came down from heaven. The wine too is God's, for they shall be inebriated, he says, with the fatness of thine house. The oil too is God's, 
of which it is said, Thou hast fattened my head with oil. But those many who say, Who showeth us good things, and who see not that the kingdom of heaven is within them? These from the time of his corn of wine and oil are multiplied. For multiplication does not always betoken plentifulness, and not generally scantiness. When the soul given up to temporal pleasures burns ever with desire and cannot be satisfied, and distracted with manifold and anxious thought, is not permitted to see the simple good, such as the soul of which it is said, for the corruptible body presseth down on the soul, and the earthly tabernacle weigheth down the mind that museth on many things. A soul like this, by the departure and succession of temporal goods, that is, from the time of his corn, wine, and oil, filled with numberless idle fancies, is so multiplied that it cannot do that which is commanded. Think on the Lord in goodness, and in simplicity of heart seek him. For this multiplicity is strong, opposed to that simplicity. And therefore, leaving these, who are many, multiplied, that is, by the desire of things temporal, who says, Who showeth us good things, which are to be sought not with the eyes without, but with simplicity of heart within. The faithful man rejoices and says, verse 8, In peace together I will sleep and take rest. For such men justly hope for all manner of estrangement of mind from things mortal and forgetfulness of this world's miseries, which is beautiful and prophetically signified under the name of sleep and rest, where the most perfect peace cannot be interrupted by any tumult. But this is not had now in this life, but is to be hoped for after this life. This even the words themselves, which are in the future tense, show us. For it is not said either I have slept and taken rest, or I do sleep and take rest, but I will sleep and take rest. Then shall this corruptible put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. Then shall death be swallowed up in victory. Hence it is said, But if we hope for that we see not, we wait in patience. Wherefore, consistently with this, he adds the last words and says, Since thou, O Lord, in singleness hast made me dwell in hope. Here he does not say, Wilt make, but hast made. In whom then this hope now is, there will be assuredly that which is hoped for. And well does he say in singleness, for this may refer in opposition to those many who being multiplied from the time of his corn of wine and oil, say, Who showeth us good things? For this multiplicity perishes, and singleness is observed among the saints, of whom it is said in the Acts of the Apostles, and of the multitude of them that believed, there was one soul and one heart. In singleness then, and simplicity removed, that is, from the multitude and crowd of things, that are born and die, we ought to be lovers of eternity in unity if we desire to cleave to the one God and our Lord. End of Psalm 4psalm 5 of Expositions on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. The title of Psalm is For Her Who Receiveth the Inheritance. The church then is signified who receiveth for her inheritance eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, that she may possess God himself, in cleaving to whom she may be blessed. According to that, blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the earth. What earth but that of which it is said, Thou art my hope, my portion in the land of the living. And again more clearly, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. And conversely, the word church is said to be God's inheritance. According to that, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. Therefore is God said to be our inheritance, because he feedeth and sustaineth us. And we are said to be God's inheritance, because he ordereth and ruleth us. Wherefore, it is the voice of the church in this psalm called to her inheritance, that she too may herself become the inheritance of the Lord. Verse 1. Hear my words, O Lord. Being called, she calleth upon the Lord, that the same Lord, being her helper, 
she may pass through the wickedness of this world and attain unto him. Understand my cry. The psalmist well shows what this cry is, how from within, from the chamber of the heart, without the body's utterance, it reaches unto God, and the bodily voice is heard, but the spiritual is understood. Although this too may be God's hearing, not with carnal ear, but in the omnipresence of his majesty. Attend thou to the voice of my supplication. That is, to that voice which he maketh request that God would understand, of which what the nature is he hath already intimated, when he said, verse 2, Understand my cry, attend thou to the voice of my supplication, my King and my God. Although both the Son is God, and the Father God, and the Father and the Son together one God, and if asked of the Holy Ghost, we must give no other answer than that he is God. And when the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are mentioned together, we must understand nothing else than one God. Nevertheless, Scripture is wont to give the appellation of King to the Son, according then to that which is said, By me man cometh to the Father. Rightly it is first my King, and then my God. And yet has not the psalmist said, Attend ye, but attend thou. For the Catholic faith preaches not two or three gods, but the very Trinity, one God. Not that the same Trinity can be together, now the Father, now the Son, now the Holy Ghost, as Sibelius believed. But that Father must be none but the Father, and the Son, none but the Son, and the Holy Ghost, none but the Holy Ghost, and this Trinity but one God. Hence, when the Apostle has said, Of whom are all things, by whom are all things, in whom are all things, he is believed to have conveyed an intimation of the very Trinity, Yet he did not add, To them be glory, but to him be glory, because I will pray unto thee. Verse 3. O Lord, in the morning thou wilt hear my voice. What does that which he said above, Hear thou, mean, as if he desired to be heard immediately? But now he saith, In the morning thou wilt hear. Not hear thou, and I will pray unto thee. Not I do pray unto thee. And, as follows, in the morning I will stand by thee and will see. Not I do stand by thee and do see. Unless perhaps this former prayer marks the invocation itself, but being in darkness amidst the storms of this world, he perceives that he does not see what he desires, and yet does not cease to hope. For hope that is seen is not hope. Nevertheless, he understands why he does not see, because the night is not yet past, that is, the darkness which our sins have merited. He says, therefore, because I will pray unto thee, O Lord, that is, because thou art so mighty, to whom I shall make my prayer, in the morning thou wilt hear my voice. Thou art not he, he says, that can be seen by those from whose eyes the night of sins is not yet withdrawn. When the night then of my error is past, and the darkness gone, which by my sins I have brought upon myself, then thou wilt hear my voice. Why then did he say above not, Thou wilt hear, but hear thou? It is that after the church cried out, Hear thou, and was not heard, she perceived what must needs pass away, to enable her to be heard. Or is it that she was heard above, but doth not yet understand that she was heard, because she doth not yet see by whom she hath been heard? And what she now says, In the morning thou wilt hear, she would have thus taken. In the morning I shall understand that I have been heard. Such is that expression, Arise, O Lord, that is, make me arise. But this latter is taken of Christ's resurrection. But, at all events, that scripture, The Lord your God proveth you, that he may know whether ye love him, cannot be taken in any other sense than that ye by him may know, and that it may be evident to yourselves 
what progress ye have made in his love. In the morning I will stand by thee, and will see. What is, I will stand, but I will not lie down. Now, what else is to lie down but to take rest on the earth, which is a seeking happiness in earthly pleasures? I will stand by, he says, and will see. We must not then cleave to things earthly, if we would see God, who is beheld by a clean heart. Verses 5 and 6. For thou art not a God who hath pleasure in iniquity. The malignant man shall not dwell near thee, nor shall the unrighteous abide before thine eyes. Thou hatest all that work iniquity. Thou wilt destroy all that speak a lie. The man of blood and the crafty man the Lord will abominate. Iniquity, malignity, lying homicide craft, and all the like are the night of which we speak on the passing away of which the morning dawns, that God may be seen. He has unfolded the reason, then why he will stand by in the morning and see. For he says, Thou art not a God who has pleasure in iniquity. For if he were a God who had pleasure in iniquity, he could be seen even by the iniquitous, so that he would not be seen in the morning, that is, when the night of iniquity is over. The malignant man shall not dwell near thee. That is, he shall not so see as to cleave to thee. Hence follows, nor shall the unrighteous abide before thine eyes. For their eyes, that is, their mind is beaten back by the light of truth, because of the darkness of their sins, by the habitual practice of which they are not able to sustain the brightness of right understanding. Therefore, even they who see sometimes that is, who understand the truth, are yet still unrighteous. They abide not therein through love of those things which turn away from truth, for they carry about with them their night, that is, not only the habit, but even the love of sinning. But if this night shall pass away, that is, if they shall cease to sin, and this love and habit thereof be put to flight, the morning dawns, so that they not only understand, but also cleave to the truth. Thou hast hated all that work iniquity. God's hatred may be understood from that form of expression by which every sinner hates the truth. For it seem that she too hates those whom she suffers not to abide in her. Now they do not abide who cannot bear the truth. Thou wilt destroy all that speak a lie. For this is the opposite to truth. But lest anyone should suppose that any substance or nature is opposed to truth, let him understand that a lie has relation to that which is not, not to that which is. For if that which is be spoken, truth is spoken. But if that which is not be spoken, it is a lie. Therefore saith he, Thou wilt destroy all that speak a lie because, drawing back from that which is, they turn aside to that which is not. Many lies, indeed, seem to be for someone's safety or advantage, spoken not in malice, but in kindness. Such was that of those midwives in Exodus, who give a false report to Pharaoh, to the end that the infants of the children of Israel might not be slain. But even these are praised not for the fact, but for the disposition shown, since those who only lie in this way will attain in time to a freedom from all lying. For in those that are perfect, not even these lies are found. For to these it is said, Let there be in your mouth yea, yea, nay, nay. Whatsoever is more is of evil. Nor is it without reason written in another place, The mouth that lieth slayeth the soul. Lest any should imagine that the perfect and spiritual man ought to lie for this temporal life, in the death of which no soul is slain, neither his own nor another's. But since it is one thing to lie, another to conceal the truth, if indeed it be one thing to say what is false, another not to say what is true, if happily one does not wish to give a man up even to this visible death, he should be prepared to conceal what is true, not to say what is false so that he may neither give up him nor a lie, lest he slay his own soul for another's body. But if he cannot yet do this, 
let him at all events admit only lies of such necessity that he may attain to be freed even from these if they alone remain and receive the strength of the holy ghost whereby he may despise all that must be suffered for the truth's sake in fine there are two kinds of lies in which there is no great fault and yet they are not without fault either when we are in jest or when we lie that we may do good that first kind in jest is for this reason not very hurtful because there is no deception for he to whom it is said knows that it is said for the sake of jest but the second kind is for this reason the more inoffensive because it carries with it some kindly intention that is to say truth that which has no duplicity cannot even be called a lie as if for example a sword be entrusted to any one and he promises to return it when he who entrusted it to him shall demand it if he chance to require his sword when in a fit of madness it is clear it must not be returned then lest he kill either himself or others until the soundness of mind be restored to him here then is no duplicity because he to whom the sword was entrusted when he promised that he would return it at the other's demand did not imagine that he could require it when in a fit of madness but even the lord concealed the truth when he said to the disciples not yet strong enough i have many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now and the apostle paul when he said i could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal whence it is clear that it is not blamable sometimes not to speak what is true but to say what is false it is not found to have been allowed to the perfect the man of blood and the crafty man the lord will abominate what he said above thou hast hated all that work iniquity thou wilt destroy all that speak a lie may well seem to be repeated here so that one may refer the man of blood to the worker of iniquity and the crafty man to the lie for it is craft when one thing is done another pretended he used an apt word too when he said will abominate for the disinherited are usually called abominated now this psalm is for her who receiveth the inheritance and she adds the exulting joy of her hope in saying verse seven but i in the multitude of thy mercy will enter into thine house in the multitude of mercy perhaps he means in the multitude of perfected and blessed men of whom that city shall consist of which the church is now in travail and is bearing few by few now that many men regenerated and perfect are rightly called the multitude of god's mercy who can deny when it is most truly said what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him i will enter into thine house as a stone into a building i suppose is the meaning for what else is the house of god than the temple of god of which it is said for the temple of god is holy which temple ye are of which building he is the cornerstone whom the power and wisdom of god coeternal with the father assumed i will worship at thy holy temple in thy fear the temple we understand as near the temple for he does not say i will worship in thy holy temple but i will worship at thy holy temple it must be understood too to be spoken not of perfection but of progress towards perfection so that the words i will enter into thine house should signify perfection but that this may come to a happy issue i will first he says worship at thy holy temple and perhaps on this account he added in thy fear which is a great defense to those that are advancing towards salvation but when any one shall have arrived there in him comes to pass that which is written perfect love casteth out fear for they do not fear him who is now their friend to whom it is said henceforth i will not call you servants but friends when they have been brought through to that which was promised verse eight o lord lead me forth in thy justice because of mine enemies he has here sufficiently plainly declared that he is on his onward road that is in progress towards perfection 
not yet in perfection itself, when he desires eagerly that he may be led forth, but in thy justice, not in that which seems so to men, for to return evil for evil seems justice. But it is not his justice of whom it is said, He maketh his son to rise on the good and on the evil. For even when God punishes sinners, he does not inflict his evil on them, but leaves them to their own evil. Behold, the psalmist says, He travailed with injustice, he hath conceived toil, and brought forth iniquity, he hath opened a ditch, and digged it, and hath fallen into the pit which he wrought. His pain shall be turned on his own head, and his iniquity shall descend on his own pate. When then God punishes, he punishes as a judge those that transgress the law, not by bringing evil upon them from himself, but driving them on to that which they have chosen, to fill up the sum of their misery. But man, when he returns evil for evil, does it with an evil will, and on this account is himself first evil, when he would punish evil. Direct in thy sight my way. Nothing is clearer than that he here sets forth that time in which he is journeying onward. For this is the way which is traveled not in any regions of the earth, but in the affections of the heart. In thy sight, he says, direct my way, that is, where no man sees, who are not to be trusted in their praise or blame. For they can in no wise judge of another man's conscience, wherein the way toward God is traversed. Hence it is added, verse 9, for truth is not in their mouth. To whose judgment, of course, then, there is no trusting, and therefore must we fly within to conscience, and the sight of God, their heart is vain. How then can truth be in their mouth, whose heart is deceived by sin and the punishment of sin? Once men are called back by that voice, wherefore do ye love vanity and seek a lie? Their throat is an open sepulcher. It may be referred to significant gluttony, for the sake of which men often lie by flattery. And admirably has he said, an open sepulcher. For this gluttony is ever gaping with open mouth, not as sepulchres which, on the reception of corpses, are closed up. This also may be understood hereby, that with lying and blind flattery men draw to themselves those whom they entice to sin, and as it were devour them, when they turn them to their own way of living. And when this happens to them, since they sin, they die. Those by whom they are led along are rightly called open sepulchres, for themselves too are in a manner lifeless, being destitute of the life of truth. And they take in to themselves dead men, whom having slain by lying words and a vain heart, they turn unto themselves. With their tongues they deal craftily, that is, with evil tongues. For this seems to be signified when he says their own. For the evil have evil tongues, that is, they speak evil, when they speak craftily, to whom the Lord saith, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? Verse 10. Judge them, O God, let them fall from their own thoughts. It is a prophecy, not a curse, for he does not wish that it should come to pass, but he perceives what will come to pass. For this happens to them, not because he appears to have wished for it, but because they are such as to deserve that it should happen, for so also what he says afterwards, let all that hope in thee rejoice. He says by way of prophecy, since he perceives that they will rejoice. Likewise it is said prophetically, stir up thy strength and come, for he saw that he would come, although the words, let them fall from their own thoughts, may be taken thus also, that it may rather be believed to be a wish for their good by the psalmist, whilst they fall from their own evil thoughts, that is, that they may no more think evil. But what follows, drive them out, forbids this interpretation, for it can in no wise be taken in a favorable sense that one is driven out by God, 
wherefore it is understood to be said prophetically, and not of ill will. When this is said, which must necessarily happen to such as choose to persevere in those sins which have been mentioned, let them therefore fall from their own thoughts, is let them fall by their own self-accusing thoughts, let their conscience also bearing witness, as the apostle says, and their thoughts accusing or excusing, in the revelation of the just judgment of God, according to the multitude of their ungodliness, drive them out, that is, drive them far away, for this is according to the multitude of their ungodliness, that they should be driven far away. The ungodly then are driven out from that inheritance which is possessed by knowing and seeing God. As diseased eyes are driven out from the shining of light, when what is gladness to others is pain to them, therefore these shall not stand in the morning and see. And that expression is as great a punishment as that which is said, but for me it is good to cleave to the Lord, is a great reward. To this punishment is opposed, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, for similar to this expulsion is, cast him into outer darkness. Since they have embittered thee, O Lord, I am, saith he, the bread which came down from heaven, again, Labor for the meat which wasteth not. Again, taste and see that the Lord is sweet. But to sinners the bread of truth is bitter. Whence they hate the mouth of him that speaketh the truth. These then have embittered God, who by sin have fallen into such a state of sickliness that the food of truth, in which healthy souls delight, as if it were bitter gall, they cannot bear. Verse 11 and let all rejoice that hope in thee. Those, of course, who taste the Lord is sweet, they will exalt forever, and thou wilt dwell in them. This will be the exaltation forevermore, when the just become the temple of God, and he their indweller will be their joy, and all that love thy name shall glory in thee, as when what they love is present for them to enjoy, and well is it said in thee, as if in profession of the inheritance, of which the title of the psalm speaks, when they too are his inheritance, which is intimated by, thou wilt dwell in them, from which good they are kept back, whom God, according to the multitude of their ungodliness, driveth out. Verse 12. For thou wilt bless the just man. This blessing to glory in God and to be inhabited by God, such sanctification is given to the just, but that they may be justified, a calling goes before, which is not of merit, but of the grace of God. For all have sinned, and want the glory of God, for whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Since then calling is not of our merit, but of the goodness and mercy of God, he went on to say, O Lord, as with the shield of thy good will, thou hast crowned us. For God's good will goes before our good will to call sinners to repentance. And these are the arms whereby the enemy is overcome, against whom it is said, Who will bring accusation against God's elect? Again, if God be for us, who can be against us? who spared not his only Son, but delivered him up for us all. For if, when we were enemies, Christ died for us, much more being reconciled, shall we be saved from wrath through him. That is, that unconquerable shield, whereby the enemy is driven back, when he suggests despair of our salvation, through the multitude of tribulations and temptations. The whole contents of the psalm, then, are a prayer that she may be heard, from the words, hear my words, O Lord, unto my King and my God, then follows a view of those things which hinder the sight of God, that is, a knowledge that she is heard, from the words, because I shall pray unto thee, O Lord, in the morning thou wilt hear my voice. Unto the man of blood and the crafty man the Lord will abominate. Thirdly, she hopes that she who is to be the house of God, even now, begins to draw near to him in fear. 
before that perfection which casteth out fear, from the words, But I, in the multitude of thy mercy, unto I will worship at thy holy temple in thy fear. Fourthly, as she is progressing and advancing amongst those very things which she feels to hinder her, she prays that she may be assisted within, where no man seeth, lest she be turned aside by evil tongues for the words, O Lord, lead me forth in thy justice because of my enemies, unto with their tongues they dealt craftily. Fifthly, is a prophecy of what punishment awaits the ungodly, when the just man shall scarcely be saved, and of what reward the just shall obtain, who, when they were called, came and bore all things manfully, till they were brought to the end from the words, Judge them, O God, until the end of the psalm. End of Psalm 5psalm six of expositions on the book of psalms by saint augustine this leave rocks recording is in the public domain to the end in the hymns of the eighth a psalm to david of the eighth seems here obscure for the rest of this title is more clear now it seemed to some to intimate the day of judgment that is the time of the coming of our lord when he will come to judge the quick and the dead which coming it is believed is to be after reckoning the years from adam seven thousand years so as that seven thousand years should pass as seven days and afterwards that time arrive as it were the eighth day but since it has been said by the lord it is not yours to know the times which the father hath put in his own power and but of the day and that hour knoweth no man no neither angel nor power neither the Son, but the Father alone. And again, that which is written, that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief, shows clearly enough that no man should arrogate to himself the knowledge of that time by any computation of years. For if that day is to come, after 7,000 years, every man could learn its advent by reckoning the years. What comes then of the sons even not knowing this? Which, of course, is said with this meaning, that men do not learn this by the Son, not that he himself doth not know it. According to that form of speech, the Lord your God trieth you that he may know, that is, that he may make you know, and arise, O Lord, that is, make us arise, when therefore the Son is thus said not to know this day, not because he knoweth not, but because he causeth those who know it not for whom it is not expedient to know it, that is, he doth not show it to them. What does this strange presumption mean? Which by reckoning up of years expects the day of the Lord as most certain after seven thousand years. Be we then willingly ignorant of that which the Lord would not have us know. Let us inquire what this title of the eighth means. The day of judgment may indeed even without any rash computation of years, be understood by the eighth. For that immediately after the end of the world, life eternal being attained, the souls of the righteous will not then be subject unto times. And since all times have the revolution and repetition of those seven days, that peradventure is called the eighth day, which will not have this variety. There is another reason, which may be here not unreasonably accepted, why the judgment should be called the eighth, because it will take place after two generations, one relating to the body, the other to the soul. For from Adam unto Moses, the human race lived of the body, that is, according to the flesh, which is called the outward and the old man, and to which the Old Testament was given, that it might prefigure the spiritual things to come by operations, albeit religions, yet carnal. Through this entire season, when men lived according to the body, death reigned. As the apostle saith, even over those that had not sinned. Now it reigned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. As the same apostle saith, For it must be taken of the period up to Moses, up to which time the works of the law, that is, those sacraments of carnal observance, held even those bound. 
for the sake of a certain mystery, who were subject to the one God. But from the coming of the Lord, from whom there was a transition from the circumcision of the flesh to the circumcision of the heart, the call was made that man should live according to the soul, that is, according to the inner man, who is also called the new man by reason of the new birth and the renewing of spiritual conversation. Now it is plain that the number four has relation to the body from the four well-known elements of which it consists and the four qualities of dry, humid, warm, cold. Hence, too, it is administered by four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter. All this is very well known, for of the number four relating to the body, we have treated elsewhere somewhat subtly, but obscurely, which must be avoided in this discourse, which we would have accommodated to the unlearned. But that the number three has relation to the mind may be understood from this, that we are commanded to love God after a threefold manner, with the whole heart, with the whole soul, with the whole mind, of each of which severally we must treat, not in the Psalms, but in the Gospels. For the present, for proof of the relation of the number three to the mind, I think what has been said enough. Those numbers, then, of the body, which have relation to the old man and the Old Testament being passed and gone, the numbers two of the soul, which have relation to the new man, and the New Testament being passed and gone, a sepentry, so to say, being passed, because everything is done in time, for having been distributed to the body, three to the mind, the eighth will come the day of judgment, which assigning to deserts their due, will transfer at once the saints, not to temporal works, but to eternal life, but will condemn the ungodly to eternal punishment in fear of which condemnation the church prays in this psalm and says, verse 1, Reprove me not, O Lord, in thine anger. The apostle, too, mentions the anger of the judgment. Thou treasurest up unto thyself, he says, anger against the day of the anger of the just judgment of God, in which he would not be reproved, whosoever longs to be healed in this life, nor in thy rage chasten me. Chasten seems rather too mild a word, for it availeth toward amendment. For for him who is reproved, that is accused, it is to be feared, lest his end be condemnation. But since rage seems to be more than anger, it may be a difficulty why that which is milder, namely chastening, is joined to that which is more severe, namely rage. But I suppose that one and the same thing is signified by the two words. For in the Greek, theomos, which is in the first verse, means the same as orgi, which is in the second verse. But when the Latins themselves, too, wished to use two distinct words, they looked out for what was akin to anger and rage was used. Hence copies vary. For in some, anger is found first, and then rage, in others, for rage, indignation, or challer is used. But whatever the reading... It is an emotion of the soul urging to the infliction of punishment. Yet this emotion must not be attributed to God as if to a soul of whom it is said, But thou, O Lord of power, judgest with tranquility. Now that which is tranquil is not disturbed. Disturbance then does not attach to God as judge. But what is done by his ministers, and that it is done by his laws, is called his anger in which anger the soul, which now prays, would not only be reproved, but not even chastened, that is, amended or instructed. For in the Greek it is pedosophes, that is, instruct. Now in the day of judgment all are reproved that hold not the foundation, which is Christ, but they are amended, that is, purged, who upon this foundation build wood, hay, stubble, for they shall suffer loss, but shall be saved as by fire. What then does he pray, who would not be either reproved or amended in the anger of the Lord? What else but that he may be healed? For where sound health is, neither death is to be dreaded, nor the physician's hand with caustics or the knife. He proceeds to say, verse 2, Pity me, O Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled that is, the support of my soul or strength, 
for this is the meaning of bones. The soul therefore says that her strength is troubled when she speaks of bones, for it is not to be supposed that the soul has bones such as we see in the body. Wherefore, what follows tends to explain it. Verse 3, And my soul is troubled exceedingly. Least because he mentioned bones, they should be understood as of the body. And now, O Lord, how long? Who does not see represented here a soul struggling with her diseases, but long kept back by the physician, that she may be convinced what evils she has plunged herself into through sin? For what is easily healed is not much avoided, but from difficulty of the healing there will be the more careful keeping of recovered health. God then, to whom it is said, And thou, O Lord, how long? must not be deemed as if cruel, but as a kind convincer of the soul, what evil she hath procured for herself. For the soul does not yet pray so perfectly as that it can be said to her, Whilst you are yet speaking, I will say, Behold, here I am, that she may at the same time also come to know, If they who do turn meet with so great difficulty, how great punishment is prepared for the ungodly, who will not turn to God. As it is written in another place, If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner and ungodly appear? Verse 4. Turn, O Lord, and deliver my soul. Turning herself, she prays that God, too, would turn to her. As it is said, Turn ye unto me, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord. Or it is to be understood accordingly to the way of speaking, Turn, O Lord, that is, make me turn, since the soul in this her turning feels difficulty and toil. For our perfect turning findeth God ready, as says the prophet, we shall find him ready as the dawn. Since it was not his absence who is everywhere present, but our turning away that made us lose him. He was in this world, it is said, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. If then he was in the world, and the world knew him not, our impurity doth not endure the sight of him. But whilst we are turning ourselves, that is, by changing our old life, are fashioning our spirit, we feel it hard and toilsome to be wrested back from the darkness of earthly lusts to the serene and quiet and tranquility of the divine light. And in such difficulty we say, Turn, O Lord, that is, help us, that that turning may be perfected in us, which findeth thee ready and offering thyself for the fruitation of them that love thee. And hence after he said, Turn, O Lord, he added, and deliver my soul. Cleaving, as it were, to the entanglements of this world and suffering in the very act of turning, from the thorns, as it were, of rending and tearing desires. Make me whole, he says, for thy pity's sake. He knows that it is not of his own merits that he is healed, for to him sinning and transgressing a given commandment was just condemnation due. Heal me, therefore, he says, not for my merit's sake, but for thy pity's sake. Verse 5. For in death there is no one that is mindful of thee. He knows, too, that now is the time for turning unto God. For when this life shall have passed away, there remaineth not a retribution for our deserts, but in hell who shall confess thee? That rich man of whom the Lord speaks, who saw Lazarus in rest, but bewailed himself in torments, confessed in hell. Yea, so as to wish even to have his brethren warned, that they might keep themselves from sin, because of the punishment which is not believed to be in hell, although therefore to no purpose. Yet he confessed that those torments had deservedly lighted upon him, since he had wished his brethren to be instructed, lest they should fall into the same. What then is, but in hell who will confess thee? Is hell to be understood as that place, whither the ungodly will be cast down after the judgment, when by reason of that deeper darkness they will no more see any light of God to whom they may confess aught? For as yet that rich man, by raising his eyes, although a vast gulf lay between, could still see Lazarus established in rest, by comparing himself with whom he was driven to a confession of his own deserts. 
it may be understood also as if the psalmist calls sin that is committed in contempt of god's law death so as that we should give the name death to the sting of death because it procures death for the sting of death is sin in which death this is to be unmindful of god to despise his law and commandments so that by hell the psalmist would mean that blindness of soul which overtakes and enwraps the sinner that is the dying as they did not think good the apostle says to retain god in their knowledge god give them over to a retrobate mind from this death and this hell the soul earnestly prays that she may be kept safe while she strives to turn to god and feels her difficulties wherefore he goes on to say verse six i have labored in my groaning as if this availed but little he adds i will wash each night my couch that is here called a couch where the sick and weak soul rests that is in bodily gratification and in every worldly pleasure which pleasure whoso endeavors to withdraw himself from it washes with tears for he sees that he already condemns carnal lusts and yet his weakness is held by the pleasure and willingly lies down therein from whence none but the soul that is made whole can rise as for what he says each night he would perhaps have it taken thus that he who ready in spirit perceives some light of truth and yet through weakness of the flesh rests some time in the pleasure of this world is compelled to suffer as it were days and nights in an alteration of feeling as when he says with the mind i serve the law of god he feels as it were day again when he says but with the flesh the law of sin he declines into night until all night passes away and that one day comes of which it is said in the morning i will stand by thee and will see for then he will stand but now he lies down when he is on his couch which he will wash each night that with so great abundance of tears he may obtain the most assured remedy from the mercy of god i will drench my bed with tears it is a repetition for when he says with tears he shows with what meaning he said above i will wash for we take bed here to be the same as couch above although i will drench is something more than i will wash since anything may be washed superficially but drenching penetrates to the more inward parts which here signifies weeping to the very bottom of the heart now the variety of tenses which he uses the past when he said i have labored in my groaning and the future when he said i will wash each night my couch the future again i will drench my bed with tears this shows what every man ought to say to himself when he labors in groaning to no purpose as if he should say it hath not profited when i have done this therefore i will do the other verse seven mine eye is disordered by anger it is by his own or god's anger in which he maketh petition that he might not be reproved or chastened but if anger in that place intimate the day of judgment how can it be understood now is it a beginning of it that men here suffer pains and torments and above all the loss of the understanding of the truth as i have already quoted that which is said god give them over to a retrobate mind for such is the blindness of the mind whosoever is given over thereunto is shut out from the interior light of god but not wholly as yet whilst he is in this life for there is outer darkness which is understood to belong rather to the day of judgment that he should rather be holy without god whosoever whilst there is time refuses correction now to be holy without god what else is it but to be in extreme blindness if indeed god dwell in inaccessible light whereinto they enter to whom it is said enter thou into the joy of thy lord it is then the beginning of this anger which in this life every sinner suffers in fear therefore of the day of judgment he is in trial and grief lest he be brought to that the disastrous commencement of which he experiences now and therefore he did not say mine eye is extinguished but my eye is disordered by anger but if he mean that his eye is disordered by his own anger 
there is no wonder either in this. For hence perhaps it is said, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Because the mind which from her own disorder is not permitted to see God, supposes that the inner sun, that is, the wisdom of God, suffers, as it were, a setting in her. I have grown old in all mine enemies. He had only spoken of anger, as if it were yet his own anger that he spoke. But thinking on his other vices, he found that he was entrenched by them all. Which vices, as they belong to the old life and the old man, which we must put off, that we may put on the new man, it is well said, I have grown old, but in all mine enemies. He means either amidst these vices, or amidst men who will not be converted to God. For these, even if they know them not, even if they bear with them, even if they use the same tables and houses and cities, with no strife arising between them, and in frequent converse together with seeming concord, notwithstanding, by the contrariety of their aims, they are enemies to those who turn unto God. For seeing that the one love and desire this world, the others wish to be freed from this world. Who sees not that the first are enemies to the last? Or if they can, they draw the others into punishment with them. And it is a great grace to be conversant daily with their words, and not to depart from the way of God's commandments. For often the mind, which is striving to go to Godward, being rudely handled in the very road, is alarmed, and generally fulfills not its good intent, lest it should offend those with whom it lives, who love and follow after other perishable and transient goods. From such every one that is whole is separated, not in space, but in soul. For the body is contained in space, but the soul's space is her affection. Wherefore, after the labor and groaning, and very frequent showers of tears, since they cannot be ineffectual, which is asked so earnestly of him, who is the fountain of all mercies. And it is most truly said, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. After difficulties so great, the pious soul, by which we may also understand the church, intimating that she has been heard, see what she adds. Verse 8. Depart from me, all ye that work iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. It is either spoken prophetically, since they will depart, that is, the ungodly will be separated from the righteous, when the day of judgment arrives, or for this present time. For though both are equally found in the same assemblies, yet on the open floor the wheat is already separated from the chaff, though it be hid among the chaff. They can, therefore, be associated together, but cannot be carried away by the wind together. For the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. Verse 9. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord hath received my prayer. The frequent repetition of the same sentiments shows not, so to say, the necessities of the narrator, but the warm feeling of his joy. For they that rejoice are wont so to speak, as that it is not enough for them to declare once for all the object of their joy. This is the fruit of that groaning in which there is labor, and those tears with which the couch is washed, and the bed drenched. For he that sows in tears shall reap in joy, and blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 10. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and vexed. He said above, Depart from me, all ye, which can take place, as it has been explained, even in this life. But as to what he says, let them be ashamed and vexed, I do not see how it can happen, save on that day when the rewards of the righteous and the punishments of the sinners shall be made manifest. For at present, so far are the ungodly from being ashamed that they do not cease to insult us. And for the most part, their markings are of such avail that they make the weak to be ashamed of the name of Christ. Hence it is said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me before men, of him will I be ashamed before my Father. But now whosoever would fulfill these sublime commands to disperse, to give to the poor, that his righteousness may endure forever, and the selling all his earthly goods and spending them on the needy, would follow Christ, saying, we brought nothing into this world, and truly we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. 
incurs the profane raillery of those men, and by those who will not be made whole is called mad, and often to avoid being so called by desperate men, he fears to do, and puts off that which the most faithful and powerful of all physicians hath ordered. It is not then at present that these can be ashamed, by whom we have to wish that we not be ashamed, and so be either called back from our proposed journey, or hindered or delayed. But the time will come when they shall be ashamed, saying, as it is written, These are they whom we had sometimes in derision, and a parable of reproach. We fools counted their life madness, and their end to be without honor. How are they numbered among the children of God, and their lot is among the saints? Therefore have we erred from the way of truth, and the light of righteousness hath not shined unto us, nor the sun risen upon us. We have been filled with the way of wickedness and destruction, and have walked through rugged deserts, but the way of the Lord we have not known. What hath pride profited us, or what hath the vaunting of riches brought us? All those things are passed away like a shadow. But as to what he says, let them be turned and confounded. Who would not judge it to be most righteous punishment that they should have a turning unto confusion? Who would not have one unto salvation? After this he added exceeding quickly, For when the day of judgment shall have begun to be no longer looked for, when they shall have said, Peace, then shall sudden destruction come upon them. Now whensoever it come, it comes very quickly, of whose coming we give up all expectation, and nothing makes the length of this life be felt but the hope of living, for nothing seems more quick than all that has already passed in it. When then the day of judgment shall come, then will sinners feel how that all the life which it passeth away is not long, nor will that any way possible seem to them to have come tardily, which shall have come without their desiring, or rather without their believing. Although it can too be taken in this place thus, that insomuch as God has heard, so to say, her groans and her long and frequent tears, she may be understood to be freed from her sins and to have tamed every disordered impulse of carnal affection. As she saith, Depart from me, all ye that work iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. And when she has had this happy issue, it is no marvel if she be already so perfect as to pray for her enemies. The words then, Let all mine enemies be ashamed and vexed, may have this meaning, that they should repent of their sins, which cannot be effected without confusion and vexation. There is then nothing to hinder us from taking what follows too in this same sense. Let them be turned and ashamed. That is, let them be turned to God and be ashamed that they, they sometime gloried in the former darkness of their sins. As the apostle says, For what glory had ye sometime in those things, of which ye are now ashamed? But as to what he added, exceeding quickly, it must be referred either to the warm affection of her wish, or to the power of Christ, who converteth to the faith of the gospel in such quick time the nations, which in their idols cause did persecute the church. End of Psalm 6. Psalm 7 of Expositions on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine. The sleeper box recording is in the public domain. A psalm to David himself, which he sung to the Lord, for the words of Chizzi, son of Gemini. Now the story which gave occasion to this prophecy may be easily recognized in the second book of Kings. For there Chizzi, the friend of King David, went over to the side of Absalom, his son, who was carrying on war against his father for the purpose of discovering and reporting the designs which he was taking against his father at the instigation of Achitophel, who had revolted from David's friendship, and was instructing by his counsel to the best of his power the son against the father. But since it is not the story itself which is to be the subject of consideration in this psalm, from which the prophet had taken a veil of mysteries, if we have passed over to Christ, let the veil be taken away. And first let us inquire into the signification of the very names, what it means. For there have not been wanting interpreters 
who, investigating these same words, not carnally according to the letter, but spiritually, declare to us that Chusi should be interpreted silence in Gemini right-handed Achitophel brother's ruin, among which interpretations Judas, that traitor, again meets us, that Absalom should bear his image according to the interpretation of it as father's peace, and that his father was full of thoughts of peace toward him, although he in his guile had war in his heart, as was treated of it in the third psalm. Now, as we find in the Gospels that the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ are called sons, so in the same Gospels we find they are called brethren also. For the Lord on the resurrection saith, Go and say to my brethren. And the apostle calls him the first begotten among many brethren. The ruin then of that disciple who betrayed him is rightly understood to be a brother's ruin, which we said is the interpretation of a ketavel. Now, as Chusi, from the interpretation of silence, is rightly understood that our Lord contended against the guile in silence, that is, in that most deep secret whereby blindness happened in part to Israel, when they were persecuting the Lord, that the fullness of the Gentiles might enter in, and so all Israel might be saved. When the apostle came to this profound secret and deep silence, he exclaimed as if struck with a kind of awe of its very depth, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Thus that great silence he does not so much discover by explanation, as he sets forth its greatness and admiration. In this silence the Lord, hiding the sacrament of his adorable passion, turns the brother's voluntary ruin, that is, his betrayer's impious wickedness, into the order of his mercy and providence, that what he with perverse mind wrought for one man's destruction, he might by providential overruling dispose for all men's salvation. The perfect soul, then, which is already worthy to know the secret of God, sings a psalm unto the Lord. She sings for the words of Chusi, because she has attained to know the words of that silence. For among unbelievers and persecutors, there is that silence in secret. But among his own to whom it is said, Now I call you no more servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Among his friends, I say, there is not the silence but the words of the silence, that is, the meaning of that silence set forth and manifested. Which silence, that is, Chusi, is called the son of Gemini, that is, right-handed. For what was done for the saints was not to be hidden from them. And yet he saith, Let not the left hand know what the right hand doeth. The perfect soul, then, to which that secret has been made known, sings in prophecy for the words of Chusi that is, for the knowledge of that same secret, which secret God at her right hand, that is favorable and propitious unto her, has wrought. Wherefore this silence is called the son of the right hand, which is Chusi the son of Gemini. Verse 1. O Lord my God, in thee have I hoped. Save me from all that persecute me and deliver me. As one to whom already perfected, all the war and enmity of vice being overcome, there remaineth no enemy but the envious devil. He says, Save me from all them that persecute me, and deliver me. Verse 2. Lest at any time he tear my soul as a lion. The apostle says, Your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Therefore when the psalmist said in the plural number, Save me from all them that persecute me, he afterwards introduced the single, saying, Lest at any time he tear my soul as a lion. For he does not say, Lest at any time they tear. He knew what enemy and violent adversary of the perfect soul remained, whilst there be none to redeem nor to save. That is, lest he tear me, whilst thou redeemest not, nor savest. For if God redeem not, nor save, he tears. And that it might be clear that the already perfect soul 
which is to be on her guard against the most insidious snares of the devil, only says this. See what follows. Verse 3. O Lord my God, if I have done this. What is it that he calls this? Since he does not mention the sin by name, are we to understand sin generally? If this sense displeases us, we may take that to be meant which follows, as if we had asked, What is this that you say this? He answers, If there be iniquity in my hands. Now then, it is clear that it is said of all sin. Verse 4. If I have repaid them that recompense me evil, which none can say with truth but the perfect. For so the Lord says, Be ye perfect, as your Father which is in heaven, who maketh his Son to rise upon the good and the evil, and reigneth on the just and the unjust. He then who repayeth not them that recompense evil is perfect. When therefore the perfect soul prays for the words of Chusi, the son of Gemini, that is, for the knowledge of that secret and silence, which the Lord, favorable to us and merciful, wrought for our salvation, so as to endure and with all patience bear the guiles of this betrayer, as if he should say to this perfect soul, explaining the design of this secret for the ungodly and a sinner, and thine iniquities might be washed away by my bloodshedding, in great silence and great patience I bore with my betrayer, Wilt not thou imitate me, that thou too mayest not repay evil for evil? Considering then that understanding what the Lord has done for him, and by his example going on to perfection, the psalmist says, If I have repaid them that recompensed me evil, that is, if I have not done what thou hast taught me by thy example, may I therefore fall by mine enemies empty. And he says, well, not if I have repaid them that do me evil, but who recompense. For whoso recompenseth had received somewhat already. Now it is an instance of greater patience, not even to repay him evil, who after receiving benefits returns good for evil, than if without receiving any previous benefit he had had a mind to injure. If therefore, he says, I have repaid them that recompense me evil, that is, if I had not imitated thee in that silence, that is, in thy patience, which thou hast wrought for me, may I fall by mine enemies empty. For he that is an empty boaster, who being himself a man, desires to avenge himself on a man, and whilst he openly seeks to overcome a man, is secretly himself overcome by the devil, rendered empty by vain and proud joy, because he could not, as it were, be conquered. The psalmist knows then where a greater victory may be obtained, and where the Father which seeth in secret will reward. Lest then he repay them that recompense evil, he overcomes his anger rather than another man, being instructed too by those writings, wherein it is written, Better is he that overcometh his anger than he that taketh a city. If I have repaid them that recompense me evil, may I therefore fall by my enemies empty. He seems to swear by way of execration, which is the heaviest kind of oath, as when one says, If I have done so and so, may I suffer so and so. By swearing in a swearer's mouth is one thing, in a prophet's meaning another. For he he mentions what will really befall man who repay them that recompense evil not what, as by an oath, he would imprecate on himself or any other. Verse 5. Let the enemy therefore persecute my soul and take it. By again naming the enemy in the singular number, he more and more clearly points out him whom he spoke of above as a lion. For he persecutes the soul, and if he has deceived it, will take it. For the limit of men's rage is the destruction of the body. But the soul, after this visible death, they cannot keep in their power. Whereas, whatever souls the devil shall have taken by his persecutions, he will keep. And let him tread my life upon the earth. That is, by treading, let him make my life earth. That is to say, his food. For he is not only called a lion, but a serpent too, to whom it was said, Earth shalt thou eat. And to the sinner it was said, 
earth thou art, and unto earth shalt thou go. And let him bring down my glory to the dust. This is that dust which the wind casteth forth from the face of the earth, to wit, vain and silly boasting of the proud, puffed up, not with solid weight, as a cloud of dust carried away by the wind. Justly then has he here spoken of the glory which he would not have brought down to dust, for he would have it solidly established in conscience before God, where there is no boasting. He that glorieth, say that the apostle, let him glory in the Lord. This solidly is brought down to the dust, if one through pride despising the secrecy of conscience, where God only proves a man, desires to glory before men. Hence comes what the psalmist elsewhere says, God shall bruise the bones of them that displease men. Now he that has well learnt or experienced the steps in overcoming vices knows that his vice of empty glory is either alone or, more than all, to be shunned by the perfect. For that by which the soul first fell, she overcomes the last. For the beginning of all sin is pride, and again the beginning of man's pride is to depart from God. Verse 6. Arise, O God, in thine anger. Why yet does he, who we say is perfect, incite God to anger? Must we not see whether he rather be not perfect, who, when he was being stoned, said, O Lord, lay not this sin to their charge? Or does the psalmist pray thus, not against men, but against the devil and his angels, whose possession sinners and the ungodly are? He then does not pray against him in wrath, but in mercy. Whosoever prays that that possession may be taken from him by that Lord, who justifieth the ungodly. For when the ungodly is justified, from ungodly he is made just, and from being the possession of the devil he passes into the temple of God. And since it is a punishment that a possession, in which one longs to have rule, should be taken away from him, this punishment that he should cease to possess those whom he now possesses, the psalmist calls the anger of God against the devil. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Arise, he has used it as a peer, in words that is human and obscure, as though God sleeps when he is unrecognized and hidden in his secret workings. Be exalted in the borders of mine enemies. He means by borders the possession itself in which he wishes that God should be exalted, that is, be honored and glorified rather than the devil while the ungodly are justified and praise God. And arise, O Lord my God, in the commandment that thou hast given. That is, since thou hast enjoined humility, appear in humility, and first fulfill that thou hast enjoined, that men by thy example overcoming pride may not be possessed of the devil, who against thy commandments advised to pride, saying, Eat, and your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, and the congregation of the people shall surround thee. This may be understood in two ways, for the congregation of people can be taken either of them that believe or of them that persecute, both of which took place in the same humiliation of our Lord, in contempt of which the multitude of them that persecute surround him, concerning which it is said, Why have the heathen raged and the people meditated vain things? But of them that believe through his humiliation, the multitude so surrounded him that it could be said with the greatest truth, blindness in part is happened unto Israel that the fullness of the Gentiles might come in. And again, ask of me, and I will give thee the Gentiles for thine inheritance and the boundaries of the earth for thy possession. And for their sakes, return thou on high, that is, for the sake of this congregation, return thou on high, which he is understood to have done by his resurrection and ascension into heaven. For being thus glorified, he gave the Holy Ghost, which before his exaltation could not be given, as it is written in the Gospel. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Having then returned on high for the sake of the congregation of the people, he sent the Holy Ghost, by whom the preachers of the Gospel, being filled, filled the whole world with churches. It can be taken also in this sense. 
Arise, O Lord, in thine anger, and be exalted in the borders of mine enemies. That is, arise in thine anger, and let not mine enemies understand thee. So that to be exalted should be this, become high, that thou mayest not be understood, which has reference to the silence spoken of above. For it is of this exaltation thus said in another psalm, And he ascended upon cherubim, and flew, and he made darkness his secret place. In which exaltation or concealment, when their sins desert, they shall not understand thee. Who shall crucify thee? The congregation of believers shall surround thee. For in his very humiliation he was exalted, that is, was not understood. So that, and arise, O my Lord, and the commandment that thou hast given may have reference to this, that is, when thou showest thyself be high or deep, that mine enemies may not understand thee. Now sinners are the enemies of the just man, and the ungodly of the godly man, and the congregation of the people shall surround thee. That is, by this very circumstance, that those who crucify thee understand thee not. The Gentiles shall believe on thee, and so shall the congregation of the people surround thee. But what follows, if this be the true meaning, has in it more pain that it begins already to be perceived than joy that it is understood. For it follows, and for their sakes return thou on high, that is, and for the sake of this congregation of the human race, wherewith the churches are crowded, return thou on high, that is, again cease to be understood. What then is, and for their sakes, but that this congregation too will offend thee, so that thou mayest most truly foretell and say, Thinkest thou when the Son of Man shall come, he will find faith on the earth. Again of the false prophets who are understood to be heretics, he says, Because of their iniquity, the love of many shall wax cold. Since then, even in the churches, that is, in the congregation of the peoples and nations, where the Christian name has most widely spread, there shall be so great abundance of sinners, which is already in great measure perceived, is not that famine of the word here predicted, which has been threatened by another prophet also. Is it not too, for this congregation's sake, who by their sins are estranging from themselves the light of truth, that God returns on high, that is, so that faith, pure and cleansed from the corruption, of all perverse opinions is held and received, either not at all or by the very few of whom it was said, Blessed is he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Not without cause, then, is it said, and for the sake of this congregation return thou on high, that is, again withdraw into the depth of thy secrecy, even for the sake of this congregation of the peoples, that hath thy name, and doeth not thy deeds. But whether the former exposition of this place or the last be the more suitable, without prejudice to any one better or equal or as good, it follows very consistently, the Lord judgeth the people. For whether he returned on high, when after the resurrection he ascended into heaven, well does it follow, the Lord judgeth the people, for that he will come from thence to judge the quick and the dead. Or whether he return on high, when the understanding of the truth leaves sinful Christians. For that of his coming it has been said, Thinkest thou the Son of Man on his coming will find faith on the earth? The Lord then judgeth the people. What Lord but Jesus Christ? For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Wherefore this soul which prayeth perfectly, see how she fears not the day of judgment, and with a truly secure longing says in her prayer, Thy kingdom come, judge me. She says, O Lord, according to my righteousness. And the former psalm, a weak one, was entreating, imploring rather the mercy of God than mentioning any desert of his own. Since the Son of God came to call sinners to repentance, therefore he had there said, Save me, O Lord, for thy mercy's sake. That is, not for my desert's sake, but now since being called, he hath held and kept the commandments which he received. He is bold to say, Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, and according to my harmlessness that is upon me. 
This is true harmlessness, which harms not even an enemy. Accordingly well does he require to be judged according to this harmlessness, who could say with truth, If I have repaid them that recompense me evil. As for what he added, that is upon me. It can refer not only to harmlessness, but can be understood also with reference to righteousness. That the sense should be this, Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my harmlessness, when righteousness and harmlessness is upon me. By which addition he shows that this very thing, that the soul is righteous and harmless, she has not by herself, but by God who giveth brightness and light. For of this he says in another psalm, Thou, O Lord, will light my candle. And of John it is said, He that was the light, but bore witness of the light. He was a burning and shining candle. That light then, when souls as candles are kindled, shines forth not with borrowed, but with original brightness, which light is truth itself. It is then so said, according to my righteousness and according to my harmlessness, that is upon me. As if a burning and shining candle should say, Judge me according to the flame which is upon me, that is, not that wherewith I am myself, but that whereby I shine enkindled of thee. Verse 9. But let the wickedness of sinners be consumed. He says, be consumed, be completed, according to that in the Apocalypse. Let the righteousness become more righteous, and let the filthy be filthy still. For the wickedness of those men appears consummate, who crucified the Son of God. But greater is theirs who will not live uprightly and hate the precepts of truth, for whom the Son of God was crucified. Let the wickedness of sinners, then, he say, be consummated, that is, arrive at the height of wickedness, that just judgment may be able to come at once. But since it is not only said, let the filthy be filthy still, but it is said also, let the righteous become more righteous, he joins on the words, and thou shalt direct the righteous, O God who searcheth the hearts and reins. How then can the righteous be directed but in secret? When even by means of those things, which in the commencement of Christian ages, when as yet the saints were oppressed by the persecution of men of this world, appeared marvelous to men. Now that the Christian name has begun to be in such high dignity, hypocrisy, that is, pretense, has increased. Of those, I mean, who, by the Christian profession, had rather please men than God. How, then, is the righteous man directed in so great confusion of pretense, save whilst God searcheth the hearts and reins, seeing all men's thoughts, which are meant by the word heart, and their delights, which are understood by the word reins? For the delight in things temporal and earthly is rightly ascribed to the reins, for that is both the lower part of man and that region where the pleasure of carnal generation dwells, through which man's nature is transferred into this life of care, and deceiving joy by the succession of the race. God then searching our hearts and perceiving that it is there where our treasure is, that is, in heaven, searching also the reins and perceiving that we do not assent to flesh and blood, but delight ourselves in the Lord, directs the righteous man in his inward conscience before him, where no man seeth, but he alone who perceiveth what each man thinketh, and what delighteth each. For delight is the end of care, because to this end does each man strive by care and thought, that he may attain to his delight. He therefore seeth our cares, who searcheth the heart, he seeth too the ends of cares, that is, delights, who narrowly searcheth the reins, that when he shall find that our cares incline neither to the lusts of the flesh, nor to the lust of the eyes, nor to the pride of life, all which pass away as a shadow, but that they are raised upward to the joys of things eternal, which are spoilt by no change. He may direct the righteous, even he the God who searcheth the hearts and reins. For our works, which we do in deeds and words, may be known unto men, but with that mind they are done, and to what end we would attain by means of them, he alone knoweth, the God who searcheth the hearts and reins. Verse 10. 
My righteous help is from the Lord, who maketh the whole the upright in heart. The offices of medicine are twofold, one the curing infirmity, the other the preserving health. According to the first, it was said in the preceding psalm, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. According to the second, it is said in this psalm, If there be any iniquity in my hands, if I have repaid them that recompense me evil, may I therefore fall by my enemies empty. For there the weak prays that he may be delivered. Here one already whole that he may not change for the worse. According to the one, it is there said, Make me whole for thy mercy's sake. According to the other, it is here said, Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness. For there he asks for a remedy to escape from disease, but here for a protection from falling into disease. According to the former, it is said, Make me whole, O Lord, according to thy mercy. According to the latter, it is said, My righteous help is from the Lord, who maketh whole the upright in heart. Both the one and the other maketh men whole, but the former removes them from sickness into health, the latter preserves them in this health. Therefore, there the help is merciful, because the sinner hath no desert, who as yet longeth to be justified, believing on him who justifieth the ungodly. But here the help is righteous, because it is given to one already righteous. Let the sinner then who said, I am weak, say in the first place, Make me whole, O Lord, for thy mercy's sake. And here let the righteous man who said, If I have repaid them that recompense me evil, say, My righteous help is from the Lord, who maketh whole the upright in heart. If he sets forth the medicine by which we may be healed when weak, how much more that by which we may be kept in health? For if while we were yet sinners Christ died for us, how much more being now justified shall we be kept whole from wrath through him? My righteous help is from the Lord, who maketh whole the upright in heart. God, who searcheth the hearts and reins, directeth the righteous. But with righteous help maketh he whole the upright in heart. He doth not, as he searcheth the hearts and reins, so make whole the upright in heart and reins. For the thoughts are both bad in a deprived heart and good in an upright heart. But delights which are not good belong to the reins, for they are more low and earthly. But those that are good, not to the reins, but to the heart itself. Wherefore, men cannot be so called upright in reins as they are called upright in heart, since where the thought is, there at once the delight is too, which cannot be unless when things divine and eternal are thought of. Thou hast given, he says, joy to my heart. When he had said, The light of thy countenance has been stamped upon us, O Lord, for although the phantoms of things temporal, which the mind falsely pictures to itself, when tossed by vain and mortal hope to vain imaginations, oftentimes bring a delirious and maddened joy, yet this delight must be attributed not to the heart, but to the reins, for all these imaginations have been drawn from lore, that is, earthly and carnal things. Hence it comes that God, who searcheth the hearts and reins, and perceiveth in the heart upright thoughts, in the reins no delights, affordeth righteous help to the upright in heart, where heavenly delights are coupled with clean thoughts. And therefore, when in another psalm he had said, Moreover, even tonight my reins have chided me, he went on to say, as touching help, I foresaw the Lord always in my sight, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Where he shows that he suffered suggestions only from the reins, not delights as well. For had he suffered these, then he would, of course, be moved. But he said, The Lord is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. And then he adds, Wherefore was my heart delighted? That the reins should have been able to chide, not delight him. The delight, accordingly, was produced not in the reins, but there where against the chiding of the reins, God was foreseen to be on the right hand, that is, in the heart. Verse 11. God the righteous judge, strong in endurance and long-suffering. What God is judge but the Lord, who judgeth the people? 
He is righteous, who shall render to every man according to his works. He is strong in endurance, who, being powerful for our salvation, bore even with ungodly persecutors. He is long-suffering, who did not immediately after his resurrection hurry away to punishment, even those that persecuted him, but bore with them that they might at length turn from that ungodliness to salvation, and still he beareth with them, reserving the last penalty for the last judgment, and up to this present time inviting sinners to repentance, not bringing in anger every day. Perhaps bringing in anger is a more significant expression than being angry, and so we find it in the Greek copies, that the anger whereby he punisheth should not be in him, but in the minds of those ministers who obey the commandments of truth, through whom orders are given even to the lower ministries, who are called angels of wrath, to punish sin, whom even now the punishment of men delights not for justice' sake, in which they have no pleasure, but for malice' sake, God then doth not bring in anger every day, that is, he doth not collect his ministers for vengeance every day. For now the patience of God inviteth to repentance. But in the last time, when men through their hardness and impenitent heart shall have treasured up for themselves anger in the day of anger and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, then he will brandish his sword. Verse 12. Unless ye be converted, he says, he will brandish his sword. The Lord man himself may be taken to be God's double-edged sword, that is, his spear, which at his first coming he will not brandish, but hideth, as it were, in the sheath of humiliation. But he will brandish it when, at the second coming, to judge the quick and dead in the manifest splendor of his glory. He shall flash light on his righteous ones and terror on the ungodly. Or in other copies, instead of, he shall brandish his sword, it has been written, he shall make bright his spear. By which word, I think, the last coming of the Lord's glory most appropriately signified, seeing that it is understood of his person, which another psalm has, Deliver, O Lord, my soul from the ungodly, thy spear from the enemies of thine hand. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. The tenses of the words must not be altogether overlooked. How he has spoken of the sword of the future, he will brandish. Of the bow in the past, he hath bent. And these words of the past tense follow after. Verse 13. And in it he hath prepared the instruments of death. He has wrought his arrows for the burning. That bow, then, I would readily take to be the Holy Scripture, in which, by the strength of the New Testament, as by a sort of string, the hardness of the old has been bent and subdued. From thence the apostles are sent forth like arrows, or divine preachings are shot, which arrows he hath wrought for the burning, arrows, that is, whereby being stricken, they might be inflamed with heavenly love. Or by what other arrows was she stricken, who saith, Bring unto the house of wine, place me among perfumes, crowd me among honey, for I have been wounded with love. By what other arrows is he kindled, who, desirous of returning to God, and coming back from wandering, asketh for help against crafty tongues, to whom it was said, What shall be given thee, or what added to thee against the crafty tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty, and devastating coals, that is, coals whereby, when thou art stricken and set on fire, thou mayest burn with so great love of the kingdom of heaven, as to despise the tongues of all that resist thee, and would recall thee from thy purpose, and to deride their persecution, saying, Who shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? For I am persuaded, he says, that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thus for the burning hath he wrought his arrows. For in the Greek copies it is found thus, He hath wrought his arrows for the burning. 
but most of the Latin copies have burning arrows. But whether the arrows themselves burn or make others burn, of which they cannot do unless they burn themselves, the sense is complete. But since he has said that the Lord has prepared not arrows only, but instruments of death too, in the bow it may be asked, what are instruments of death? Are they, peradventure, heretics? Or they too, out of the same bow, that is, out of the same scriptures, light upon souls, not to be inflamed with love, but to destroy with poison, which does not happen but after their deserts. Wherefore, even this dispensation is to be assigned to the divine providence, not that it makes men sinners, but that it orders them after they have sinned. For through sin, reaching them with an ill purpose, they are forced to understand them ill, that this should be itself the punishment of sin, by whose death, nevertheless, the sons of the Catholic Church are, as it were, by certain thorns, so to say, aroused from slumber and make progress toward the understanding of the Holy Scriptures. For there must be also heretics, that they which are approved, he said, may be made manifest among you, that is, among men, seeing that they are manifest to God. Or has he happily ordained the same arrows to be at once instruments of death for the destruction of unbelievers, and wrought them burning, or for the burning for the exercising of the faithful? For that is not false that the apostle says, To the one we are the savor of life unto life, to the other the savor of death unto death. And who is sufficient for these things? It is no wonder, then, if the same apostle be both instruments of death in those from whom they suffered persecution, and fiery arrows to inflame the hearts of believers. Now after this dispensation, righteous judgment will come, of which the psalmist so speaks, as that we may understand that each man's punishment is wrought out of his own sin, and his iniquity turned into vengeance, that we may not suppose that that tranquility and ineffable light of God brings forth from itself the means of punishing sin, but that it so ordereth sins that what have been delights to man in sinning should be instruments to the Lord avenging. Behold, he says, he hath travailed with injustice. Now what had he conceived that he should travail with injustice? He hath conceived, he says, toil. Hence then comes that, in toil shalt thou eat thy bread. Hence to that, come unto me, all ye that toil and are heavy laden. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. For toil will never cease, except one love that which cannot be taken away against his will. And when these things are loved, which we can lose against our will, we must needs toil for them most miserably. And to obtain them, amidst the straightness of earthly cares, while each desires to snatch them for himself, and must be beforehand with another, or to wrest it from him, must scheme injustice. Duly, then, and quite in order, hath he travailed with injustice, who hath conceived toil. Now he bringeth forth what, save that with which he hath travailed, although he has not travailed with that which he conceived. For that is not born which is conceived. But seed is conceived, that which is formed from the seed is born. Toil is then the seed of iniquity, but sin the conception of toil, that is, that first sin to depart from God. He then hath travailed with injustice, who hath conceived toil, and he hath brought forth iniquity. Iniquity is the same as injustice. He hath brought forth then that with which he travailed. What follows next? Verse 15. He hath opened a ditch and digged it. To open a ditch is in earthly matters, that is, as it were in the earth, to prepare deceits, that another fall therein, whom the righteous man wishes to deceive. Now this ditch is opened when consent is given to the evil suggestion of earthly lusts. But it is digged when, after consent, we press on to actual work of deceit. But how can it be that iniquity should rather hurt the righteous man against whom it proceeds than the unrighteous heart whence it proceeds. Accordingly, the stealer of money, for instance, while he desires to inflict painful harm upon another, is himself maimed by the wound of avarice. Now who, even 
out of his own right mind, sees not how great is the difference between these men. When one suffers the loss of money, the other innocence. He will fall then into the pit which he hath made. As it is said in another psalm, the Lord is known in executing judgments, the sinner is caught in the works of his own hands. Verse 16. His toil shall be turned on his head, and his iniquity shall descend on his pate. For he had no mind to escape sin, but was brought under sin as a slave. So to say, as the Lord saith, whosoever sinneth is a slave. His iniquity then will be upon him, when he is subject to his iniquity. For he could not say to the Lord what the innocent and upright say, my glory and the lifter up of my head. He then will be in such wise below, as that his iniquity may be above, and descend on him, for that it weigheth him down and burdens him, and suffers him not to fly back to the rest of the saints. This occurs when in an ill-regulated man reason is a slave, and lust hath dominion. Verse 17. I will confess to the Lord according to his justice. This is not the sinner's confession, for he says this, Who said, above most truly, If there be iniquity in my hands? But it is a confession of God's justice, in which we speak thus, Verily, O Lord, thou art just, in that thou both protectest the just, and thou enlightenest them by thyself, and so orderest sinners, that they may be punished not by thine, but by their own malice. This confession so praises the Lord that the blasphemies of the ungodly can avail nothing, who, willing to excuse their evil deeds, are unwilling to attribute to their own fault that they sin, that is, are unwilling to attribute their fault to their fault. Accordingly, they find either fortune or fate to accuse, or the devil to whom he who made us hath willed that it should be in our power to refuse consent or they bring in another nature which is not of God, wretched waverers and erring, rather than confessing to God that he should pardon them. For it is not fit that any be pardoned, except he say, I have sinned. He then that sees the deserts of souls so ordered by God, that while each has his own given him, the fair beauty of the universe is no part violated, in all things praises God. And this is not the confession of sinners, but of the righteous. For it is not the sinner's confession when the Lord says, I confess to thee, O Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and revealed them to babes. Likewise in Ecclesiasticus it is said, Confess to the Lord in all his works. And in confession ye shall say this, All the works of the Lord are exceeding good. Which can be seen in this psalm, if any one with a pious mind, by the Lord's help, distinguish between the rewards of the righteous and the penalties of the sinners, how that in these two the whole creation which God made and rules is adorned with a beauty wondrous and known to few. Thus then he says, I will confess to the Lord according to his justice, as one who saw that darkness was not made by God, but ordered nevertheless. For God said, Let light be made, and light was made. He did not say, Let darkness be made, and darkness was made. And yet he ordered it, and therefore it is said, God divided between the light and the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. This is the distinction. He made the one and ordered it, but the other he made not. But yet he ordered this too. But now that sins are signified by darkness, so is it seen in the prophet who says, and thy darkness shall be as the noonday. And in the apostle who says, He that hateth his brother is in darkness. And above all that text, Let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Not that there is any nature of darkness, for all nature is so far as it is nature is compelled to be. Now being belongs to light, not being to darkness. He then that leaves him by whom he was made and inclines to whence he was made, that is, to nothing, is in this sin and darkened. And yet he does not utterly perish, but he is ordered among the lowest things. Therefore, after the psalmist said, I will confess unto the Lord, that we might not understand it 
that confession of sins, he adds lastly, and I will sing to the name of the Lord Most High. Now singing has relation to joy, but repentance of sins to sadness. This psalm can be taken in the person of the Lord man, if only that which is there spoken in humiliation be referred to our weakness which he bore. End of Psalm 7psalm 8 of expositions on the book of psalms by saint augustine this librivox recording is in the public domain to the end for the wine presses a psalm of david himself he seems to say nothing of wine presses in the text of the psalm of which this is the title by which it appears that one and the same thing is often signified in scripture by many and various similitudes we may then take wine presses to be churches on the same principle by which we understand also by a threshing floor of the church for whether in the threshing floor or in the wine press there is nothing else done but the clearing the produce of its covering which is necessary both for its first growth and increase and arrival at the maturity either of the harvest or the vintage of these coverings or supports then that is of chaff on the threshing floor the corn of husks in the presses the wine is stripped as in the churches from the multitude of worldly men which is collected together with the good for whose birth and adopting to the divine word that multitude was necessary this is effected that by spiritual love they be separated through the operation of god's ministers for now so it is that the good are for a time separated from the bad not in space but in affection although they have converse together in the churches as far as respects bodily presence but another time will come the corn will be stored up apart from the granaries and the wine in the cellars the wheat saith he he will lay up in garners but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable the same thing may be thus understood in another similitude the wine he will lay up in cellars but the husks he will cast forth to cattle so that by the bellies of the cattle we may be allowed by way of similitude to understand the pains of hell yet there is another interpretation considering the wine presses yet still keeping to the meaning of churches for even the divine word may be understood by the grape for the lord even has been called a cluster of grapes which they that were sent before by the people of israel brought from the land of promise hanging on a staff crucified as it were accordingly when the divine word maketh use of by the necessity of declaring himself the sound of the voice whereby to convey himself to the ears of the hearers in the same sound of voice as it were in husks knowledge like the wine is enclosed and so this grape comes into the ears as into the pressing machines of the wine pressers for there the separation is made and the sound may reach as far as the ear but knowledge be received in the memory of those that hear, as it were, in a sort of vat, whence it passes into discipline of conversation and habit of mind, as from the vat into the cellar, where if it do not through negligence grow sour, it will acquire soundness by age. For it grew sour among the Jews, and this sour vinegar they gave the Lord to drink. For that wine which from the produce of the vine of the New Testament the Lord is to drink with his saints in the kingdom of his Father, must needs be most sweet and most sound. Wine presses are also usually taken for martyrdoms, as when they who have confessed the name of Christ have been trodden down by the blows of persecution. Their mortal remains, as husks remained on earth, but their souls flowed forth into the rest of a heavenly habitation. Nor yet by this interpretation do we depart from the fruitfulness of the churches it is sung then for the wine presses for the church's establishment when our lord after his resurrection ascended into heaven for when he sent the holy ghost by whom the disciples being fulfilled preached with confidence the word of god that churches might be collected accordingly it is said verse one o lord our lord how admirable is thy name in all the earth I ask, how is his name wonderful in all the earth? The answer is, for thy glory has been raised above the heavens. 
so that the meaning is this. O Lord, who art our Lord, how do all that inhabit the earth admire thee? For thy glory hath been raised from earthly humiliation above the heavens. For hence it appeared who thou wast that descended, when it was by some seen, and by the rest believed, whither it was that thou ascendest. Verse 2. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast made perfect praise, because of thine enemies. I cannot take babes and sucklings to be any other than those to whom the apostle says, As unto babes in Christ I have given you milk to drink, not meat. Who were meant by those who went before the Lord praising him, of whom the Lord himself used this testimony, when he answered the Jews who bade him rebuke them, have ye not read, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast made perfect praise? Now with good reason he says not, thou hast made, but thou hast made perfect praise. For there are in the churches also those who now no more drink milk, but eat meat, whom the same apostle points out, saying, We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. But not by those only are the churches perfected. For if there were only these, little consideration would be had of the human race. But consideration is had when they too, who are not yet capable of the knowledge of things spiritual and, and eternal, are nourished by the faith of the temporal history, which for our salvation, after the patriarchs and prophets, was administered by the most excellent power and wisdom of God, even in the sacraments of the assumed manhood, in which there is salvation for every one that believeth to the end that moved by its authority each one may obey its precepts, whereby being purified and rooted and grounded in love, he may be able to run with saints, no more now a child in milk, but a young man in meat, to comprehend the breadth, the length, the height, and depth, to know also the surpassing knowledge of the love of Christ. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast made perfect praise, because of thine enemies. By enemies to this dispensation, which has been wrought through Jesus Christ in him crucified, we ought generally to understand all who forbid belief in things unknown, and promise certain knowledge, as all heretics do, and they who, in the superstition of the Gentiles, are called philosophers. Not that the promise of knowledge is to be blamed, but because they deem the most healthy and necessary step of faith is to be neglected by which we must needs ascend to something certain, which nothing but that which is eternal can be. Hence it appears that they do not possess even this knowledge, which in contempt of faith they promise, seeing that they know not so useful and necessary a step thereof. Out of the mouth, then, of babes and sucklings thou hast made perfect praise, thou, our Lord, declaring first by the apostle, except ye believe, ye shall not understand and saying by his own mouth, Blessed are they that have not seen and shall believe. Because of the enemies, against whom too that is said, I confess to thee, O Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise, and revealed them unto babes. From the wise he saith, not the really wise, but those who deem themselves such, that thou mayest destroy the enemy and the defender. Whom but the heretic, for he is both an enemy and a defender, who, when he would assault the Christian faith, seems to defend it. And philosophers, too, of this world, may well be taken as the enemies and defenders. For as much as the Son of God is the power and wisdom of God, by which every one is enlightened who is made wise by the truth, of which they profess themselves to be lovers, whence, too, their name of philosophers. And therefore they seem to defend it, while they are its enemies, since they cease not to recommend noxious superstitions that the elements of the world should be worshipped and revered. Verse 3. For I shall see thy heavens and the works of thy fingers. We read that the law was written with the finger of God, and given through Moses his holy servant, by which finger of God many understand the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, if by the fingers of God we are right in understanding these same ministers filled with the Holy Ghost, by reason of this same Spirit which worketh in them, since by them all Holy Scripture has been completed for us, we understand consistently with this 
that in this place the books of both testaments are called the heavens. Now it is said, too, of Moses himself, by the magicians of King Pharaoh, when they were conquered by him, this is the finger of God, and what is written, the heaven shall be rolled up as a book. Although it be said of this ethereal heaven, yet naturally, according to the same image, the heavens of books are named by allegory. For I shall see, he says, the heavens, the works of thy fingers. That is, I shall discern and understand the scriptures, which thou, by the operation of the Holy Ghost, hast written by thy ministers. Accordingly, the heavens named above also may be interpreted as the same books, where he says, For thy glory hath been raised above the heavens, so that the complete meaning should be this, For thy glory hath been raised above the heavens, for thy glory hath exceeded the declarations of all the scriptures. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast made perfect praise, that they should begin by belief in the scriptures, who would arrive at the knowledge of your glory, which hath been raised above the scriptures, in that it passeth by and transcends the announcements of all words and languages. Therefore hath God lowered the scriptures, even to the capacity of babes and sucklings, as it is sung in another psalm. And he lowered the heaven, and came down. And this did he because of the enemies, who through pride of talkativeness, being enemies of the cross of Christ, even when they do speak some truth, still cannot profit babes and sucklings. So is the enemy and defender destroyed, who, whether he seem to defend wisdom, or even the name of Christ, still from the step of this faith assaults that truth, which he so readily makes promise of. Whereby, too, he is convicted of not possessing it, since by assaulting the step thereof, namely faith, he knows not how one should mount up thereto. Hence, then, is the rash and blind promiser of truth, who is the enemy and the defender, destroyed when the heavens, the works of God's fingers are seen, that is, when the scriptures, brought down even to the slowness of babes, are understood, and by means of the lowness of the faith of the history, which was transacted in time, they raised them, well nurtured and strengthened, unto the grand heights of the understanding of things eternal, up to those things which they establish. For these heavens, that is, these books are the works of God's fingers. For by the operation of the Holy Ghost and the saints, they were completed. For they that have regarded their own glory, rather than man's salvation, have spoken without the Holy Ghost, in whom are the bowels of the mercy of God. For I shall see the heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. The moon and stars are ordained in the heavens, since both the church universal, to signify which the moon is often put, and churches in several places particularly, which I imagine to be intimated by the name of stars, are established in the same scriptures, which we believe to be expressed by the word heavens. But why the moon justly signifies the church will be more seasonably considered in another psalm, where it is said, The sinners have bent their bow, that they may shoot in the obscure moon the upright in heart. Verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? It may be asked what distinction there is between man and son of man, for if there were none, it would not be expressed thus, man or son of man disjunctively, for if it were written thus, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and son of man that thou visitest him, it might appear to be a repetition of the word man. But now when the expression is man or son of man, a distinction is more clearly intimated. This is certainly to be remembered that every son of man is a man, although every man cannot be taken to be a son of man. Adam, for instance, was a man, but not a son of man. Wherefore, we may from hence consider and distinguish what is the difference in this place between man and son of man, namely, that they who bear the image of the earthly man, who is not a son of man, should be signified by the name of men but that they who bear the image of the heavenly man should be rather called sons of men, for the former again is called the old man, and the latter the new. 
but the new is born of the old, since spiritual regeneration is begun by a change of an earthly and worldly life, and therefore the latter is called son of man. Man, then, in this place is earthly, but son of man heavenly, for the former is far removed from God, but the latter present with God, and therefore is he mindful of the former, as in far distance from him, but the latter he visiteth, with whom, being present, he enlighteneth him with his countenance. For salvation is far from sinners, and the light of thy countenance hath been stamped upon us, O Lord. So in another psalm he saith that men in conjunction with beasts are made whole together with these beasts, not by any present inward illumination, but by the multiplication of the mercy of God, whereby his goodness reacheth even to the lowest things, for the wholeness of carnal men is carnal, as of the beasts, but separating the sons of men from those whom, being men, he joined with cattle, he proclaims that they are made blessed, after a far more exalted method, by the enlightening of the truth itself, and by a certain inundation of the fountain of life. For he speaketh thus, Men and beasts thou wilt make whole, O Lord, as thy mercy hath been multiplied. O God, but the sons of men shall put their trust in the covering of thy wings. They shall be inebriated with the richness of thine house, and of the torrent of thy pleasures. Thou shalt make them drink, for with thee is the fountain of life, and in thy light shall we see light. Extend thy mercy to them that know thee. Through the multiplication of mercy, then, he is mindful of man as of beasts. For that multiplied mercy reacheth even to them that are afar off. But he visiteth the Son of Man, over whom, placed under the covering of his wings, he extendeth mercy, and in his light giveth light, and maketh him drink of his pleasures, and inebriateth him with the richness of his house, to forget the sorrows and wanderings of his former conversation. This Son of Man, that is, the new man, the repentance of the old man begets with pain and tears. He, though new, is nevertheless called yet carnal, whilst he is fed with milk. I would not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, says the apostle. But to show that they were already regenerate, he says, as unto babes in Christ. I have given you milk to drink, not meat. And when he relapses, as often happens, to the old life, he hears in reproof that he is a man. Are ye not men, he says, and walk as men? Therefore was the Son of Man first visited in the person of the very Lord Man, born of the Virgin Mary, of whom by reason of the very weakness of the flesh, which the wisdom of God vouchsafed to bear, and the humiliation of the passion, it is justly said, verse 5, Thou hast lowered him a little lower than the angels. But that glorifying is added, in which he rose and ascended up into heaven. With glory, he says, and with honor thou hast crowned him. Verse 6. And hast set him over the works of thine hands. Since even angels are the works of God's hands, even over angels we understand the only begotten Son to have been set, whom we hear and believe by the humiliation of the carnal generation and passion, to have been lowered a little lower than the angels. Thou hast put, he says, all things in subjection under his feet. When he says all things, he accepts nothing, and that he might not be allowed to understand it otherwise, the apostle enjoins it to what be believed thus. When he says, he being accepted, which put all things under him, and to the Hebrews he uses this very testimony from this psalm, when he would have it be understood that all things are in such sort put under our Lord Jesus Christ, as that nothing should be accepted. And yet he does not seem, as it were, to subjoin any great thing when he says, verse 7, All sheep and oxen, yea, moreover the beasts of the field, birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, which walk through the paths of the sea. For leaving the heavenly excellencies and powers and all the hosts of angels, leaving even man himself, 
he seems to have put under him the beasts merely, unless by sheep and oxen we understand holy souls, either yielding the fruit of innocence, or even working that the earth may bear fruit, that is, that earthly men may be regenerated unto spiritual richness. By these holy souls, then, we ought to understand not those of men only, but of all angels too, if we would gather from thence that all things are put under our Lord Jesus Christ. For there will be no creature that will not be put under him, under whom the preeminent spirits, that I may so speak, are put. But whence shall we prove that sheep can be interpreted even, not of men, but of the blessed spirits of the angelic creatures on high? May we from the Lord saying that he had left ninety and nine sheep in the mountains, that is, in the higher regions, and had come down for one. For if we take the one lost sheep to be the human soul in Adam, since Eve even was made out of his side for the spiritual handling and consideration of all which things this is not the time, it remains that by the ninety and nine left in the mountains, spirits not human but angelical should be meant. For as regards the oxen, this sentence is easily dispatched, since men themselves are for no reason called oxen, but because by preaching the gospel of the word of God, they imitate angels, as it were said, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. How much more easily, then, do we take the angels themselves, the messengers of truth, to be oxen, when evangelists, by the participation of their title, are called oxen? Thou hast put under, therefore, he says, all sheep and oxen, that is, all the holy spiritual creation, in which we include that of holy men who are in the church, in those wine presses to wit, which are intimated under the similitude of the moon and stars. Yea, moreover, saith he, the beasts of the field. The addition of moreover is by no means idle, first because by beasts of the plain may be understood both sheep and oxen, so that if goats are the beasts of rocky and mountainous regions, sheep may be well taken to be beasts of the field. Accordingly, had it been written even thus, all sheep and oxen and beasts of the field, it might be reasonably asked what beasts of the plain meant, since even sheep and oxen could be taken as such. But the addition of moreover besides obligates us beyond question to recognize some difference or other. But under this word, moreover, not only beasts of the field, but also, verse 8, birds of the air and fish of the sea, which walk through the paths of the sea, are to be taken in. What is then this distinction? Call to mind the wine presses, holding husks and wine, and the threshing floor, containing chaff and corn, and the nets in which were enclosed good fish and bad, and the ark of Noah, in which were both unclean and clean animals. And you will see that the churches for a while, now in this time, unto the last judgment, contain not only sheep and oxen, that is, holy laymen and holy ministers, but moreover beasts of the field, birds of the air, and birds of the sea, that walk through the paths of the sea. For the beasts of the field are very fitly understood, as men rejoicing in the pleasure of the flesh, for they mount up to nothing high, nothing laborious. For the field is also the broad way that leadeth to destruction, and in the field is Abel slain. Wherefore there is cause to fear, lest one coming down from the mountains of God's righteousness. For thy righteousness, he says, is as the mountains of God, making choice of the broad and easy paths of carnal pleasure, be slain by the devil. See now, too, the birds of heaven, the proud of whom it is said, they have set their mouth against the heaven. See how they are carried on high by the wind, who say, We will magnify our tongue, our lips are our own. Who is our Lord? Behold, too, the fish of the sea, that is the curious, who walk through the paths of the sea, that is, search in the deep after the temporal things of this world, which, like paths in the sea, vanish and perish as quickly as the water comes together, again after it has given room in their passage to ships or to whatever walketh or swimmeth. 
For he said not merely who walk the paths of the sea, but walk through. He said, showing the very determinate eagerness of those who seek after vain and fleeting things. Now these three kinds of vice, namely, the pleasure of the flesh and pride and curiosity, include all sins, and they appear to me to be enumerated by the Apostle John, when he says, Love not the world, for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. For through the eyes especially prevails curiosity. To what the rest indeed belong is clear, and that temptation of the Lord man was threefold, by food, that is, by the lust of the flesh, where it is suggested, command these stones that they be made bread, by vain boasting, where, when stationed on a mountain, all the kingdoms of this earth are shown him, and promised if he would worship, by curiosity, where from the pinnacle of the temple he is advised to cast himself down for the sake of trying whether he would be borne up by angels. And accordingly, after that, the enemy could prevail with him when none of these temptations, that is said of him, when the devil had ended all his temptation, with a reference then to the meaning of the wine presses, not only the wine, but the husks too are put under his feet, to wit, not only sheep and oxen, that is, holy souls of believers, either in the laity or in the ministry, but moreover both beasts of pleasure and birds of pride and fish of curiosity. All which classes of sinners we see mingled now in the churches with the good and holy. May he work then in his churches and separate the wine from the husks. Let us give heed that we be wine and sheep or oxen, not husks or beasts of the field or birds of heaven or fish of the sea which walk through the paths of the sea. Not that these names can be understood and explained in this way only, but the explanation of them must be according to the place where they are found. For elsewhere they have other meanings, and this rule must be kept in every allegory, that what is expressed by the similitude should be considered agreeable to the meaning of the particular place, for this is the manner of the Lord's and the Apostles' teaching. Let us repeat then the last verse, which is also put at the beginning of the psalm, and let us praise God, saying, O Lord, our Lord, how wonderful is thy name in all the earth. For fitly, after the manner of the discourse, is the return made to the heading, whether all the discourse must be referred. End of Psalm 8psalm 9 and 10 from expositions on the book of psalms by saint augustine this librivox recording is in the public domain the inscription of this psalm is to the end for the hidden things of the sun a psalm of david himself as to the hidden things of the sun there may be a question but since he has not added whose the very only begotten son of god should be understood for where a psalm has been inscribed to the son of David, when he says he fled from the face of Absalom his son, although his name even was mentioned, and therefore there could be no obscurity as to whom it was spoken of, yet it is not merely said as from the face of his son Absalom, but his is added, and here both because his is not added, and much is said of the Gentiles, it cannot properly be taken of Absalom. For the war which that abandoned one waged with his father no way relates to the Gentiles, since there the people of Israel only were divided against themselves. This psalm is then sung for the hidden things of the only begotten Son of God, for the Lord himself too, when, without addition, he uses the word Son, would have himself the only begotten to be understood, as where he says, if the Son shall make you free, then shall ye be free indeed. For he said not the Son of God, but in saying merely Son, he gives us to understand whose Son it is, which form of expression nothing admits of, save his excellency of whom we so speak, that though we name him not, we can be understood. For so we say, it rains, clears up, thunders, and such like expressions, and we do not add who 
does it all, for that the excellency of the doer spontaneously presents itself to all men's minds, and does not want words. What, then, are the hidden things of the sun? By which expression we must first understand that there are some things of the sun manifest, from which those are distinguished which are called hidden. Wherefore, since we believe two advents of the Lord, one past which the Jews understood not, the other future which we both hope for, and since the one which the Jews understood not profited the Gentiles. For the hidden things of the sun is not unsuitably understood to be spoken of this advent, in which blindness in part happened to Israel, that the fullness of the Gentiles might come in. For notice of two judgments is conveyed to us throughout the scriptures, if any one will give heed to them, one hidden, the other manifest. The hidden one is passing away, of which the apostle Peter says, The time is come that judgment should begin from the house of the Lord. The hidden judgment, accordingly, is the pain by which now each man is either exercised in purification or warned to conversion, or, if he despise the calling and discipline of God, is blinded unto damnation. But the manifest judgment is that in which the Lord at his coming will judge the quick and the dead, all men confessing that it is he by whom both rewards shall be assigned to the good and punishments to the evil. But then the confession will avail, not to the remedy of evils, but to the accumulation of damnation. Of these two judgments, the one hidden, the other manifest, the Lord seems to me to have spoken, where he says, Whoso believeth on me hath passed from death unto life, and shall not come into judgment. Into the manifest judgment, that is, for that which passes from death unto life by means of some affliction, whereby he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, is the hidden judgment. But whoso believeth not, saith he, hath been judged already, that is, by this hidden judgment hath been already prepared for that manifest one. These two judgments we read of also in wisdom, whence it is written, Therefore unto them, as to children, without the use of reason, thou didst give a judgment to mock them. But they have not been corrected by this judgment, have felt a judgment worthy of God. Whoso then are not corrected by this hidden judgment of God, shall most worthily be punished by that manifest one. Wherefore in this psalm must be observed the hidden things of the Son, that is, both his advent in humility, by which he profited the Gentiles with the Jews' blindness, and the pain which is now dispensed secretly, not as yet in the damnation of sinners, but either in exercising the converted, or in admonition that they be converted, or in blinding that they who refuse to be converted may be ready for damnation. I will confess unto thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. He doth not with a whole heart confess unto God. Who doubteth of his providence in any particular? But he who sees already the hidden things of the wisdom of God, how great is his invisible reward, who saith, We rejoice in tribulations, and how all torments which are inflicted on the body are either for the exercising of those that are converted to God, or for the warning that they be converted, or for just preparation for the obdurate unto their last damnation. And so now all things are referred to the governance of divine providence, which fools think done, as it were, by chance and at random, and without any divine ordering. I will tell all thy marvels. He tells all God's marvels, who sees them performed not only openly on the body, but invisibly indeed too in the soul, but far more sublimely and excellently. For men earthly and led wholly by the eye marvel more that the dead Lazarus rose again in the body, than that Paul the persecutor rose again in soul. But since the visible miracle calleth the soul to the light, but the invisible enlighteneth the soul that comes when called, he tells all God's marvels, who, by believing the visible, passes on to understanding of the invisible. I will be glad and exult in thee. 
not any more in this world, not in pleasure of bodily dalliance, not in relish of palate and tongue, not in sweetness of perfumes, not in joyousness of passing sounds, not in the variously colored forms or figure, not in vanities of men's praise, not in wedlock and perishable offspring, not in superfluity of temporal wealth, not in this world's getting, whether it extend over place and space, or be prolonged in time's succession. But I will be glad and exult in thee, namely in the hidden things of the sun, where the light of thy countenance hath been stamped on us. O Lord, for thou wilt hide them, saith he, in the hiding place of thy countenance. And then will be glad and exult in thee, who tells all thy marvels, and he will tell all thy marvels, since it is now spoken of prophetically, who came not to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him. For the person of the Lord begins to appear, speaking in this psalm, for it follows, I will sing to thy name, O Most High, and turning back mine enemy behind. This enemy then, where was he turned back? Was it when it was said to him, Get thee behind, Satan? For when he who by tempting desired to put himself before was turned behind by failing in deceiving him who was tempted and by availing nothing against him. For earthly men are behind, but the heavenly man is preferred before, although he came after. For the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven, heavenly. But from this stock he came by whom it was said, He who cometh after me is preferred before me. And the apostle forgets those things that are behind, and reaches forth unto those things that are before. The enemy, therefore, was turned behind. After that he could not deceive the heavenly man being tempted. And he turns himself to earthy men, where he can have dominion. Wherefore no man goeth before him, and causeth him to be behind. But he who, laying aside the image of the earthy man, shall have borne the image of the heavenly. But now should we prefer understanding the words, Mine enemy, generally, either for a sinner or an heathen, it will not be unreasonable. Nor will the words, in turning mine enemy behind, be a punishment, but a benefit, yea, such a benefit as that nothing can be compared to it. For what more blessed than to lay aside pride and to have no wish to go before Christ, as if one were whole and needed not the physician, but to wish rather to go behind after Christ, who, when calling a disciple to perfection, saith, Follow me. But still, in turning my enemy behind, is more suitably understood as spoken of the devil. For in truth the devil is turned behind, even in the persecution of the righteous, and he, much more to their advantage, is a persecutor than if he went before as a leader and a prince. We must sing, then, to the name of the Most High and turning the enemy behind, since we ought to choose rather to fly from him as a persecutor than to follow him as a leader. For we have whither we may fly and hide ourselves in the hidden things of the sun, seeing that the Lord hath been made a refuge for us. They will be weakened and perish from thy face. Who will be weakened and perish but the unrighteous and ungodly? They will be weakened, while they shall avail nothing, and they shall perish, because the ungodly will not be from the face of God, that is, from the knowledge of God, as he perished, who said, But now I live not, but Christ liveth in me. But why will the ungodly be weakened, and perish from thy face? Because, he saith, Thou hast made my judgment and my cause, that is, the judgment in which I seem to be judged. Thou hast made mine, and the cause in which men condemned me just and innocent. Thou hast made mine, for such things served him for our deliverance, as sailors too call the wind theirs, which they take advantage of for prosperous sailing. Thou saddest on the throne who judgest equity. 
Whether the Son say this to the Father, who said also, Thou couldst have no power against me, except it were given thee from above, referring this very thing, that the judge of man was judged for man's advantage, to the Father's equity and his own hidden things, or whether man said to God, Thou saddest on the throne who judgest equity, giving the name of God's throne to his soul, so that his body may peradventure be the earth, which is called God's footstool. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, or whether the soul of the church, perfect now and without spot and wrinkle, worthy, that is, of the hidden things of the Son, in that the king hath brought her unto his chamber, says to her spouse, Thou saddest upon the throne, who judgest equity, in that thou hast risen from the dead, and ascended up into heaven, and sittest at the right hand of the Father. Whichsoever I say of those opinions, whereunto this verse may be referred, is preferred. It transgresses not the rule of faith. Thou hast rebuked the heathen, and the ungodly hath perished. We take this to be more suitably said to the Lord Jesus Christ than said by him, for who else hath rebuked the heathen, and the ungodly perished, save he who after that he ascended up into heaven sent the Holy Ghost, that filled by him the apostles should preach the word of God with boldness, and freely reprove men's sins, and which rebuke the ungodly perished, because the ungodly was justified and was made godly. Thou hast effaced their name for the world, and for the world's world. The name of the ungodly hath been effaced, for they are not called ungodly who believe in the true God. Now their name is effaced for the world, that is, as long as the course of the temporal world endures, and for the world's world. What is the world's world, but that whose image and shadow, as it were, this world possesses? For the change of season, succeeding one another, whilst the moon is on the wane, and again on the increase, whilst the sun each year returns his quarter, whilst the spring or summer or autumn or winter passes away only to return, is in some sort an imitation of eternity. But this world's world is that which abides in immutable eternity, as a verse in the mind and a verse in the voice. The former is understood, the latter heard and the former fashions the latter, and hence the former works in art and abides. The latter sounds in the air and passes away. So the fashion of this changeable world is defined by that world unchangeable, which is called the world's world, and hence the one abides in the art, that is, in the wisdom and power of God, but the other is made to pass in the governance of creation, for after all it be not a repetition, so that after it was said for the world, lest it should be understood of this world that passeth away, it were added for the world's world. For in the Greek copies it is thus, eston eona ke eston eona ton eonos, which the Latins have for the most part rendered not for the world and for the world's world, but for ever and for the world's world. And in the words for the world's world, the words for ever should be explained. The name then of the ungodly thou hast effaced for ever. For from henceforth the ungodly shall never be. And if their name be not prolonged unto this world, much less unto the world's world. The swords of the enemy have failed at the end. Not enemies in the plural, but this enemy in the singular. Now what enemies' swords have failed but the devil's? Now these are understood to be the diverse erroneous opinions whereby, as with swords, he destroys souls. In overcoming these swords and in bringing them to failure, that sword is employed, of which it is said in the seventh psalm, If ye be not converted, he will brandish his sword. And peradventure this is the end, against which the swords of the enemy fail, since up to it they are of some avail. Now it worketh secretly, but in the last judgment it will be brandished openly. 
By it the cities are destroyed, for so it follows, the swords of the enemy have failed at the end, and thou hast destroyed the cities. The cities, indeed, wherein the devil rules, where crafty and deceitful counsels hold, as it were, the place of a court, on which supremacy attend as officers and ministers the services of all the members, the eyes for curiosity, the ears for lavishness, or for whatsoever else is gladly listened to that bears on evil, the hands for rapine or any other violence or pollution soever, and all the other members after this manner serving the tyrannical supremacy, that is, perverse counsels, of this city the commonality, as it were, are all soft affections and disturbing emotions of the mind, stirring up daily seditions in a man. So, then, where a king, where a court, where ministers, or commonality are found, there is a city. Nor again would such things be in bad cities, unless they were first in individual men, who are, as it were, the elements and seeds of cities. These cities he destroys, when, on the prince being shut out thence, of whom it was said, the prince of this world has been cast out. These kingdoms are wasted by the word of truth, evil counsels are laid to sleep, vile affections tamed, the ministries of the members and senses taken captive, and transferred to the service of righteousness and good works. But as the apostle says, sin should no more reign in our mortal body, and so forth, then is the soul at peace, and the man is disposed to receive rest and blessedness. The memorial has perished with an uproar. With the uproar, that is, of the ungodly. But it is said, with uproar, either because when ungodliness is overturned, there is uproar made. For none passeth to the highest place, where there is the deep silence. But he who with much uproar shall first have warred with his own vices, or with uproar, is said that the memory of the ungodly should perish in the perishing even of the very uproar, in which ungodliness riots. And the Lord abideth for ever. Wherefore then have the heathen raged and the people imagined vain things against the Lord and against his anointed? For the Lord abideth for ever. He hath prepared his seat in judgment, and he shall judge the world in equity. He prepared his seat when he was judged. For by that patience man purchased heaven, and God in man profited believers. And this is the Son's hidden judgment. But seeing he is also to come openly, and in the sight of all to judge the quick and dead, he hath prepared his seat in the hidden judgment, and he shall also openly judge the world in equity. That is, he shall distribute gifts of proportion to desert setting the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. He shall judge the people with justice. This is the same as was said above. He shall judge the world in equity, not as men judge who see not the heart, but whom very often worse men are acquitted than are condemned. But in equity and with justice shall the Lord judge, conscience bearing witness and thoughts accusing or else excusing. And the Lord hath become a refuge to the poor. Whatsoever be the persecutions of that enemy, who hath been turned behind, what harm shall he do to them whose refuge the Lord hath become? For this will be, if in this world, in which that one has an office of power, they shall choose to be poor, by loving nothing which either here leaves a man while he lives and loves, or is left by him when he dies. For to such a poor man hath the Lord become a refuge, and helper in due season, in tribulation. Lo, he maketh poor, for he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. For what an helper in due season is, he explained by adding in tribulation. For the soul is not turned to God, save when it is turned away from this world. Nor is it more seasonably turned away from this world, except toils and pains be mingled with its trifling and hurtful and destructive pleasures. Verse 10. And let them who know thy name hope in thee. 
when they shall have ceased hoping in wealth and in other enticements of this world. For the soul indeed that seeketh where to fix her hope, when she is torn away from this world, the knowledge of God's name seasonably receives. For the mere name of God hath now been published everywhere, but the knowledge of the name is, when he is known whose name it is. For the name is not a name for its own sake, but for that which it signifies. Now it has been said, The Lord is his name. Wherefore, who so willingly submits himself to God, as his servant, hath known his name? And let them who know thy name hope in thee. Again the Lord saith, I am that I am. And thou shalt say to the children of God, I am, hath sent me. Let them then who know thy name hope in thee, that they may not hope in those things which flow by in time's quick revolution, having nothing but will be and has been. For what in them is future, when it arrives, straightway becomes the past. It is awaited with eagerness, it is lost with pain. But in the nature of God nothing will be as if it were not yet, or hath been as if it were no longer. But there is only that which is, and this is eternity. Let them cease then to hope in and love things temporal, and let them apply themselves to hope eternal, who know his name, who said, I am that I am, of whom it was said, I am hath sent me. For thou hast not forsaken them that seek thee, O Lord. Whoso seek him, seek no more things transient and perishable, for no man can serve two masters. Verse 11. Sing to the Lord who dwelleth in Zion. It is said to them, whom the Lord forsakes not as they seek him. He dwelleth in Zion, which is interpreted watching, and which beareth the likeness of the church that now is, as Jerusalem beareth the likeness of the church that is to come, that is, the city of saints already enjoying life angelical. For Jerusalem is, by interpretation, the vision of peace. Now watching goes before vision, as this church goes before the one which is promised, the city immortal and eternal. But in time it goes before, not in dignity, because more honorable is that whither we are striving to arrive than what we practice. That we may attain to arrive, now we practice watching, that we may arrive at vision. But again, this same church, which now is, unless the Lord inhabit her, the most earnest watching might run into any sort of error. And to this church it was said, For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Again, that Christ may dwell in the inner man in your hearts by faith. It is enjoined us then that we sing to the Lord who dwelleth in Zion, that with one accord we praise the Lord, the inhabitant of the church. Show forth his wonders among the heathen. It has both been done and will not cease to be done. Verse 12. For requiring their blood he hath remembered. As if they who were sent to preach the gospel should make answer to that injunction which had been mentioned, show forth his wonders among the heathen, and should say, O Lord, who hath believed our report? And again, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. The psalmist suitably goes on to say that Christians, not without great reward of eternity, will die in persecution, for requiring their blood he hath remembered. But why did he choose to say their blood? Was it as if one of imperfect knowledge and less faith should ask, how will they show them forth, seeing that the infidelity of the heathen will rage against them, and he should be answered, for requiring their blood he hath remembered. That is, the last judgment will come, in which both the glory of the slain and the punishment of the slayers shall be made manifest. But let no one suppose he hath remembered to be so used, as though forgetfulness can attach to God. But since the judgment will be after a long interval, it is used in accordance with the feeling of weak men who think God hath forgotten, because he doth not act so speedily as they wish. To such is said what follows also, 
he hath not forgotten the cry of the poor. That is, he hath not, as you suppose, forgotten, as if they should on hearing, he hath remembered, say, then, he had forgotten. No, he hath not forgotten, says the psalmist, the cry of the poor. But I ask, what is the cry of the poor, which God forgetteth not? It is that cry, the words whereof are these. Verse 13. Pity me, O Lord, see my humiliation at the hands of my enemies. Why then did he not say, Pity us, O Lord, see our humiliation at the hands of our enemies, as if many poor were crying, but as if one, Pity me, O Lord. Is it because one intercedeth for the saints? Who first for our sakes became poor, though he was rich? And it is he who saith, who exalteth me from the gates of death? Verse 14. That I may declare all thy praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion. For man is exalted in him, not that man only which he beareth, which is the head of the church, but whichsoever one of us also is among the other members, and is exalted from all deprived desires, which are the gates of death for that through them is the road to death, but the joy in fruition is at once death itself, when one gains what he hath in abandoned willfulness coveted. For coveting is the root of all evil, and therefore is the gate of death, for the widow that liveth in pleasures is dead. At which pleasures we arrive through desires, as it were, through the gates of death, but all highest purposes are the gates of the daughter of Zion, through which we come to the vision of the peace in the holy church. In these gates, therefore, all the praises of God are well shown forth, that what is holy may not be given to dogs, nor pearls cast before swine. Who would rather forwardly bark than earnestly inquire? Who would neither bark nor inquire, but wallow in the mire of their own lusts? But when God's praises are shown forth in good earnestness, to them that seek it is given, to them that inquire it is made manifest, to them that knock it is opened. More happily are the gates of death, the bodily senses and eyes, which were opened when the man tasted of the forbidden tree, from which they are exalted, to whom it is said that they should seek not the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And the gates of the daughter of Zion, the sacraments and the beginnings of faith, which are open to them that knock, that they may arrive at the hidden things of the Son. For eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it ascended in the heart of man what things God hath prepared for them that love him. Thus far is the cry of the poor, which the Lord hath not forgotten. Then follows, I will exalt for thy salvation. That is, with blessedness shall I be holden by thy salvation, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, the power and wisdom of God. Therefore says the church, which is here in affliction and is saved by hope, as long as the hidden judgment of the Son is, in hope, she says, I will exalt for thy salvation, for now she is worn down, either by the roar of violence around her, or by the errors of the heathen. Verse 15. The heathen are fixed in the corruption which they made. Consider ye how punishment is reserved for the sinner, out of his own works, and how they have wished to persecute the church, have been fixed in that corruption, which they thought to inflict, for they were desiring to kill the body, whilst they themselves were dying in soul. In that snare which they hid, has their foot been taken? The hidden snare is crafty devising. The foot of the soul is well understood to be its love, which when depraved is called coveting or lust, but when upright, love or charity. For by love it is moved, as it were, to the place whither it tendeth. But the soul's place is not in any space 
which bodily form occupies, but in the delight at which she rejoices to have attained through love. But a pernicious delight follows coveting, a profitable one charity, whence coveting is also called a root. The root, moreover, is taken for, so to say, the foot of the tree. Charity, too, is called a root, where the Lord speaks of the seed, which in the stony places withers under the scorching sun, because it had not deep root. Whereby he points out those that rejoice in receiving the word of truth, but give way in persecution, which can be withstood by love only. And the apostle says, that being rooted and grounded in love, ye may be able to take in. The foot then of sinners, that is, their love, is taken in the snare which they hide. For when delight shall have followed on to deceitful dealing, when God shall have delivered them over to the lust of their heart, that delight at once binds them, and they dare not tear away their love thence, and apply it to profitable objects. For when they shall make the attempt, they will be pained in heart, as if desiring to free their foot from a fetter, and giving way under this pain, they refuse to withdraw from pernicious delights. In the snare, then, which they have made, that is, in deceitful counsel, their foot hath been taken. That is their love, which through deceit attains to that vain joy, whereby pain is purchased. Verse 16. The Lord is known, executing judgments. These are God's judgments, not from the tranquility of his blessedness, nor from the secret places of wisdom, wherein blessed souls are received, is the sword, or fire, or wild beast, or any such thing brought forth, whereby sinners may be tormented. But how are they tormented, and how does the Lord do judgment? In the works, he says, of his own hands hath the sinner been caught. Here is interposed the song of the Dicelma, as it were the hidden joy, as far as we can imagine, of the separation which is now made, not in place, but in the affections of the heart, between sinners and the righteous, as of the corn from the chaff, as yet on the floor. And then follows, verse 17, Let the sinners be turned into hell. That is, let them be given into their own hands when they are spared, and let them be ensnared in deadly delight. All the nations that forget God. Because when they did not think good to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a retrobate mind. Verse 18. For there shall not be forgetfulness of the poor man to the end. Who now seems to be in forgetfulness, when sinners are thought to flourish in this world's happiness, and the righteous to be in travail. But the patience, saith he, of the poor man shall not perish for ever. Wherefore, there is need of patience now to bear with the evil, who are already separated in will, till they be also separated at the last judgment. Verse 19. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. The future judgment is prayed for, but before it come, let the heathen, saith he, be judged in thy sight, that is, in secret, which is called in God's sight, with the knowledge of a few holy and righteous ones. Verse 20. Place a lawgiver over them, O Lord. He seems to me to point out Antichrist, of whom the apostle says, When the man of sin shall be revealed, let the heathen know they are men that they who will be set free by the Son of God and belong to the Son of Man and be sons of men, that is, new men, may serve man, that is, the old man, the sinner, for that they are men. But because it is believed that he is to arrive at so great a pitch of empty glory, and he will be permitted to do so great things, both against all men and against the saints of God, that then some weak ones shall indeed think that God cares not for human affairs. The psalmist interposing a dicelma adds, as it were, the voice of men groaning and asking why judgment is deferred. Psalm 10, verse 1. Why, O Lord, saith he, hast thou withdrawn afar off? 
then he who thus inquired as if all on a sudden he understood or as if he asked though he knew that he might teach adds thou despisest in due seasons in tribulations that is thou despisest seasonably and causest tribulations to inflame men's minds with longing for thy coming or that fountain of life is sweeter to them that have much thirst therefore he hints the reason of the delay saying verse two whilst the ungodly vaulteth himself the poor man is inflamed wondrous it is and true with what earnestness of good hope the little ones are inflamed unto upright living by comparison with sinners in which mystery it comes to pass that even heresies are permitted to exist not that heretics themselves wish this but because divine providence worketh this result from their sins which both maketh and ordaineth the light but ordereth only the darkness that by comparison wherewith the light may be more pleasant as comparison with heretics the discovery of truth is more sweet for so by this comparison the approved who are known to god are made manifest among men they are taken in their thoughts which they think that is their evil thoughts become chains to them but how become they chains verse three for the sinner is praised saith he in the desires of his soul the tongues of flatterers bind souls in sin for there is pleasure in doing those things in which not only the reprover feared but even an approver heard and he that does unrighteous deeds is blessed hence are they taken in their thoughts which they think verse four the sinner hath angered the lord let no one congratulate the man that prospers in his way to whose sins no avenger is nigh and approver is by this is the great anger of the lord for the sinner hath angered the lord that he should suffer these things that is should not suffer the scourging of correction the sinner hath angered the lord according to the multitude of his anger he will not search it out great is his anger when he searcheth not out when he as it were forgetteth and marketh not sin and by fraud and wickedness man attains to riches and honors which will especially be the case in that antichrist who will seem to men blessed to that degree that he will even be thought god but how great this anger of god is we are taught by what follows god is not in his sight verse five his ways are polluted in all time he that knows what in the soul gives joy and gladness knows how great an ill it is to be abandoned by the light of truth since a great ill do men reckon the blindness of their bodily eyes whereby this light is withdrawn how great then is the punishment he endures who through the prosperous issue of his sins is brought to that pass that god is not in his sight and that his ways are polluted in all time that is his thoughts and counsels are unclean thy judgments are taken away from his face for the mind conscious of evil whilst it seems to itself to suffer no punishment believes that god doth not judge and so are god's judgments taken away from its face while this very thing is great condemnation and he shall have dominion over all his enemies for so it is delivered that he will overcome all kings and alone obtain the kingdom since too according to the apostle who preaches concerning him he shall sit in the temple of god exalting himself above all that is worshipped and that is called god and seeing that being delivered over to the lust of his own heart and predestined to extreme condemnation he is to come by wicked arts to that vain and empty height and rule therefore it follows verse six for he hath said in his heart i shall not move from generation to generation without evil that is my fame and my name will not pass from this generation to the generation of posterity unless by evil arts i acquire so lofty a principality that prosperity cannot be silent concerning it 
or a mind abandoned and void of good arts and estranged from the light of righteousness by bad arts deceives a passage for itself to a fame so lasting as is celebrated even in posterity and they that cannot be known for good desire that men should speak of them for ill provided that their name spread far and wide and this i think is meant here i shall not move from generation to generation without evil there is too another interpretation if a mind vain and full of error supposes that it cannot come from the mortal generation to the generation of eternity but by bad arts which indeed was also reported of simon when he thought that he would gain heaven by wicked arts and pass from the human generation to the generation divine by magic where then is the wonder if that man of sin too who is to fill up all the wickedness and ungodliness which all false prophets have begun and to do such great signs that if it were possible he should deceive the very elect shall say in his heart i shall not move from generation to generation without evil verse seven whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness and deceit for it is a great curse to seek heaven by such abominable arts and to get together such earnings for acquiring the eternal seat but of this cursing his mouth is full for this desire shall not take effect but within his mouth only will avail to destroy him who dared promise himself such things with bitterness and deceit that is with anger and insidiousness whereby he is to bring over the multitude to his side under his tongue is toil and grief nothing is more toilsome than unrighteousness and ungodliness upon which toil follows grief for that the toil is not only without fruit but even unto destruction which toil and grief refers to that which he hath said in his heart i shall not be moved from generation to generation without evil and therefore under his tongue not on his tongue because he will devise these things in silence and to men will speak other things that he may appear good and just and a son of god verse eight he lieth in ambush with the rich what rich but those whom he will load with this world's gifts and he is therefore said to lie in ambush with them because he will display their false happiness to deceive men who when with a perverted will they desire to such as they and seek not the good things eternal will fall into his snares that in the dark he may kill the innocent in the dark i suppose is said where it is not easily understood what should be sought or what avoided now to kill the innocent is of an innocent to make one guilty his eyes look against the poor for he is chiefly to persecute the righteous of whom it is said blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven verse nine he lieth in wait in a secret place as a lion in his den by a lion in his den he means one in whom both violence and deceit will work for the first persecution of the church was violent when by proscriptions by torments by murders the christians were compelled to sacrifice another persecution is crafty which is now conducted by heretics of any kind and false brethren there remains a third which is to come by antichrist than which there is nothing more perilous for it will be at once violent and crafty violence he will exert in empire craft in miracles to the violence the word lion refers to craft the words in his den and these are again repeated with a change of order he lieth in wait he says that he may catch the poor this hath reference to craft but what follows to catch the poor whilst he draweth him is put to the score of violence for draweth means he bringeth him to himself by violence by whatever tortures he can again the two which follow are the same verse ten in his snare he will humble him is craft he shall decline and fall whilst he shall have dominion over the poor is violence for a snare naturally points to lying in wait 
but dominion most openly conveys the idea of terror for well does he say he will humble him in his snare for when he shall begin to do those signs the more wonderful they shall appear to men the more those saints that shall then will be despised and as it were set at naught he whom they shall resist by righteousness and innocence shall seem to overcome by the marvels that he does but he shall decline and fall whilst he shall have domination over the poor that is whilst he shall inflict whatsoever punishments he will upon the servants of god that resist him but how shall he decline and fall verse ten for he hath said in his heart god hath forgotten he turneth away his face that he see not unto the end this is declining and the most wretched fall while the mind of a man prospers as it were in its iniquities and thinks that it is spared when it is being blinded and kept for an extreme and untimely vengeance of which the psalmist now speaks verse twelve arise o lord let thine hand be exalted that is let thy power be made manifest now he has said above arise o lord let not man prevail let the heathen be judged in thy sight that is in secret where gods alone see it this comes to pass when the ungodly have arrived at what seems great happiness to men over whom is placed a lawgiver such as they had deserved to have of whom it is said place a lawgiver over them o lord let the heathen know that they are men but now after that hidden punishment and vengeance it is said arise o lord god let thine hand be exalted not of course in secret but now in glory most manifest that thou forget not the poor unto the end that is as the ungodly think who say god hath forgotten he turneth away his face that he should not see unto the end now they deny that god seeth unto the end who say that he careth not for things human and earthly for the earth is as it were the end of things in that it is the last element in which men labor in most orderly sort but they cannot see the order of their labors which specially belongs to the hidden things of the sun the church then laboring in such times like a ship in great waves and tempests awaketh the lord as if he were sleeping that he should command the winds and calm should be restored he says therefore arise o lord let thine hand be exalted that thou forget not the poor unto the end accordingly understand now the manifest judgment and in exaltation at it they say verse thirteen wherefore hath the ungodly angered god that is what had it profited him to do so great evil for he said in his heart he will not require it then follows verse fourteen for thou seest toil and considerest anger to deliver them into thine hands this sentence looks for distinct explanation wherein if there shall be error it becomes obscure for thus has the ungodly said in his heart god will not require it as though god regarded toil and anger to deliver them into his hands that is as though he feared toil and anger and for this reason should spare them lest their punishment be too burdensome to him or lest he should be disturbed by the storm of anger as men generally act accusing themselves of vengeance to avoid toil or anger the poor hath been left unto thee for therefore is he poor that is hath despised all the temporal goods of this world that thou mayest be his hope thou wilt be a helper to the orphan that is to him to whom his father this world by whom he was born after the flesh dies and who can already say the world hath been crucified unto me and i unto the world for of such orphans god becomes the father the lord teaches us in truth that his disciples do become orphans to whom he saith call no man father on earth of which he first himself gave an example in saying 
who is my mother, and who my brethren, whence some most mischievous heretics would assert that he had no mother, and they do not see that it follows from this, if they pay attention to these words, that neither had his disciples' fathers. For as he said, Who is my mother? So he taught them when he said, Call no man your father on earth. Verse 15. Break the arm of the sinner and of the malicious. Of him, namely, of whom it was said above, He shall have dominion over all his enemies. He called his power then his arm, to which Christ's power is opposed, of which it is said, Arise, O Lord God, let thine hand be exalted. His fault shall be required, and he shall not be found because of it. That is, he shall be judged for his sins, and himself shall perish because of his sin. After this, what wonder if there follow, verse 16, The Lord shall reign for ever, and world without end. He heathen shall perish out of his earth. He uses heathen for sinners and ungodly. Verse 17. The Lord hath heard the longing of the poor. The longing wherewith they were burning, when in the straits and tribulations of this world they desired the day of the Lord. But I hath heard the preparation of their heart. This is the preparation of the heart, of which it is sung in another psalm. My heart is prepared, O God, my heart is prepared, of which the apostle says, but if we hope for what we see not, we do with patience wait for it. Now by the ear of God, we ought, according to a general rule of interpretation, to understand not a bodily member, but the power whereby he heareth. And so, not to repeat this often, by whatever members of his are mentioned, which in us are visible and bodily, must be understood powers of operation, for we must not suppose it anything bodily in that the Lord God hears not the sound of the voice, but the preparation of the heart. Verse 18. To judge for the orphan and the humble. That is, not for him who is conformed to this world, nor for the proud. For it is one thing to judge the orphan, another to judge for the orphan. He judges the orphan even who condemns him. But he judges for the orphan who delivers sentence for him that man add not further to magnify himself upon the earth. For they are men of whom it was said, Place a lawgiver over them, O Lord. Let the heathen know they are men. But he too, who in this passage is understood to be placed over them, will be a man of whom it is now said, That man add not further to magnify himself upon the earth. Namely, when the Son of Man shall come to judge for the orphan, who had put off from himself the old man, and thus, as it were, buried his father. After the hidden things, then, of the Son, of which in this psalm many things have been said, will come the manifest things of the Son, of which a little has been now said at the end of the psalm. But the title is given from the former, which here occupy the larger portion. Indeed, the very day of the Lord's advent may be rightly numbered among the hidden things of the Son, although the very presence of the Lord itself will be manifest. For of that day it is said that no man knoweth it, neither angels, nor powers, nor the Son of Man. What then so hidden as that which is said to be hidden even to the judge himself, not as regards knowledge, but disclosure, but concerning the hidden things of the Son, even if any one would not wish to understand the Son of God, but of David himself, to whose name the whole Psalter is attributed. For the Psalms we know are called the Psalms of David. Let him give ear to those words in which it is said to the Lord, Have mercy on us, O Son of David. And so even in this manner let him understand the same Lord Christ, concerning whose hidden things is the inscription of this Psalm. For so likewise it is said by the angel, God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Nor to this understanding of it is the sentence opposed in which the same Lord asks of the Jews if Christ be the son of David. How then doth he and the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, 
until I put thine enemies under thy feet. For it was said to the unskilled, although they looked for Christ's coming, yet expected him as a man, not as the power and wisdom of God. He teacheth then, in that place, the most true and pure faith, that he is both the Lord of King David, and that he is the word in the beginning, God with God, by which all things were made, and Son, and that he was made to him of the seed of David according to the flesh. For he doth not say, Christ is not David's son, but if ye already hold that he is his son, learn how he is his Lord, and do not hold in respect of Christ that he is the son of man, for so is he David's son, and leave out that he is the son of God, for so is he David's Lord. End of Psalm 9 and 10psalm 11 of exposition on the book of psalms by saint augustine this librivox recording is in the public domain to the end a psalm of david himself this title does not require a fresh consideration for the meaning of to the end has already been sufficiently handled let us then look to the text itself of the psalm which to me appears to be sung against the heretics who by rehearsing and exaggerating the sins of many in the church, as if either all or the majority among them themselves were righteous, strive to turn and snatch us away from the breasts of the one true mother church, affirming that Christ is with them, and warning us, as if with piety and earnestness, that by passing over to them we may go over to Christ, whom they falsely declare they have. Now it is known that in the prophecy, Christ, among the many names, in which notice of him is conveyed an allegory, is also called a mountain, we must accordingly answer these people and say, verse 1, I trust in the Lord. How say ye to my soul, remove unto the mountains as a sparrow? I keep to one mountain wherein I trust. How say ye that I should pass over to you, as if there were many Christs? Or if through pride you say that you are mountains, I had indeed need to be a sparrow, winged with the powers and commandments of God, but these very things hinder my flying to these mountains, and placing my trust in proud men. I have a house where I may rest, in that I trust in the Lord, for even the sparrow hath found her house, and the Lord hath become a refuge to the poor. Let us say then, with all confidence, lest while we seek Christ among heretics we lose him. In the Lord I trust. How say ye to my soul, remove into the mountain as a sparrow? Verse 2. For lo, sinners have bent the bow, they have prepared their arrows in the quiver, that they may in the obscure moon shoot at the upright in heart. These be the terrors of those who threaten us as touching sinners, that we may pass over to them as the righteous. Lo, they say, the sinners have bent the bow. The scriptures, I suppose, by carnal interpretation, of which they emit envenomed sentences from them, they have prepared their arrows in their quiver. The same words, that is, which they will shoot out on the authority of scripture, they have prepared in the secret place of the heart, that they may in the obscure moon shoot at the upright in heart, that when they see from the church's light being obscured by the multitude of the unlearned and the carnal, that they cannot be convicted, they may corrupt good manners by evil communications. But against all these terrors we must say, In the Lord I trust. Now I remember that I promised to consider in this psalm with what suitableness the moon signifies the church. There are two probable opinions concerning the moon, but of these which is the true? I suppose it either impossible or very difficult for a man to decide. For when we ask whence the moon has her light, some say that it is her own, but that of her globe half is bright and half dark. And when she revolves in her own orbit, that part wherein she is bright gradually turns towards the earth. 
so as that it may be seen by us, and that therefore at first her appearance is as if she were horned. But if you make a ball half white and half dark, if you have the dark part before your eyes, you will see none of the white. And when you begin turning that white part to your eyes, if you do it gradually, at first you will see horns of whiteness, and afterwards it increases gradually, until the whole white part is brought opposite to the eye, and none of the other dark part is visible. But if you continue still gradually turning, the darkness begins to appear and the whiteness to diminish, until it returns again to horns, and is at last wholly removed from the eye, and again that dark part alone can be seen, which they say takes place, when the light of the moon seems to increase up to the fifteenth day, and again diminishes up to the thirteenth, and returns to horns, until no light at all appears in it. According to this opinion, the moon in allegory signifies the church, because in its spiritual part the church is bright, but in its carnal part is dark and sometimes the spiritual part is seen by good works, but sometimes it lies hid in the conscience, and is known to God alone, since in the body alone it is seen by men, as happens when we pray in heart, and as it were seem to be doing nothing, whilst we are enjoined to have our hearts upward, not to the earth, but toward the Lord. But others say that the moon has no light of her own, but is lighted by the sun, but that when she is with it, she keeps that part in which she is not lighted towards us, and therefore there is no light visible in her. But when she begins to recede from the sun, she is lighted in that part also, which is towards the earth, and that she necessarily brings with horns, until the fifteenth day she becomes opposite the sun." for then she rises when the sun sets, so that whosoever shall observe the sun setting, if he turn to the east, as he first loses sight of it, may see the moon rising, and thenceforward, when she begins to approach him on the other side, she turns towards us that part, in which she is not lighted, till she returns to horns and afterwards altogether vanishes, because then the part which is lighted is on high towards the heaven, but towards the earth the part which the sun cannot irradiate. Therefore, according to this opinion also, the moon is understood to be the church, because she has no light of her own, but is lighted by the only begotten Son of God, who in many places of Holy Scripture is allegorically called the sun, whom certain heretics, being ignorant of, and not able to discern him, endeavor to turn away the minds of the simple to this corporal and visible sun, which is the common light of the flesh of men and flies. And some they do pervert, who, as long as they cannot behold with the mind the inner light of truth, will not be content with the simple Catholic faith, which is the only safety to babes, and by which milk alone they can arrive in assured strength, at the firm support of more solid food. Whichever then of these two opinions be the true, the moon in allegory is fitly understood as the church. Or, if in such difficulties as these, troublesome rather than edifying, there be either no satisfaction or no leisure to exercise the mind, or if the mind itself be not capable of it, it is sufficient to regard the moon with ordinary eyes, and not to seek out obscure causes, but with all men to perceive her increasings and fullnesses and wanings, and if she wanes to the end that she may be renewed, even to this rude multitude she sets forth the image of the church, in which the resurrection of the dead is believed. Next we must inquire what in this psalm is meant by the obscure moon, in which sinners have prepared to shoot at the upright in heart. For not in one way only may the moon be said to be obscure, for when her monthly course is finished, and when her brightness is interrupted by a cloud, and when she is eclipsed at the full, the moon may be called obscure. It may then be understood first of the persecutors of the martyrs, 
for that they wished in the obscure moon to shoot at the upright in heart, whether it be yet in the time of the church's youth, because she had not yet shone forth in greatness on the earth, and conquered the darkness of heathen superstitions, or by the tongues of blasphemers, and such as defame the Christian name, when the earth was, as it were, beclouded, the moon, that is, the church, could not be clearly seen, or when by the slaughter of the martyrs themselves, and so great effusion of blood, as by that eclipse and obscuration, wherein the moon seems to exhibit a bloody face, the weak were deterred from the Christian name, in which terror sinners shot out words crafty and sacrilegious to pervert even the upright in heart. And secondly, it can be understood of these sinners whom the church contains, because at that time, taking the opportunity of this moon's obscurity, they committed many crimes, which are now tauntingly objected to us by the heretics, whereas their founders are said to have been guilty of them. But howsoever that be which was done in the obscure moon, now that the Catholic name is spread and celebrated throughout the whole world, what concern of mine is it to be disturbed by things unknown? For in the Lord I trust, nor do I listen to them that say to my soul, Remove into the mountains as a sparrow. For lo, sinners have bent the bow, that they may in the obscure moon shoot at the upright in heart. Or if the moon seem even now obscure to them, because they would make it uncertain, which is the Catholic Church, and they strive to convict her by the sins of those many carnal men whom she contains. What concern is this to him who says in truth, In the Lord I trust? By which word every one shows that he is himself wheat, and endures that chaff with patience unto the time of winnowing. In the Lord therefore I trust. Let them fear who trust in man, who cannot deny that they are of man's party, by whose gray hairs they swear, and when in conversation it is demanded of them of what communion they are, unless they say that they are of his party, they cannot be recognized. Tell me, what do they do when the so numberless and daily sins and crimes of those of whom that society is full are recounted to them? Can they say, In the Lord I trust, how say ye to my soul, Remove into the mountains as a sparrow? For they do not trust in the Lord, who say that the sacraments are then holy, if they be administered by holy men. Accordingly, when it is demanded of them, who are holy, they are ashamed to say, we are. Moreover, if they are not ashamed to say so, the hearers are ashamed for them. So then, they force those who receive the sacraments to put their hope in man, whose heart they cannot see. And cursed is every one that putteth his hope in man. For what is it to say, What I give is holy, but put your hope in me? What if you are not holy, or show your heart? But if you cannot do this, how shall I see that you are holy? Or perhaps you will say that it is written, Ye shall know them by their works. I see indeed marvelous works, the daily violences of the circumcellions with the bishops and presbyters for their leaders, flying about in every direction, and calling their terrible clubs Israels, which men now living daily see and feel, but for the times of Macarius, respecting which they raise an invidious cry, most men have not seen them, and no one sees them now, and any Catholic who saw them could say, if he wished to be a servant of God, in the Lord I trust, which indeed he says now, when he sees many things in the church which he would not, who perceives that he as yet swims within those nets full of fish, good and bad, until all arrive at the end of the sea, or the bad are separated from the good. But these, what do they answer? If he whom they baptize say to one of them, How would you have me feel confidence? For if it be the desert of both the giver and the receiver, be it of God the giver, and of my conscience the receiver. For these two, 
his goodness, and my own faith are not doubtful to me. Why do you interpose yourself, of whom I can know nothing certain? Allow me to say, in the Lord I trust. For if I trust in you, how can I trust that you have done no evil this night? Lastly, if you would have me believe you, can I do more than believe respecting yourself? How then can I trust in those with whom you communicated yesterday and communicate today and will communicate tomorrow as to whether even in these three days they have not committed aught of evil? But if what we do not know defileth neither you or me, what cause is there for rebaptizing those who have known nothing of the times of the surrender of the books and of the Marcion cry? What cause that thou shouldest dare to rebaptize Christians coming from Mesopotamia, who never even heard the names of Clesilianius and Donatus, and deny that they are Christians? But if other men's sins, which they know not of, defile them, whatever is each day committed on your side, without your knowledge, makes you guilty, who vainly object the imperial constitutions to Catholics, whilst private clubs and fires rage as they do in your own camp. See where unto they have fallen, who, when they saw sinners in the Catholic Church, could not say, In the Lord I trust, and have placed their hope in man, which they would most certainly say, if they were not themselves, or even if themselves were such as they supposed them to be, from whom, with sacrilegious pride, they pretend that they wish to separate themselves. Let the Catholic soul then say, In the Lord I trust. How say ye to my soul, Remove into the mountains as a sparrow? For lo, the sinners have bent the bow. They have prepared their arrows in the quiver, that they may in the obscure moon shoot at the upright in heart. And from them let her turn her speech to the Lord, and say, Verse 3, for they have destroyed what thou hast perfected. And this let her say, not against these only, but against all heretics. For they have all, as far as in them lies, destroyed the praise which God hath perfected out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, when they disturb the little ones with vain and scrupulous questions, and suffer them not to be nourished with the milk of faith. As if then it were said to this soul, why do they say to you, Remove into the mountains as a sparrow? Why do they frighten you with sinners, who have bent the bow, to shoot in the obscure moon at the upright in heart? She answers, Therefore it is, they frighten me, because they have destroyed what thou hast perfected, where but in their convecticles, where they nourish not with milk, but kill with poison the babes and ignorance of the interior light. But what hath the just done? If Marcius who Calcinus offend you, what hath Christ done to you, who said, My peace I give unto you, my peace I leave with you, which ye with your abominable dissensions have violated? What hath Christ done to you, who with such exceeding patience endured his betrayer as to give to him, as to the other apostles, the first Eucharist consecrated with his own hands and blessed with his own mouth. What hath Christ done to you, who sent this same betrayer, whom he called a devil, who before betraying the Lord could not show good faith even to the Lord's purse with the other disciples to preach the kingdom of heaven, that he might show the gifts of God come to those that with faith receive them, though he through whom they receive them, be such as Judas was. Verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. Yea, in such wise as the apostle saith, For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now if any man shall violate the temple of God, him shall God destroy. He violateth the temple of God, who violateth unity, for he holdeth not the head, from which the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the working after the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. 
The Lord is in this his holy temple, which consisteth of his many members, fulfilling each his own separate duties, by love built up into one building, which temple he violateth, who for the sake of his own preeminence separateth himself from the Catholic society. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord, his seat, is in heaven. If you take heaven to be the just man, as you take the earth to be the sinner, to whom it was said, Earth thou art, and unto earth shalt thou go. The words, The Lord is in his holy temple, you will understand to be repeated, whilst it is said, The Lord, his seat is in heaven. His eyes look upon the poor. His to whom the poor man hath been left, and who hath been made a refuge to the poor, and therefore all the seditions and tumults within these nets, until they be drawn to the shore, concerning which heretics upbraid us to their own ruin, and our correction are caused by those men who will not be Christ poor. But do they turn away God's eyes from such as would be so? For his eyes look upon the poor. Is it to be feared, lest in the crowd of the rich he may not be able to see the few poor, whom he brings up in safe keeping in the bosom of the Catholic Church. His eyelids question the sons of men. Here, by that rule, I would wish to take the sons of men, of those that from old men have been regenerated by faith. For these, by certain obscure passages of Scripture, as it were, the closed eyes of God, are exercised, that they may seek, and again, by certain clear passages, as it were, the open eyes of God are enlightened that they may rejoice. And this frequent closing and opening of the holy books, as it were, the eyelids of God, which question, that is, which try the sons of men, who are neither worried with the obscurity of the matter, but exercised, nor puffed up by knowledge, but confirmed. Verse 5. The Lord questioneth the righteous and the ungodly. Why then do we fear, lest the ungodly should be any hurt to us? If so be they do with insincere heart share the sacraments with us, seeing that he questioneth the righteous and the ungodly. But whoso loveth iniquity hateth his own soul. That is, not him who believeth God, and putteth not his hope in man, but only his own soul doth the lover of iniquity hurt. Verse 6. He shall rain snares upon the sinners. If by clouds are understood prophets generally, whether good or bad, who are also called false prophets, false prophets are so ordered by the Lord God, that by them he may rain snares upon sinners. For no one but the sinner falls into a following of them, whether by way of preparation for the last punishment, if he shall choose to persevere in sin, or to dissuade from pride, if in time he shall come to seek God with a more sincere intent. But if by clouds are understood good and true prophets only, by these two it is clear that God reigneth snares upon sinners, although by them he watereth also the godly unto fruitfulness. To some, saith the apostle, we are the savor of life unto life, but to some the savor of death unto death. For not prophets only, but all who with the word of God water souls may be called clouds, who, when they are understood amiss, God reigneth snares upon sinners, but when they are understood aright, he maketh the hearts of the godly and believing fruitful. As, for instance, the passage, And they too shall be one flesh. If one interpret it with an eye to lust, he reigneth a snare upon the sinner. But if you understand it as he who says, But I speak concerning Christ and the church, he reigneth a shower on the fertile soil. Now both are affected by the same cloud, that is, Holy Scripture. Again the Lord says, Not that which goeth into your mouth defileth you, but that which cometh out. The sinner hears this, and makes ready his palate for gluttony. The righteous hears it, and is guarded against the superstitious distinction in meats. Here then, also, out of the same cloud of Scripture, according to the several deserts of each, upon the sinner the rain of snares, upon the righteous the rain of fruitfulness is poured. 
fire and brimstone, and the blast of the tempest is the portion of their cup. This is their punishment and end, by whom the name of God is blasphemed, that first they should be wasted by the fire of their own lusts, then by the ill savor of their evil deeds, cast out from the company of the blessed, at last carried away and overwhelmed, suffer penalties unspeakable, for this is the portion of their cup. As of the righteous, thy cup inebriating, how excellent it is, for they shall be inebriated with the richness of thine house. Now I suppose a cup is mentioned for this reason, that we should not suppose that anything is done by God's providence, even in the very punishments of sinners, beyond moderation and measure. And, therefore, as if he were giving a reason why this should be, he added, verse 7, For the Lord is righteous, and has loved righteousnesses. The plural, not without meaning, but only because he speaks of men, is as that righteousnesses be understood to be used for righteous men. For in many righteous men there seem, so to say, to be righteousnesses, whereas there is one only righteousness of God, whereof they all participate. Like as when one face looks upon many mirrors, what in it is the only one, is by those many mirrors reflected manifoldly. Wherefore he recurs to the singular, saying, His faith hath seen iniquity. Perhaps his face hath seen equity, is as if it were said, Equity hath been seen in his face, that is, in knowledge of him. For God's face is the power by which he is made known to them that are worthy. Or at least, his face hath seen equity, because he doth not allow himself to be known by the evil, but by the good. And this is equity. But if any one would understand the moon of the synagogue, let him refer the psalm to the Lord's passion, and of the Jews say, For they have destroyed what thou hast perfected, and of the Lord himself, but what had the just done, whom they accused as the destroyer of the law, whose precepts by their corrupt living, and by despising them, and by setting up their own, they had destroyed, so that the Lord himself may speak as man, as he is wont, saying, In the Lord I trust, how say ye to my soul, Remove into the mountains as a sparrow, by reason, that is, of the fear of those who desire to apprehend and crucify him, since the interpretation is not unreasonable of sinners wishing to shoot at the upright in heart, that is, those who believed in Christ, in the obscure moon, that is, the synagogue filled with sinners, in this too, the words, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord, his seat is in the heaven, are suitable. That is, the word in man, or the very son of man who is in heaven. His eyes look upon the poor, either on him whom he assumed as God, or for whom he suffered as man. His eyelids question the sons of men, the closing and opening of the eyes, which is probably meant by the word eyelids, we may take to be his death and resurrection, whereby he tried the sons of men, his disciples, terrified at his passion, and gladdened by the resurrection. The Lord questioneth the righteous and ungodly. Even now, from out of heaven, governing the church, but whosoever loveth iniquity, hateth his own soul. Why is it so? What follows teaches us, for he shall rain snares upon the sinners, which is to be taken according to the exposition given above, and so on with all the rest of the psalm. End of Psalm 11。Psalm 12 Exposition on the Book of Psalms。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Press. Exposition on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine of Hippo. Translated by Philip Schaeff. Psalm 12. To the end, for the eighth, a psalm of David. 1. It has been said on the sixth psalm that the eighth may be taken as the day of judgment, for the eighth may also be taken for the eternal age, for that after the time present, which is a cycle of seven days, it shall be given to the saints. 
2, verse 1. Save me, O Lord, for the holy hath failed. That is, is not found. As we speak when we say corn fails or money fails, for the truths have been minished from among the sons of men. The truth is one whereby holy souls are enlightened, but forasmuch as there are many souls, there may be said in them to be many truths, as in mirrors there are seen many reflections from one face. 3. Verse 2. He hath talked vanity each man to his neighbor. By neighbor we must understand every man, for that there is no one with whom we should work evil, and the love of our neighbor worketh no evil. Deceitful lips with a heart and a heart they have spoken evil things. The repetition with a heart and a heart signifies a double heart. 4. Verse 3. May the Lord destroy all deceitful lips. He says all that no one may suppose himself accepted, as the apostle says, Upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and of the Greek, the tongue speaking great things, the proud tongue. 5. Verse 4. Who hath said, We will magnify our tongue, our lips are our own? Who is Lord over us? Proud hypocrites are men, putting confidence in their speech to deceive men and not submitting themselves to God. 6. Verse 5. Because of the wretchedness of the needy and the sighing of the poor, now I will arise, saith the Lord. For so the Lord himself in the gospel pitied his people, because they had no ruler when they could well obey. Whence too it is said in the gospel, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. This must be taken as spoken in the person of God the Father, who, because of the needy and the poor, that is, who in need and poverty were lacking spiritual good things, vouchsafed to send his own Son. For thence begins his sermon on the mount in Matthew, where he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I will place in salvation. He does not say what he would place, but in salvation must be understood as in Christ, according to that, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. And hence he is understood to have placed in him what appertains to taking away the wretchedness of the needy, and the comforting the sighing of the poor. I will dwell confidently in him according to that in the gospel, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. 7 verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. This is in the person of the prophet himself, the words of the Lord are pure words. He says, Pure of out the alloy of pretense. For many preach the truth impurely, for they sell it for the bribe of the advantages of this life. Of such, the apostle says that they declared Christ not purely, silver tried by the fire for the earth. These words of the Lord by means of tribulations approved to sinners. Purified seven times by the fear of God, by godliness, by knowledge, by might, by counsel, by understanding, by wisdom. For seven steps also of beatitude there are, which the Lord goes over according to Matthew in the same sermon which he spake on the mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed the meek, blessed they that mourn, blessed they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed the merciful, blessed the pure in heart, blessed the peacemakers. Of which seven sentences it may be observed how all that long sermon was spoken. For the eighth word is said, blessed are they which suffer persecution for righteousness sake, but notice the fire itself, whereby the silver is proved seven times. And at the termination of the sermon it is said, For he taught them as one having authority, and not as their scribes, which refers to that which is said in this psalm, I deal competently in him. 8. Verse 7. Thou, O Lord, shalt preserve us, and keep us from this generation to eternity, here as needy and poor, there as wealthy and rich. 9. Verse 8. The ungodly walk in a circle round about, that is, in the desire of things temporal, which resolves as a wheel in a repeated circle of seven days, and therefore they do not arrive at the eighth, that is, at eternity, for that which the psalm is entitled. So too it is said by Solomon, For the wise king is the winnier of the ungodly, and he bringeth on them the wheel of the wicked. After thine height thou hast multiplied the sons of men. For there is in temporal things too a multiplication, which turns away from the unity of God. Hence the corruptible body weigheth down to the soul, and the earthly tabernacle presseth down the mind that museth upon many things. But the righteous are multiplied after the height of God when they shall go from strength to strength. End of Psalm 12. Psalm 13 of Exposition on the Book of Psalms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Exposition on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine of Hippo. Translated by Philip Schaff. Psalm 13, Unto the End, A Psalm of David. 
for Christ is the end of the law to every one that believeth. Verse 1. How long, O Lord, wilt thou forget me unto the end? That is, put me off as to spiritually understanding Christ, who is the wisdom of God, and the true end of all the aim of the soul. How long dost thou turn away thy face from me? As God doth not forget, so neither doth he turn his face away. But Scripture speaks after our manner. Now God is said to turn away his face when he doth not give to the soul, which as yet hath not the pure eye of the mind, the knowledge of himself. Verse 2. How long shall I place counsel in my soul? There is no need of counsel but in adversity. Therefore, how long shall I place counsel in my soul? Is as if it were said, How long shall I be in adversity? Or at least it is an answer, so that the meaning is this. So long, O Lord, wilt thou forget me to the end, and so long turn away thy face from me, until I shall place counsel in mine own soul, so that except a man place counsel in his own soul to work mercy perfectly, God will not direct him to the end, nor give him that full knowledge of himself which is face to face. Sorrow in my heart through the day, how long shall I have is understood. And through the day, signifies continuance, so that day is taken for time, from which as each one longs to be free, he has sorrow in his heart, making entreaty to rise to things eternal, and not endure man's day. How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Either the devil or carnal habit. Verse 3. Look on me and hear me, O Lord my God, Look on me, refers to what was said, How long dost thou turn away thy face from me? Here refers to what was said, How long wilt thou forget me to the end? Lighten mine eyes, that I sleep not in death. The eyes of the heart must be understood, that they be not closed by the pleasurable eclipse of sin. Verse 4 lest at any time mine enemies say, I have prevailed against him. The devil's mockery is to be feared. They that trouble me will exult if I be moved. The devil and his angels, who exulted not over that righteous man, Job, when they troubled him, because he was not moved, that is, did not draw back from the steadfastness of his faith. Verse 5 but I have hoped in thy mercy. Because this very thing, that a man be not moved, and that he abide fixed in the Lord, he should not attribute to self, lest when he glories that he hath not been moved, he be moved by this very pride. My heart shall exult in thy salvation, in Christ, in the wisdom of God. Verse 6 I will sing to the Lord who hath given me good things, spiritual good things, not belonging to man's day. And I will chant to the name of the Lord Most High. That is, I give thanks with joy, and in most due order employ my body, which is the song of the spiritual soul. But if any distinction is to be marked here, I will sing with my heart. I will chant with my works to the Lord, that which he alone seeth, but to the name of the Lord, that which is known among men, which is serviceable not for him, but for us. End of Psalm 13psalm fourteen of exposition on the book of psalms this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org exposition on the book of psalms by st augustine of hippo 
Translated by Philip Schaff. Psalm 14 To the End A Psalm of David Himself What to the end means must not be too often repeated. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth, as the Apostle saith. We believe on him when we begin to enter on the good road. We shall see him when we shall get to the end, and therefore is he the end. Verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. For not even have certain sacrilegious and abominable philosophers, who entertain perverse and false notions of God, dared to say, There is no God. Therefore it is, hath said, in his heart, for that no one dares to say it, even if he has dared to think it. They are corrupt and become abominable in their affections. That is, whilst they love this world and love not God, these are the affections which corrupt the soul, and so blind it that the fool can even say, In his heart there is no God. For as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. There is none that doeth goodness, no, not up to one. Up to one can be understood either with that one, so that no man be understood, or besides one, that the Lord Christ may be accepted. As we say, this field is up to the sea, we do not, of course, reckon the sea together with the field. And this is the better interpretation, so that none be understood to have done goodness up to Christ, for that no man can do goodness, except he shall have shown it. And that is true, for until a man know the one God, he cannot do goodness. Verse 2 The Lord from heaven looked out upon the sons of men, to see if there be one understanding, or seeking after God. It may be interpreted upon the Jews, as he may have given them the more honorable name of the sons of men, by reason of their worship of the one God, in comparison with the Gentiles, of whom I suppose it was said above, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God, etc. Now the Lord looks out that he may see by his holy souls, which is the meaning of from heaven, for by himself nothing is hid from him. Verse 3. All have gone out of the way, they have together become useless. That is, the Jews have become as the Gentiles, who were spoken of above. There is none that doeth good, no not up to one must be interpreted as above. Their throat is an open sepulchre. Either the veracity of the ever-open palate is signified, or, allegorically, those who slay, and as it were devour those they have slain, into whom they instill the disorder of their own conversation. Like to which, with the contrary meaning, is that which was said to Peter, kill and eat that he should convert the Gentiles to his own faith and good conversation. With their tongues they have dealt craftily. Flattery is the companion of the greedy and of all bad men. The poison of asps is under their lips. By poison he means deceit, and of asps, because they will not hear the precepts of the law, as asps, will not hear the voice of the charmer, which is said more clearly in another psalm, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. This is the poison of asps. Their feet are swift to shed blood. He here shows forth the habit of ill-doing. Destruction and unhappiness are in their ways. For all the ways of evil men are full of toil and misery. Hence the Lord cries out, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, 
for i am meek and lowly in heart for my yoke is easy and my burden light and the way of peace have they not known that way namely which the lord as i said mentions in the easy yoke and light burden there is no fear of god before their eyes these do not say there is no god but yet they do not fear god verse four shall not all who work iniquity know he threatens the judgment who devour my people as the food of bread that is daily for the food of bread is daily food now they devour the people who serve their own ends out of them not referring their ministry to the glory of god and the salvation of those over whom they are they have not called upon the lord for he doth not really call upon him who longs for such things as are displeasing to him verse five there they tremble for fear where no fear was that is for the loss of things temporal for they said if we let him thus alone all men will believe on him and the romans will come and take away both our place and nation they fear to lose an earthly kingdom where no fear was and they lost the kingdom of heaven which they ought to have feared and this must be understood of all temporal goods the loss of which when men fear they come not to things eternal for god is in the just generation it refers to what went before so that the sense is shall not all they that work iniquity know that the lord is in the just generation that is he is not in them who love the world for it is unjust to leave the maker of the worlds and serve the creature more than the creator verse six ye have shamed the counsel of the poor for the lord is his hope that is ye have despised the humble coming of the son of god because ye saw not in him the pomp of the world that they whom he was calling should put their hope in god alone not in the things that pass away verse seven who will give salvation to israel out of zion who but he whose humiliation ye have despised is understood for he will come in glory to the judgment of the quick and the dead and the kingdom of the just that forasmuch as in that humble coming blindness hath happened in part unto israel that the fullness of the gentiles might enter in in that other should happen what follows and so all israel should be saved for the apostle too takes that testimony of isaiah where it is said there shall come out of zion he who shall turn away ungodliness from jacob for the jews as it is here who shall give salvation to israel out of zion when the lord shall turn away the captivity of his people jacob shall rejoice and israel shall be glad it is a repetition as is usual for i suppose israel shall be glad is the same as jacob shall rejoice end of psalm fourteen psalm fifteen of exposition on the book of psalms this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Exposition on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine of Hippo, translated by Philip Schaff. Psalm 15, a Psalm of David himself. Touching this title, there is no question. Verse 1 o lord who shall sojourn in thy tabernacle although tabernacle be sometimes used even for an everlasting habitation yet when tabernacle is taken in its proper meaning it is a thing of war hence soldiers are called tent fellows as having their tents together 
This sense is assisted by the words, Who shall sojourn? For we war with the devil for a time, and then we need a tabernacle wherein we may refresh ourselves, which specially points out the faith of the temporal dispensation, which was wrought for us in time through the incarnation of the Lord. And who shall rest in thy holy mountain? Here perhaps he signifies at once the eternal habitation itself, that we should understand by mountain the supereminence of the love of Christ in life eternal. Verse 2 He who walketh without stain and worketh righteousness. Here he has laid down the proposition. In what follows he sets it forth in detail. Who speaketh the truth in his heart. For some have truth on their lips, and not in their heart, as if one should deceitfully point out a road, knowing that there were robbers there, and should say, If you go this way, you will be safe from robbers, and it should turn out that in fact there were no robbers found there. He has spoken the truth, but not in his heart, for he supposed it to be otherwise, and spoke the truth in ignorance. Therefore it is not enough to speak the truth, unless it be so also in heart. Verse 3. Who hath practiced no deceit in his tongue? Deceit is practiced with the tongue when one thing is professed with the mouth, another concealed in the breast. Nor done evil to his neighbor. It is well known that by neighbor every man should be understood and hath not entertained slander against his neighbor, that is, hath not readily or rashly given credence to an accuser. Verse 4. The malicious one hath been brought to naught in his sight. This is perfection, that the malicious one have no force against a man, and that this be in his sight, that is, that he know most surely that the malicious is not, save when the mind turns itself away from the eternal and immutable form of her own creator to the form of the creature, which was made out of nothing. But those that fear the Lord he glorifieth. The Lord himself, that is. Now, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom as then the things above belong to the perfect, so what he is now going to say belongs to beginners. Who sweareth unto his neighbor, and deceiveth him not. Verse 5. Who hath not given his money upon usury, and hath not taken rewards against the innocent. These are no great things, but he who is not able to do even this, much less able is he to speak the truth in his heart, and to practice no deceit in his tongue. But as the truth is in the heart, so to profess and have it in his mouth, yea, yea, nay, nay, and to do no evil to his neighbor, that is, to any man, and to entertain no slander against his neighbor, all which are the virtues of the perfect, in whose sight the malicious one hath been brought to naught. Yet he concludes even these lesser things thus, Whoso doeth these things shall not be moved for ever. That is, he shall attain unto those greater things, wherein is great and unshaken stability. For even the very tenses are, perhaps not without cause, so varied, as that in the conclusion above the past tense should be used, but in this the future. For there it was said, The malicious one hath been brought to naught in his sight. But here shall not be moved for ever. End of Psalm 15Psalm 16 of Exposition on the Book of Psalms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Exposition on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine of Hippo, translated by Philip Schaff. Psalm 16. The Inscription of the Title of David Himself. Our King in this psalm speaks in the character of the human nature he assumed, of whom the royal title at the time of his passion was eminently set forth now he saith as follows verse one preserve me o lord for in thee have i hoped verse two i have said to the lord thou art my god for thou requirest not my goods for with my goods thou dost not look to be made blessed verse three to the saints who are on his earth to the saints who have placed their hope in the land of the living, the citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem, whose spiritual conversation is, by the anchor of hope, fixed in that country, which is rightly called God's earth, although as yet in this earth too they be conversant in the flesh. He hath wonderfully fulfilled all my wishes in them. To those saints, then, he hath wonderfully fulfilled all my wishes in their advancement, whereby they have perceived how both the humanity of my divinity hath profited them that I might die, and the divinity of the humanity that I might rise again. Verse 4. Their infirmities have been multiplied. Their infirmities have been multiplied not for their destruction, but that they might long for the physician. Afterwards they made haste. Accordingly, after infirmities multiplied, they made haste, that they might be healed. I will not gather together their assemblies by blood. For their assemblies shall not be carnal, nor will I gather them together as one propitiated by the blood of cattle nor will I be mindful of their names within my lips. But by a spiritual change, what they have been shall be forgotten, nor by me shall they be any more called either sinners or enemies or men, but righteous and my brethren and sons of God through my peace. Verse 5 the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. For together with me they shall possess the inheritance, the Lord himself. Let others choose for themselves portions, earthly and temporal, to enjoy. The portion of the saints is the Lord eternal. Let others drink of deadly pleasures. The portion of my cup is the Lord. In that I say, mine, I include the church, for where the head is, there is the body also. For into the inheritance will I gather together their assemblies, and by the inebriation of the cup I will forget their old names. Thou art he who will restore to me my inheritance, that to these two whom I free may be known the glory wherein I was with thee before the world was made. For thou wilt not restore to me that which I never lost, but thou wilt restore to these who have lost it the knowledge of that glory, in whom, because I am, thou wilt restore to me. Verse 6. The lines have fallen to me in glorious places. The boundaries of my possession have fallen in thy glory as it were by lot, like as God is the possession of the priest and Levites. For mine inheritance is glorious to me, for mine inheritance is glorious, not to all, but to them that see, in whom, because I am, it is to me. Verse 7 I will bless the Lord, who hath given me understanding, whereby this inheritance may be seen and possessed. 
yea moreover too even unto night my reins have chastened me yea besides understanding even unto death my inferior part the assumption of flesh hath instructed me that i might experience the darkness of mortality which that understanding hath not verse eight i foresaw the lord in my sight always but coming into things that pass away i remove not mine eye from him who abideth ever foreseeing this that to him i should return after passing through the things temporal for he is on my right hand that i should not be moved for he favoureth me that i should abide fixedly in him verse nine wherefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted wherefore both in my thoughts is gladness and in my words exultation moreover too my flesh shall rest in hope moreover too my flesh shall not fail unto destruction but shall sleep in hope of the resurrection verse ten for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell for thou wilt neither give my soul for a possession to those parts below neither wilt thou grant thine holy one to see corruption neither wilt thou suffer that sanctified body whereby others are to be also sanctified to see corruption verse eleven thou hast made known to me the paths of life thou hast made known through me the paths of humiliation that men might return to life from whence they fell through pride in whom because i am thou hast made known to me thou wilt fill me with joy with thy countenance thou wilt fill them with joy that they should see nothing further when they shall see thee face to face in whom because i am thou wilt fill me pleasure is at thy right hand even to the end pleasure is in thy favour and mercy in this life's journey leading on even to the end of the glory of thy countenance end of psalm sixteen Psalm 17 of Exposition on the Book of Psalms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Exposition on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine of Hippo. Translated by Philip Schaff. Psalm 17. A Prayer of David Himself this prayer must be assigned to the person of the lord with the addition of the church which is his body verse one hear my righteousness o god consider my supplication hearken unto my prayer not in deceitful lips not going forth to thee in deceitful lips verse two let my judgment from thy countenance go forth from the enlightening of the knowledge of thee let me judge truth or at least let my judgment go forth not in deceitful lips from thy countenance that is that i may not in judging utter aught else than i understand in thee let mine eyes see equity the eyes of course of the heart verse three thou hast proved and visited mine heart in the night season for this mine heart hath been proved by the visitation of tribulation thou hast examined me by fire and iniquity hath not been found in me now not night only in that it is wont to disturb but fire also in that it burns is this tribulation to be called whereby when i was examined i was found righteous that my mouth may not speak 
Verse 4. The Works of Men. That nothing may proceed out of my mouth, but what relates to thy glory and praise, not to the works of men, which they do beside thy will. Because of the words of thy lips. Because of the words of thy peace, or of thy prophets. I have kept hard ways. I have kept the toilsome ways of human mortality and suffering. Verse 5. To perfect my steps in thy paths. That the love of the church might be perfected in the straight ways, whereby she arrives at thy rest. That my footsteps be not moved. That the signs of my way which, like footsteps, have been imprinted on the sacraments and apostolical writings, be not moved, that they may mark them who would follow me, or, at least, that I may still abide fixedly in eternity, after that I have accomplished the hard ways, and have finished my steps in the straits of thy paths. Verse 6. I have cried out, for thou hast heard me, O God. With a free and strong effort have I directed my prayers unto thee, for that I might have this power, thou hast heard me when praying more weakly. Incline thine ear to me, and hear my words. Let not thy hearing forsake my humiliation. Verse 7. Make thy mercies marvelous. Let not thy mercies be disesteemed, lest they be loved too little. Who savest them that hope in thee from such as resist thy right hand? From such as resist the favor whereby thou favorest me. Verse 8. Keep me, O Lord, as the apple of thine eye. Which seems very little and minute, yet by it is the sight of the eye directed, whereby the light is distinguished from the darkness, as by Christ's humanity, the divinity of the judgment distinguishing between the righteous and sinners. In the covering of thy wings protect me. In the defense of thy love and mercy protect me. Verse 9 From the face of the ungodly who have troubled me, Mine enemies have compassed about my soul. Verse 10. They have shut up their own fat. They have been covered with their own gross joy. After that their desire hath been satiated with wickedness. Their mouth has spoken pride. And therefore their mouth spoke pride in saying, Hail, King of the Jews! and other like words. Verse 11. Casting me forth, they have now compassed me about. Casting me forth outside the city, they have now compassed me about on the cross. Their eyes they have determined to turn down on the earth. The beat of their heart they have determined to turn down on these earthly things, deeming him who was slain, to endure a mighty evil, and themselves that slew him, none. Verse 12. As a lion ready for prey, have they taken me. They have taken me, like that adversary, who walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, and as a lion's whelp dwelling in secret places. And as his whelp, the people to whom it was said, Ye are of your father the devil, meditating on the snares, whereby they might circumvent and destroy the just one. Verse 13 Arise, O Lord, prevent them and cast them down. Arise, O Lord, thou whom they suppose to be asleep, and regardless of men's iniquities. Be they blinded before by their own malice, that vengeance may prevent their deed, and so cast them down. Deliver my soul from the ungodly. 
deliver my soul by restoring me after the death which the ungodly have inflicted on me thy weapon verse fourteen from the enemies of thine hand for my soul is thy weapon which thy hand that is thy eternal power hath taken to subdue thereby the kingdoms of iniquity and divide the righteous from the ungodly this weapon then deliver from the enemies of thine hand that is of thy power that is from mine enemies destroy them o lord from off the earth scatter them in their life o lord destroy them from off the earth which they inhabit scatter them throughout the world in this life which only they think their life who despair of life eternal and by thy hidden things their belly hath been filled now not only this visible punishment shall overtake them but also their memory hath been filled with sins which as darkness are hidden from the light of thy truth that they should forget god they have been filled with swine's flesh they have been filled with uncleanness treading under foot the pearls of god's words and they have left the rest to their babes crying out this sin be upon us and upon our children verse fifteen but i shall appear in thy righteousness in thy sight but i who have not appeared to them that with their filthy and darkened heart cannot see the light of wisdom shall appear in thy righteousness in thy sight i shall be satiated when thy glory shall be manifested and when they have been satiated with their uncleanness that they could not know me i shall be satiated when thy glory shall be manifested in them that know me in that verse indeed where it is said filled with swine's flesh some copies have filled with children for from the ambiguity of the greek a double interpretation has resulted now by children we understand works and as by good children good works so by evil evil end of psalm seventeen psalm eighteen of exposition on the book of psalms this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org exposition on the book of psalms by st augustine of hippo translated by philip schaff psalm eighteen to the end for the servant of the lord david himself that is for the strong of hand christ in his manhood the words of this song which he spoke to the lord on the day when the lord delivered him out of the hands of his enemies and of the hand of saul and he said on the day when the lord delivered him out of the hands of his enemies and of the hand of saul namely the king of the jews whom they had demanded for themselves for as david is said to be by interpretation strong of hand so saul is said to be demanding now it is well known how that people demanded for themselves a king and received him for their king not according to the will of god but according to their own will christ then and the church that is whole christ the head and the body saith here verse one i will love thee o lord my strength i will love thee o lord by whom i am strong verse two o lord my stay and my refuge and my deliverer o lord who has stayed me because i sought refuge with thee and i sought refuge because thou hast delivered me my god is my helper and i will hope in him 
my god who hast first afforded me the help of thy call that i might be able to hope in thee my defender and the horn of my salvation and my redeemer my defender because i have not leant upon myself lifting up as it were the horn of pride against thee but have found thee a horn indeed that is the sure height of salvation and that i might find it thou redeemest me verse three with praise will i call upon the lord and i shall be safe from mine enemies seeking not my own but the lord's glory i will call upon him and there shall be no means whereby the errors of ungodliness can hurt me verse four the pains of death that is of the flesh have compassed me about and the overflowings of ungodliness have troubled me ungodly troubles stirred up for a time like torrents of rain which will soon subside have come on to trouble me verse five the pains of hell compassed me about among those that compassed me about to destroy me were pains of envy which work death and lead on to the hell of sin the snares of death prevented me they prevented me so that they wished to hurt me first which shall afterwards be recompensed unto them now they seize unto destruction such men as they have evilly persuaded by the boast of righteousness in the name but not in the reality of which they glory against the gentiles verse six and in mine oppression i called upon the lord and cried unto my god and he heard my voice from his holy temple he heard from my heart wherein he dwelleth my voice and my cry in his sight entered into his ears and my cry which i uttered not in the ears of men but inwardly before him himself entered into his ears verse seven and the earth was moved and trembled when the son of man was thus glorified sinners were moved and trembled and the foundations of the mountains were troubled and the hopes of the proud which were in this life were troubled and were moved for god was wroth with them that is that the hope of temporal goods might have now no more establishment in the hearts of men verse eight there went up smoke in his wrath the tearful supplication of penitents went up when they came to know god's threatenings against the ungodly and fire burneth from his face and the ardour of love after repentance burns by the knowledge of him coals were kindled from him they who were already dead abandoned by the fire of good desire and the light of righteousness and who remained in coldness and darkness re-enkindled and enlightened have come to life again verse nine and he bowed the heaven and came down and he humbled the just one that he might descend to men's infirmity and darkness under his feet and the ungodly who savour of things earthly in the darkness of their own malice knew not him for the earth under his feet is as it were his footstool verse ten and he mounted above the cherubim and did fly and he was exalted above the fullness of knowledge that no man should come to him but by love for love is the fulfilling of the law and full soon he showed to his lovers that he is incomprehensible lest they should suppose that he is comprehended by corporeal imaginations he flew above the wings of the winds but that swiftness whereby he showed himself to be incomprehensible is above the powers of souls 
whereon as upon wings they raised themselves from earthly fears into the air of liberty verse eleven and hath made darkness his hiding-place and hath settled the obscurity of the sacraments and the hidden hope and the heart of believers where he may lie hid and not abandon them in this darkness too wherein we yet walk by faith and not by sight as long as we hope for what we see not and with patience wait for it round about him is his tabernacle yet they that believe him turn to him and encircle him for that he is in the midst of them since he is equally the friend of all in whom as in a tabernacle he at this time dwells dark water in clouds of air nor let any one on this account if he understand the scripture imagine that he is already in that light which will be when we shall have come out of faith into sight for in the prophets and in all the preachers of the word of god there is obscure teaching verse twelve in respect of the brightness in his sight in comparison with the brightness which is in the sight of his manifestation his clouds have passed over the preachers of his word are not now bounded by the confines of judea but have passed over to the gentiles hail and coals of fire reproofs are figured whereby as by hail the hard hearts are bruised but if a cultivated and genial soil that is a godly mind receive them the hail's hardness dissolves into water that is the terror of the lightning charged and as it were frozen reproof dissolves into satisfying doctrine and hearts kindled by the fire of love revive all these things in his clouds have passed over to the gentiles verse thirteen and the lord hath thundered from heaven and in confidence of the gospel the lord hath sounded forth from the heart of the just one and the highest gave his voice that we might entertain it and in the depth of human things might hear things heavenly verse fourteen and he sent out his arrows and scattered them and he sent out evangelists traversing straight paths on the wings of strength not in their own power but his by whom they were sent and he scattered them to whom they were sent that to some of them they should be the savour of life unto life to others the savour of death unto death and he multiplied lightnings and troubled them and he multiplied miracles and troubled them verse fifteen and the fountains of water were seen and the fountains of water springing up into everlasting life which were made in the preachers were seen and the foundations of the round world were revealed and the prophets who were not understood and upon whom was to be built the world of believers in the lord were revealed at thy chiding o lord crying out the kingdom of god is come nigh unto you at the blasting of the breath of thy displeasure saying except ye repent ye shall all likewise perish verse sixteen he hath sent down from on high and hath fetched me by calling out of the gentiles for an inheritance a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle he hath taken me out of the multitude of waters he hath taken me out of the multitude of peoples verse seventeen he hath delivered me from my strongest enemies he hath delivered me from mine enemies who prevail to the afflicting and overturning of this temporal life of mine and from them which hate me for they are too strong for me 
as long as I am under them knowing not God. Verse 18. They have prevented me in the day of my affliction. They have first injured me in the time when I am bearing a mortal and toilsome body. And the Lord hath become my stay. And since the stay of earthly pleasure was disturbed and torn up by the bitterness of misery, the Lord hath become my stay. Verse 19 and hath brought me forth into a broad place. And since I was enduring the straits of the flesh, he brought me forth into the spiritual breadth of faith. He hath delivered me because he desired me. Before that I desired him, he delivered me from my most powerful enemies, who were envious of me when I once desired him, and from them that hated me, because I do desire him. Verse 20. And the Lord shall reward me according to my righteousness. And the Lord shall reward me according to the righteousness of my good will, who first showed mercy before that I had the good will. And according to the cleanness of my hands, he will recompense me and according to the cleanness of my deeds he will recompense me, who hath given me to do well by bringing me forth into the broad place of faith. Verse 21 Because I have kept the ways of the Lord, that the breadth of good works that are by faith and the long suffering of perseverance should follow after nor have I walked impiously apart from my God. Verse 22 For all his judgments are in my sight. For with persevering contemplation I weigh all his judgments, that is, the rewards of the righteous, and the punishments of the ungodly, and the scourges of such as are to be chastened, and the trials of such as are to be proved and I have not cast out his righteousness from me, as they do that faint under their burden of them, and return to their own vomit. Verse 23 And I shall be undefiled with him, and I shall keep myself from mine iniquity. Verse 24 And the Lord shall reward me according to my righteousness accordingly not only for the breadth of faith which worketh by love but also for the length of perseverance will the lord reward me according to my righteousness and according to the cleanness of my hands in the sight of his eyes not as men see but in the sight of his eyes for the things that are seen are temporal but the things that are not seen are eternal, whereto the height of hope appertains. Verse 25 With the holy thou shalt be holy. There is a hidden depth also, wherein thou art known to be holy with the holy, for that thou makest holy. And with the harmless thou shalt be harmless. For thou harmest no man, but each one is bound by the bands of his own sins. Verse 26 And with the chosen thou shalt be chosen. And by him whom thou choosest thou art chosen. And with the froward thou shalt be froward. And with the froward thou seemest froward, for they say, the way of the Lord is not right, and their way is not right. Verse 27 For thou wilt make whole the humble people. Now this seems forward to the forward, that thou wilt make them whole that confess their sins. And thou wilt humble the eyes of the proud. But them that are ignorant of God's righteousness, and seek to establish their own, thou wilt humble. Verse 28 For thou wilt light my candle, O Lord. For our light is not from ourselves, but thou wilt light my candle, O Lord. 
O my God, Thou wilt enlighten my darkness. For we through our sins are darkness, but Thou, O my God, wilt enlighten my darkness. Verse 29 For by Thee shall I be delivered from temptation. For not by myself, but by Thee, shall I be delivered from temptation. And in my God shall I leap over the wall. And not in myself, but in my God, shall I leap over the wall, which sin has raised between men and the heavenly Jerusalem. Verse 30 My God, his way is undefiled. My God cometh not unto men, except they shall have purified the way of faith, whereby he may come to them, for that his way is undefiled. The words of the Lord have been proved by fire. The words of the Lord are tried by the fire of tribulation. He is the protector of them that hope in him. And all that hope not in themselves, but in him, are not consumed by that same tribulation. For hope followeth faith. Verse 31 For who is God but the Lord, whom we serve? And who God but our God? And who is God but the Lord, whom after good service we sons shall possess as the hoped-for inheritance? Verse 32 God, who hath girded me with strength, God, who hath girded me that I might be strong, lest the loosely flowing folds of desire hinder my deeds and steps, and hath made my way undefiled, and hath made the way of love, whereby I may come to him, undefiled, as the way of faith is undefiled, whereby he comes to me. Verse 33 who hath made my feet perfect like heart's feet, who hath made my love perfect to surmount the thorny and dark entanglements of this world, and will set me up on high, and will fix my aim on the heavenly habitation, that I may be filled with all the fullness of God. Verse 34 Who teacheth my hands for battle, who teacheth me to work for the overthrow of mine enemies, who strive to shut the kingdom of heaven against us. And thou hast made mine arms as a bow of steel, and thou hast made my earnest striving after good works unwearied. Verse 35 And thou hast given me the defense of my salvation, and thy right hand hath held me up and the favor of thy grace hath held me up, and thy discipline hath directed me to the end, and thy correction, not suffering me to wander from the way, hath directed me that whatsoever I do, I refer to that end, whereby I may cleave to thee. And this thy discipline it shall teach me and that same correction of thine shall teach me to attain to that whereunto it hath directed me. Verse 36 Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, nor shall the straits of the flesh hinder me, for thou hast enlarged my love, working in gladness even with these mortal things and members which are under me and my footsteps have not been weakened. And either my goings, or the marks which I have imprinted for the imitation of those that follow, have not been weakened. Verse 37 I will follow up mine enemies, and seize them. I will follow up my carnal affections, and will not be seized by them, but will seize them, so that they may be consumed and I will not turn till they fail. And from this purpose I will not turn myself to rest, till they fail who make a tumult about me. Verse 38 I will break them, and they shall not be able to stand. 
and they shall not hold out against me. They shall fall under my feet. When they are cast down, I will place before me the loves whereby I walk for evermore. Verse 39 And thou hast girded me with strength to the war. And the loose desires of my flesh hast thou bound up with strength, that in such a fight I may not be encumbered. Thou hast supplanted under me them that rose up against me. Thou hast caused them to be deceived, who followed upon me, that they should be brought under me, who desired to be over me. Verse 40 And thou hast given mine enemies the back to me. And thou hast turned mine enemies, and hast made them to be a back to me, that is, to follow me. And thou hast destroyed them that hate me. But such other of them, as have persisted in hatred, thou hast destroyed. Verse 41 They have cried out, and there was none to save them. For who can save them, whom thou wouldest not save? to the Lord, and he did not hear them. Nor did they cry out to any chance one, but to the Lord, and he did not judge them worthy of being heard, who depart not from their wickedness. Verse 42 And I will beat them as small as dust before the face of the wind. And I will beat them small, for dry they are, receiving not the shower of God's mercy that, borne aloft and puffed up with pride, they may be hurried along from firm and unshaken hope, and, as it were, from the earth's solidity and stability. As the clay of the streets I will destroy them. In their wanton and loose course, along the broad ways of perdition, which many walk, will I destroy them. Verse 43 Thou wilt deliver me from the contradictions of the people. Thou wilt deliver me from the contradictions of them who said, If we send him away, all the world will go after him. Thou shalt make me the head of the Gentiles, a people whom I have not known have served me. The people of the Gentiles, whom in bodily presence I have not visited, have served me. Verse 44. At the hearing of the ear they have obeyed me. They have not seen me with the eye, but receiving my preachers, at the hearing of the ear they have obeyed me. The strange children have lied unto me. Children not to be called mine, but rather strange children, to whom it is rightly said, Ye are of your father the devil have lied unto me. Verse 45. The strange children have waxen old. The strange children, to whom for their renovation I brought the New Testament, have remained in the old man. And they have halted from their own paths. And like those that are weak in one foot, for holding the old they have rejected the New Testament, they have become halt, even in this old law, rather following their own traditions than God's. For they brought frivolous charges of unwashen hands, because such were the paths, which themselves had made and worn by long use, in wandering from the ways of God's commands. Verse 46 The Lord liveth, and blessed be my God. But to be carnally minded is death, for the Lord liveth, and blessed be my God. And let the God of my salvation be exalted. And let me not think after an earthly fashion of the God of my salvation, nor look from him for this earthly salvation, but that on high. Verse 47 O God, who givest me vengeance, and subduest the people under me, O God, who avengest me by subduing the people under me. My deliverer from my angry enemies. The Jews crying out, Crucify him, crucify him. 
Verse 48 From them that rise up against me, thou wilt exalt me. From the Jews that rise up against me in my passion, thou wilt exalt me in my resurrection. From the unjust man thou wilt deliver me. From their unjust rule thou wilt deliver me. Verse 49 For this cause will I confess to thee among the Gentiles, O Lord. For this cause shall the Gentiles confess to thee through me, O Lord and I will sing unto thy name, and thou shalt be more widely known by my good deeds. Verse 50 Magnifying the salvation of his king God, who magnifieth, so as to make wonderful the salvation which his Son giveth to believers, and showing mercy to his Christ God, who showeth mercy to his Christ to David and to his seed for evermore, to the Deliverer himself strong of hand, who hath overcome this world, and to them whom, as believers in the gospel, he hath begotten for evermore. What things soever are spoken in this psalm which cannot apply to the Lord himself personally, that is, to the head of the church, must be referred to the church, for whole Christ speaks here, in whom are all his members. End of Psalm 18Psalm 19 of Exposition on the Book of Psalms This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Exposition of the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine of Hippo Translated by Philip Schaff Psalm 19 First Exposition To the End A Psalm of David Himself It is a well-known title, nor does the Lord Jesus Christ say what follows, but it is said of him. Verse 1 The heavens tell out the glory of God, the righteous evangelist in whom, as in the heavens, God dwelleth, set forth the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, or the glory wherewith the Son glorified the Father upon earth. And the firmament sheweth forth the works of his hands, and the firmament sheweth forth the deeds of the Lord's power, that now made heaven by the assurance of the Holy Ghost, which before was earth by fear. Verse 2 Day unto day uttereth word, to the spiritual, the Spirit giveth out the fullness of the unchangeable wisdom of God, the Word which in the beginning is God, with God, and night unto night announceth knowledge, and to the fleshly, as to those afar off, the mortality of the flesh, by conveying faith, announceth future knowledge. Verse 3. There is no speech nor language in which their voices are not heard in which the voices of the evangelists have not been heard, seeing that the gospel was preached in every tongue. Verse 4. Their sound is gone out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In the sun hath he set his tabernacle. Now that he might war against the powers of temporal error, the Lord being about to send not peace, but a sword on earth in time, or in manifestation, set so to say his military dwelling, that is, the dispensation of his incarnation. Verse 5. And he, as a bridegroom coming forth out of his chamber, and he, coming forth out of the virgin's womb, where God was united to man's nature as a bridegroom to a bride, rejoiced as a giant to run his way, rejoiced as one exceeding strong, and surpassing all other men in power incomparable, not to inhabit, but to run his way, for he stood not in the way of sinners. Verse 6. His going forth is from the highest heaven. From the Father is his going forth, not that in time, but from everlasting, whereby he was born of the Father, and his meeting is even to the height of heaven. And in the fullness of the Godhead he meets even to an equality with the Father. 
and there is none that may hide himself from his heat. But whereas the word was even made flesh and dwelt in us, assuming our mortality, he permitted no man to excuse himself from the shadow of death, for the heat of the word penetrated even it. Verse 7. The law of the Lord is undefiled, converting souls. The law of the Lord, therefore, is himself who came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it, an undefiled law, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, not oppressing souls with the yoke of bondage, but converting them to imitate him in liberty. The testimony of the Lord is sure, giving wisdom to babes. The testimony of the Lord is sure, for no man knoweth the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Which things have been hidden from the wise and revealed to babes, for God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. All the statutes of the Lord are right in him, who taught not what he did not, that they who should imitate him might rejoice in heart, in those things which they should do freely with love, not slavishly with fear. The commandment of the Lord is lucid, enlightening the eyes. The commandment of the Lord is lucid, with no veil of carnal observances enlightening the sight of the inner man. Verse 9. The fear of the Lord is chaste, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord, not that distressing fear under the law, dreading exceedingly the withdrawal of temporal goods, by the love of which the soul commits fornication, but that chaste fear wherewith the church the more ardently she loves her spouse, the more carefully does she take heed of offending him, and therefore perfect love casteth not out this fear, but it endureth forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, justified together. The judgments of him who judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, are justified in truth unchangeably. For neither in his threatenings or his promises doth God deceive any man, nor can any withdraw either from the ungodly his punishment or from the godly his reward. Verse 10. To be desired more than gold and much precious stone, whether it be gold and stone itself much or much precious or much to be desired, still the judgments of God are to be desired more than the pomp of this world by desire of which it is brought to pass that the judgments of God are not desired, but feared, or despised, or not believed. But if any be himself gold and precious stone, that he may not be consumed by fire, but received into the treasury of God, more than himself does he desire the judgments of God, whose will he preferreth to his own, and sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. And whether one be even now honey, who, disenthralled already from the chains of this life, is awaiting the day when he may come up to God's feast, or whether he be yet as the honeycomb wrapped about with this life as it were with wax, not mixed and become one with it, but filling it, needing some pressure of God's hand, not oppressing but expressing it, whereby from life temporal it may be strained out into life eternal, to such a one the judgments of God are sweeter than he himself is to himself, for that they are sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Verse 11. For thy servant keepeth them. For to him who keepeth them not the day of the Lord is bitter. In keeping them there is great reward, not in any external benefit, but in the thing itself, that God's judgments are kept, is their great reward great because one rejoiceth therein. Verse 12. Who understandeth sins? But what sort of sweetness can there be in sins, where there is no understanding? For who can understand sins, which close the very eye, to which truth is pleasant, to which the judgments of God are desirable and sweet? Yea, as darkness closes the eye, so do sins the mind and suffer it not to see either the light or itself. Cleanse me, O Lord, from my secret faults, from the lusts which lie hid in me. Cleanse me, O Lord. Verse 13. And from the faults of others preserve thy servant. Let me not be led astray by others, 
for he is not a prey to the faults of others who is cleansed from his own. Preserve therefore from the lusts of others, not the proud man and him who would be his own master, but thy servant. If they get not the dominion over me, then shall I be undefiled. If neither my own secret sins nor those of others get the dominion over me, then shall I be undefiled. For there is no third source of sin but one's own secret sin by which the devil fell and another sin by which man is seduced, so as by consenting to make it his own. And I shall be cleansed from the great offense. What but pride! For there is none greater than apostasy from God, which is the beginning of the pride of man. And he shall indeed be undefiled, who is free from this offense also. For this is the last to them who are returning to God, which was the first as they departed from him. Verse 14. And the words of my mouth shall be pleasing, and the meditation of my heart is always in thy sight. The meditation of my heart is not after the vain glory of pleasing men, for now there is pride no more, but in thy sight alway who regardest a pure conscience. O Lord, my helper and my redeemer, O Lord, my helper and my approach to thee, for thou art my redeemer, that I might set out unto thee, lest any attributing to his own wisdom his conversion to thee, or to his own strength his attaining to thee should be rather driven back by thee, who resistest the proud, for he is not cleansed from the great offense, nor pleasing in thy sight, who redeemest us that we may be converted, and helpest us that we may attain unto thee. Second Exposition As we have entreated the Lord to cleanse us from our own secret faults, and preserve his servants from those of others, we ought to understand the meaning of this, that we may sing with man's intelligence, and not, as it were, with the voice of birds. For blackbirds, and parrots, and ravens, and magpies, and such like birds, are often taught by men to utter they know not what. But to sing with understanding has been granted by the divine will to humankind. And how many bad and dissipated men thus sing what is worthy of their ears and hearts, we well know and we deplore. For they are so much the worse as they cannot be ignorant of what they sing, for they know that their songs are impure, and yet the greater the impurity, the greater their readiness to sing. For they think themselves the more joyous in proportion as they are more unclean. But we who, in the church, have learnt to sing the oracles of God, should at the same time be in stand to be that which is written. Blessed is the people that understand the joyful sound. Therefore, dearest brethren, what we have sung with a cordant voice, we ought also with an undisturbed heart to know and understand. For each one of us has in this canticle prayed unto the Lord and said unto God, Cleanse thou me, from my secret faults, and preserve thy servant from those of others. If they shall not get the dominion over me, then shall I be undefiled and cleansed from the great offense? Now that we may well understand what this is, and the nature of it, let us, as the Lord shall help us, shortly run over the contents of this psalm. For the canticle is of Christ, as evidently appears from that passage where it is written, he as a bridegroom coming forth out of his chamber. For who is the bridegroom but he to whom has been betrothed by the apostle, that virgin, for whom the chaste friend of the bridegroom chastely fears, lest as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so this virgin's mind, the bride of Christ, should be corrupted from the chastity that is in Christ. In this our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ therefore abundant and full grace, resides, of which the Apostle John saith, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 1. This glory the heavens declare. The heavens are saints, raised up from the earth, bearing the Lord. 
Although the visible heaven also, in some sort, hath declared the glory of Christ, when? When, at the same Lord's nativity, a new star, which had never before been seen, appeared, but nevertheless, these are truer and higher heavens, of which it is said in the following verses of the psalm, There is no speech nor language in which their voices are not heard, their sound is gone out into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Whose words but the heavens? Whose then but the apostles? It is they declare unto us the glory of God, residing in Jesus Christ through grace for the remission of sins. For all have sinned and want the glory of God, being justified gratuitously by his blood, because gratuitously, therefore, grace. For grace is no grace if it be not gratuitous. Because we had before done no good thing, whereby we might deserve such gifts, rather, in that punishment was, not for nothing, to be inflicted, therefore was the boon for nothing accorded. Nothing had gone before in our deserts but what would entitle us to condemnation. But he, not for our righteousness, but of his own mercy, hath saved us by the laver of regeneration." This, I say, is the glory of God. This have the heavens declared. This, I say, is God's glory, not thine. For no good hast thou done, and yet so great good hast thou received. If, therefore, thou attainest unto the glory which the heavens have declared, say unto the Lord thy God, My God, his mercy shall prevent me. For it hath prevented thee, of course it hath prevented thee, for that it found no good in thee. Thou preventedest his punishment by thy pride. He prevented thy punishment by effacing thy sins. For as of a sinner justified, of ungodly made godly, of one condemned, received into the kingdom, say thou unto the Lord thy God, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give the glory. Say we not unto us, for unto whom, if as unto us, say we, I repeat, not unto us. For if he were so to deal with us, he could only inflict punishment upon us. Not unto us, but unto his own name, let him give the glory, because he hath not dealt with us according to our iniquities. Not therefore unto us, O Lord, not unto us. The repetition is confirmation, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give the glory. This those heavens knew, which declared the glory of God. And the firmament sheweth the works of his hands. What was before said, the glory of God, is here repeated, the works of his hands. What are the works of his hands? It is not, as some think, that God made all things by the word, and man, as more excellent than all other things, he made by his own hands. We must not think this. This is a weak and inexact notion, for he made all things by the word. For although diverse works of God are mentioned, among which he made man after his own image, yet all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. But as respects the hands of God, it is said of the heavens too, and the heavens are the works of thy hands, and that you might not suppose that saints are in the place called heavens, he added, they shall perish, but thou abidest. Therefore, not man only, but the heavens also, that shall perish, did God make with his hands, to whom it is said, the heavens are the work of thy hands. And of the earth is this selfsame said, for the sea is his, and he made it, and his hands laid the foundations of dry land. Therefore, if he made the heavens with his hands, and the earth with his hands, he made not man alone with his hands. And if by the word he made the heavens, and by the word the earth, therefore by the word man too. What by the word that by the hand, what by the hand that by the word. For the stature of God is not marked out by human members, who is holy everywhere and is nowhere contained. What therefore he made by the word, 
he made by the wisdom, and what he made by the hand, he did by the power. Now Christ is the power of God, and the wisdom of God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. The heavens have declared, do declare, will declare, the glory of God. The heavens, I say, that is, the saints will declare the glory of God, raised aloft from earth, bearing God, thundering with precepts, lightning with wisdom, will declare that glory of God, as I said, whereby we that are saved are unworthy of it. This unworthiness, that is, wherein we were unworthy, the younger son acknowledges when straightened by want. This unworthiness, I say, the younger son acknowledges, far from his father's home, a worshipper of demons, as it were a feeder of swine. He acknowledges the glory of God, but when straightened by want, and since by that glory of God we have been made what we were not worthy of, he says to his father, I am not worthy to be called thy son. Unhappy, he obtains happiness by his lowliness and shews himself worthy in the confession of his unworthiness. This glory of God the heavens declare, and the firmament sheweth the works of his hands. The heavens, the firmament, are a firm heart, a fearless heart. For these things are shewn among the ungodly, among the enemies of God, among the lovers of the world, and the persecutors of the righteous. In the midst of a violent world are these things shewn. But what could the violence of the world effect when the firmament shewn these things? The firmament sheweth, what? The works of his hands. What are the works of his hands? The glory of God, whereby we are saved, whereby we are created in good works. For we are his work, created in Christ Jesus in good works. For he not only made us men, but righteous men too, if so we be, and not we ourselves. Verse 2. Day unto day uttereth a word, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. What is this? Perhaps it is plain and evident what day unto day uttereth the word is, evident and plain as if by day. But what night unto night sheweth knowledge is, is obscure as if by night. Day unto day, saints unto saints, apostles unto believers, Christ himself unto apostles, to whom he said, Ye are the light of the world. This seems plain and easy of apprehension. But how doth night unto night shew knowledge? Some have understood these words simply, and perhaps it may be so, considering the meaning of this sentence to be that what the apostles heard in the Lord Jesus Christ's time during his converse on earth, this has been passed on to posterity as from time to time, day unto day, night unto night, the former day unto the latter day, the former night unto the latter night for that this doctrine is preached day and night. Let this simple interpretation suffice him whom it will suffice. But some words in scripture have from their obscurity this advantage, that they give birth to many interpretations. Accordingly, had this been plain, you would have heard some one thing, but as it is obscurely spoken, you will hear many. There is too another interpretation, day unto day, night unto night, that is, spirit unto spirit, flesh unto flesh. There is another, day unto day, spiritual unto spiritual, night unto night, carnal unto carnal. For both hear, though both do not equally understand. For the one hear it as a word uttered, the other as knowledge declared. For what is uttered is uttered to those present, but what is declared is declared to those that are far removed. More senses of the word heavens may be discovered, but because of the stress of the present time, a limit must be imposed. Yet let us mention one more meaning, which certain have, as if by conjecture, open. When they say, the Lord Christ talked with the apostles, day unto day uttered a word. When Judas betrayed the Lord Christ to the Jews, night unto night declared knowledge. Verse 3. There is no speech nor language in which their voices are not heard. Whose but of those heavens which declare the glory of God? 
There is no speech nor language in which their voices are not heard. Read the Acts of the Apostles, how, when the Holy Ghost came upon them, they were all filled with him and spake in the tongues of all nations as the Spirit gave them utterance. Lo, there is no speech nor language in which their voices are not heard, but not there only where they were filled was the sound. Verse 4. Their sound went forth into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. And therefore are we even speaking here. For that sound hath come even unto us, the sound which went forth into all the earth, and the heretic cometh not into the church. For this cause hath the sound gone forth into all the earth, that thou mayest enter into heaven. O man, full of mischief and strife, most evil and still liking to err, O haughty son, hear thy father's will. Lo, what can be more plain, what more evident? Their sound went forth into all the earth, and their words into the ends of the world. Needs it any interpreter? Why strivest thou against thyself? Wouldst thou hold a part in dissent? Who canst hold the whole in concord? In the sun hath he set his tabernacle, his church, that is, in open sight, not in secret, not that it should lie hid, not veiled as it were, lest haply as veiled it should light upon the flocks of the heretics. It is said again to one in holy scripture, For thou didst this secretly, thou shalt suffer in the sun, that is, thou didst the evil in secret, thou shalt suffer the punishment in the open sight of all men. In the sun, therefore, hath he set his tabernacle. Why, O heretic, fliest into darkness? Art thou a Christian? Hear Christ. Art thou a servant? Hear thy Lord. Art thou a son? Hear thy father. Amend thyself. Return to life again. Let us say of thee too, he was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Say not to me, why dost thou seek me if I am lost? For therefore do I seek thee, because thou art lost. Do not seek me, says he. This is indeed the wish of ungodliness, whereby we are divided, but not of charity, whereby we are brethren. I should not be extravagant if I were to seek my servant, and am I called extravagant because I seek my brother? Be this his conceit, in whom brotherly love exists not, yet will I seek my brother. Let him be even angry, so he be still sought, who is appeased when he is found. I will seek, I say, my brother, and appeal to my Lord, not against him, but for him. Nor in my appeal will I say, Lord, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me, but speak to my brother, that he hold the inheritance with me. Why then errest thou, brother? Why fly by the corners? Why try to lie hid? He has set his tabernacle in the sun. Verse 5. And as a bridegroom coming forth out of his chamber, I suppose that thou mayst recognize him. As a bridegroom coming forth out of his chamber, he rejoiced as a giant to run his course. He hath set his tabernacle in the sun. That is, as a bridegroom, when the word was made flesh, he found a bridal chamber in the virgin's womb, and thence coming out as from a closet of surpassing purity, joined to the nature of man, humble in his mercy below all, strong in his majesty above all. For this is, he rejoiced as a giant to run his course. He was born, grew up, taught, suffered, rose again, ascended, he ran his course, he halted not therein. This self-same bridegroom then, who did all this, he set in the sun, that is, in the open sight of all men, his tabernacle, that is, his holy church. Now wouldst thou hear what course he swiftly ran? Verse 6. His going forth is from the highest heaven, and his meeting even to the height thereof. But after that he went forth thence, and returned on his backward course, he sent his spirit. There appeared to them, upon whom he came, cloven tongues as a fire, as fire the Holy Ghost came to burn the hay of flesh, to smelt and refine the gold, as fire he came, and therefore it follows, and there is none 
that can hide from the heat thereof. Verse 7. The law of the Lord is undefiled, converting souls. This is the Holy Ghost. The testimony of the Lord is sure, giving wisdom to babes, not to the proud. This is the Holy Ghost. Verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, not terrifying, but rejoicing the heart. This is the Holy Ghost. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes, not dulling them, the eyes not of the flesh, but of the heart, not of the outer, but of the inner man. This is the Holy Ghost. Verse 9. The fear of the Lord, not a slavish fear, but chaste, loving freely, not fearing to be punished by him at whom it is alarmed, but to be separated from him whom it loves. This is chaste fear, not which perfect love casteth out, but enduring forever. This is the Holy Ghost, that is, this fear the Holy Ghost giveth, bringeth, implanteth, the judgments of the Lord are true, justified together, not for the contentions of division, but for the gathering together of unity. For this is together. This is the Holy Ghost. Therefore he made them, upon whom he first descended, speak in the tongues of all nations, because he announced that he would gather together the tongues of all nations into unity. What one man did then on receiving the Holy Ghost, that one should speak in the tongues of all nations, this unity itself now doth. She speaketh in all tongues. And now one man speaketh in all nations, in all tongues, one man, the head and the body, one man, Christ and the church, perfect man together, the bridegroom and the bride. But they too saith, he shall be one flesh. The judgments of the Lord are true, justified together because of unity. Verse 10, to be desired more than gold and much precious stone, either much gold or much precious or much to be desired, much any way, with the heretic little. They do not love together with us, yet with us they confess Christ. The same Christ whom with me thou doth confess, him love with me. And he who willeth not together, refuses, resists, rejects. With him there is not this desirableness more than gold and much precious stone. Listen again, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. But this is all against the wanderer. Honey is bitter to the one in a fever, but notwithstanding sweet and acceptable to one restored in health, for to sound health it is dear. To be desired more than gold and much precious stone, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Verse 11. For thy servant also keepeth him. How sweet they are, thy servant proves by keeping them, not by talking. Thy servant keepeth them, for that they are both at present sweet and healthful for time to come, for in keeping them there is great reward. But enamored of his strife, the heretic neither sees this brilliancy nor tastes the sweetness. Verse 12. For who understandeth sins? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Therefore saith he, He is a servant, who keepeth the sweetness, the pleasantness of charity, the love of unity. I, he says, myself who keep it, entreat thee, for who understandeth sins? Lest some steal over me, man as I am, and by some, as a man, I be first entangled. Cleanse me, O Lord, from my secret sins. This, then, we have sung. See to this I have come in my discourse. Let us say and sing with understanding, and pray in our song, and by our prayer obtain our petition, let us say, Cleanse me, O Lord, from my secret sins, for who understandeth sins? If darkness is seen, sins are understood. In fact, when we repent of sin, we are in the light. For whilst one is entangled in a sin, with eyes as it were darkened and closed, he sees not the sin. For so, if the eye of thy body be covered, thou canst neither see aught else, nor that by which it is covered. Therefore say we to God, Who can see 
what he will purify? Who can have an eye on what he will heal? Say we to him, cleanse me, O Lord, for my secret sins. Verse 13, and preserve thy servant from those of others. My own sins, he says, pollute me. The sins of others afflict me. From the one cleanse me, from the other preserve me. Take away from my heart, I pray, the evil thought. Keep back from me the evil counselor, that is, cleanse me from my secret sins and preserve thy servant from those of others. For these two kinds of faults, both our own and those of others, appeared even from the very first in the beginning. The devil fell by his own sin, and he degraded Adam by another sin. The same servant of God who keepeth the judgments of God, in which there is great reward, in another psalm too prays thus, Let not the foot of pride come unto me, and let not the hand of the wicked move me. Let not the foot of pride come unto me, that is, cleanse me, O Lord, from my secret sins, and let not the hand of the wicked move me, that is, preserve thy servant from the sins of others. If they get not the dominion over me, then I shall be undefiled. If they get not the dominion over me, mine own secret sins and the sins of others, then shall I be undefiled. This is no daring reliance on his own strength, but he entreats the Lord to fulfill it, to whom it is said in another psalm, Order my ways according to thy word, and let no iniquity have dominion over me. If thou art a Christian, fear not the dominion of any man without. The Lord thy God fear alway. Fear the evil in thyself, that is, thy lust, not what God made in thee, but what thou hast made for thine own self. The Lord made thee a good servant. Thou hast created in thine own heart an evil Lord for thine own self. Justly wilt thou be subjected to iniquity. Justly wilt thou be subject to the Lord, whom thou hast made for thine own self, since thou wouldest not be subject to him who made thee. But if, he says, they get not the dominion over me, then shall I be undefiled and cleansed from the great offense? What offense do we suppose? What is that great offense? Perchance it is other than that I am about to mention, yet I will not conceal what I think. I deem the great offense to be pride. This perhaps is in another way intimated in that he saith, and I shall be cleansed from the great offense. Do you inquire how great that offense is, which cast down an angel, which of an angel made a devil, and for ever closed the kingdom of heaven against him? This is the great offense, and the head and cause of all offenses. For it is written, The beginning of all sin is pride, and that thou mightest not disregard it as any light matter, he says, the beginning of pride in man is to depart from God. No light evil, my brethren, is this vice. Christian humility is displeasing to this vice in those persons which you see to be of high degree. By reason of this vice, men disdain to submit their necks to the yoke of Christ, being more straightly fastened to the yoke of sin. For no release from serving will be theirs. For they do not like to serve, but to serve is expedient for them. By misliking to serve they gain nothing, but that they serve not a good lord, not that they do not serve at all. Since whoever will not be the servant of love, he must needs be the servant of iniquity. From this vice, which is the head of all vices, for that all other vices spring from thence, is produced a departing from God, whilst the soul goes into darkness and makes an evil use of its free will, with all other sins too in its train, so that a man squanders all his substance by prodigal living with harlots, and through want becomes a feeder of swine, who was the associate of angels. On account of this vice, on account of this great sin of pride, God came in humility. This cause, this great sin, this mighty disease of souls, brought down the almighty physician from heaven, humbled him even to the form of a servant, exposed him to despiteful treatment, hung him on a tree, 
that by saving strength of so great medicine, this swelling might be cured. Let man now at length blush to be proud, for whose sake God hath become humble. So, saith he, shall I be cleansed from the great offense, because God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble? Verse 14. And hereby shall the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in thy sight alway. For if I be not cleansed from this great offense, my words will be pleasing in the sight of men, not in thy sight. The proud soul would be pleasing in the sight of men. The humble soul would be pleasing in secret where God seeth, so that if she shall please men with any good work, she would congratulate them whom the good work pleases, not herself, to whom it ought to be enough that she hath done a good work. Our glory, saith the Apostle, is this testimony of our conscience, and therefore let us also say what follows, O Lord, my helper and my redeemer, helper in good, redeemer from evil, helper that I may dwell in thy love, redeemer that thou mayest deliver me from mine iniquity. End of Psalm 19Psalm 20 of Exposition on the Book of Psalms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Exposition on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine of Hippo. Translated by Philip Schaff. Psalm 20. To the end, a Psalm of David. This is a well-known title, and it is not Christ who speaks, but the prophet speaks to Christ under the form of wishing foretelling things to come. Verse 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The Lord hear thee in the day in which thou saidest, Father, glorify thy Son, the name of the God of Jacob, protect thee. For to thee belongeth the younger people, since the elder shall serve the younger. Verse 2. Send thee help from the holy, and from Sion defend thee, making for thee a sanctified body, the church, from watching safe, which waiteth when thou shalt come from the wedding. Verse 3. Be mindful of all thy sacrifice. Make us mindful of all thy injuries and despiteful treatment, which thou hast borne for us, and be thy whole burnt offering made fat and turn the cross whereon thou wast wholly offered up to God into the joy of the resurrection. Diapsalma, verse 4, The Lord render to thee according to thine heart. The Lord render to thee not according to their heart, who thought by persecution they could destroy thee, but according to thine heart, wherein thou knewest what profit thy passion would have and fulfill all thy counsel, and fulfill all thy counsel, not only that whereby thou didst lay down thy life for thy friends, that the corrupted grain might rise again to more abundance, but that also whereby blindness in part hath happened unto Israel, that the fullness of the Gentiles might enter in, and so all Israel might be saved. Verse 5. We will exalt in thy salvation. We will exalt in that death will in no wise hurt thee, for so thou wilt also shew that it cannot hurt us either. And in the name of the Lord our God will we be magnified. And the confession of thy name shall not only not destroy us, but shall even magnify us. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. The Lord fulfill not only the petitions which thou madest on earth, but those also whereby thou intercedest for us in heaven. Verse 6. Now have I known that the Lord hath saved his Christ. Now hath it been shewn to me in prophecy that the Lord will raise up his Christ again. He will hear him from his holy heaven. He will hear him not from earth only, where he prayed to be glorified, but from heaven also, 
where interceding for us at the right hand of the Father, he hath from thence shed abroad the Holy Spirit on them that believe on him. In strength is the safety of his right hand. Our strength is in the safety of his favor, when even out of tribulation he giveth help, that when we are weak, then we may be strong. For vain is the safety of man, which comes not of his right hand, but of his left. For thereby are they lifted up to great pride, whosoever in their sins have secured a temporal safety. Verse 7. Some in chariots and some in horses. Some are drawn away by the ever-moving succession of temporal goods, and some are preferred to proud honors and in them exalt. But we will exalt in the name of the Lord our God. But we, fixing our hope on things eternal, and not seeking our own glory, will exalt in the name of the Lord our God. Verse 8. They have been bound and fallen. And therefore were they bound by the lust of temporal things, fearing to spare the Lord, lest they should lose their place by the Romans, and rushing violently on the stone of offense and rock of stumbling, they fell from the heavenly hope, to whom the blindness in part of Israel hath happened, being ignorant of God's righteousness and wishing to establish their own. But we are risen and stand upright, but we, that the Gentile people might enter in, out of the stones raised up as children to Abraham, who followed not after righteousness, have attained to it, and are risen, and not by their own strength, but being justified by faith, we stand upright. Verse 9. O Lord, save the king, that he who in his passion hath shewn us an example of conflict should also offer up our sacrifices, the priest raised from the dead and established in heaven. And hear us in the day when we shall call on thee. And as he now offereth for us, hear us in the day when we shall call on thee. End of Psalm 20Psalm 21 of Exposition on the Book of Psalms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Exposition on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine of Hippo. Translated by Philip Schaff. Psalm 21. To the end, a psalm of David himself. The title is a familiar one. The psalm is of Christ. Verse 1. O Lord, the king shall rejoice in thy strength. O Lord, in thy strength, whereby the word was made flesh, the man, Christ Jesus, shall rejoice, and shall exult exceedingly in thy salvation, and in that, whereby thou quickenest all things, shall exult exceedingly. Verse 2. Thou hast given him the desire of his soul. He desired to eat the Passover, and to lay down his life when he would, and again when he would to take it, and thou hast given it to him, and hast not deprived him of the good pleasure of his lips. My peace, saith he, I leave with you, and it was done. Verse 3. For thou hast presented him with the blessings of sweetness, because he had first quaffed the blessing of thy sweetness, the gall of our sins did not hurt him. Diapsalma. Thou hast set a crown of precious stone on his head. At the beginning of his discoursing, precious stones were brought, and compassed him about, his disciples from whom the commencement of his preaching should be made. Verse 4. He asked life, and thou gavest him. He asked a resurrection, saying, Father, Glorify thy Son, and thou gavest it him, length of days for ever and ever, the prolonged ages of this world which the church was to have, and after them an eternity, world without end. Verse 5. 
His glory is great in thy salvation. Great indeed is his glory in the salvation whereby thou hast raised him up again. Glory and great honor shalt thou lay upon him. But thou shalt yet add unto him glory and great honor when thou shalt place him in heaven at thy right hand. Verse 6 For thou shalt give him blessing for ever and ever. This is the blessing which thou shalt give him for ever and ever. Thou shalt make him glad in joy together with thy countenance. According to his manhood, thou shalt make him glad together with thy countenance, which he lifted up to thee. Verse 7 For the king hopeth in the Lord. For the king is not proud, but humble in heart. He hopeth in the Lord. And in the mercy of the Most Highest, he shall not be moved, and in the mercy of the Most Highest, his obedience even unto the death of the cross shall not disturb his humility. Verse 8. Let thy hand be found by all thine enemies. Be thy power, O king, when thou comest to judgment, found by all thine enemies, who in thy humiliation discerned it not. Let thy right hand find out all that hate thee, let the glory wherein thou reignest at the right hand of the Father find out for punishment in the day of judgment all that hate thee, for that now they have not found it. Verse 9. Thou shalt make them like a fiery oven. Thou shalt make them on fire within, by the consciousness of their ungodliness, in the time of thy countenance, in the time of thy manifestation. The Lord shall trouble them in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. And then, being troubled by the vengeance of the Lord, after the accusation of their conscience, they shall be given up to eternal fire to be devoured. Verse 10. Their fruit shall thou destroy out of the earth. Their fruit, because it is earthly, shall thou destroy out of the earth, and their seed from the sons of men and their works, or whomsoever they have seduced, thou shalt not reckon among the sons of men whom thou hast called into the everlasting inheritance. Verse 11. Because they turned evils against thee, now this punishment shall be recompensed to them, because the evils which they supposed to hang over them by thy reign they turned against thee to thy death. They imagined a device which they were not able to establish. They imagined a device saying, It is expedient that one die for all, which they were not able to establish, not knowing what they said. Verse 12 For thou shalt set them low, for thou shalt rank them among those from whom in degradation and contempt thou wilt turn away. In thy leavings thou shalt make ready their countenance, and in these things that thou leavest, that is, in the desires of an earthly kingdom, thou shalt make ready their shamelessness for thy passion. Verse 13. Be thou exalted, O Lord, in thy strength. Be thou, Lord, whom in humiliation they did not discern, exalted in thy strength which they thought weakness. We will sing and praise thy power. In heart and in deed, we will celebrate and make known thy marvels. End of Psalm 21. Psalm 22 of Exposition on the Book of Psalms. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Exposition on the Book of Psalms by St. Augustine of Hippo, translated by Philip Schaff. Psalm 22. First Exposition. To the end, for the taking up of the morning, a psalm of David. To the end, for his own resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ himself speaketh. For in the morning, on the first day of the week, was his resurrection whereby he was taken up into eternal life, over whom death shall have no more dominion. Now, what follows is spoken in the person of the crucified. 
For from the head of the psalm are the words which he cried out whilst hanging on the cross, sustaining also the person of the old man, whose mortality he bare. For our old man was nailed together with him to the cross. Verse 1. O God, my God, look upon me. Why hast thou forsaken me far from my salvation, far removed from my salvation? For salvation is far from sinners, the words of my sins. For these are not the words of righteousness, but of my sins. For it is the old man nailed to the cross that speaks, ignorant even of the reason why God hath forsaken him. Or else it may be thus, the words of my sins are far from my salvation. Verse 2. My God, I will cry unto thee in the daytime, and thou wilt not hear. My God, I will cry unto thee in the prosperous circumstances of this life, that they be not changed, and thou wilt not hear, because I shall cry unto thee in the words of my sins, and in the night season, and not to my folly. And so, in the adversities of this life, will I cry to thee for prosperity, and in like manner thou wilt not hear. And this thou doest not to my folly, but rather that I may have wisdom to know what thou wouldest have me cry for, not with the words of sins out of longing for life temporal, but with the words of turning to thee for life eternal. Verse 3. But thou dwellest in the holy place, O thou praise of Israel. But thou dwellest in the holy place, and therefore wilt not hear the unclean words of sins, the praise of him that seeth thee, not of him who hath sought his own praise in tasting of the forbidden fruit, that on the opening of his bodily eyes he should endeavor to hide himself from thy sight. Verse 4. Our fathers hoped in thee, all the righteous, namely, who sought not their own praise, but thine. They hoped in thee, and thou deliveredest them. Verse 5. They cried unto thee, and were saved. They cried unto thee, not in the words of sins, from which salvation is far, and therefore were they saved. They hoped in thee, and were not confounded. They hoped in thee, and their hope did not deceive them, for they placed it not in themselves. Verse 6. But I am a worm, and no man. But I, speaking now, not in the person of Adam, but I, in my own person, Jesus Christ, was born without human generation in the flesh, that I might be as man beyond men, that so at least human pride might deign to imitate my humility, the scorn of men, and outcast of the people, in which humility I was made the scorn of men, so as that it should be said as a reproachful railing, Be thou his disciple, and that the people despise me. Verse 7 all that saw me laughed me to scorn, all that saw me derided me, and spake with the lips and shook the head, and they spoke not with the heart, but with the lips. For they shook their head in derision, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him save him, since he desireth him. These were their words, but they were spoken with the lips. Verse 9 since thou art he who drew me out of the womb, since thou art he who drew me not only out of that virgin womb, for this is the law of all men's birth, that they be drawn out of the womb, but also out of the womb of the Jewish nation, by the darkness whereof he is covered, and not yet born into the light of Christ, whosoever places his salvation in the carnal observance of the Sabbath, and of circumcision, and the like. My hope from my mother's breasts. My hope, O oh God, not from the time when I began to be fed by the milk of the virgin's breasts, for it was even before, but from the breasts of the synagogue, as I have said, out of the womb thou hast drawn me, that I should not suck in the customs of the flesh. Verse 10. I have been strengthened in thee from the womb. It is the womb of the synagogue, which did not carry me, but threw me out. But I fell not, for thou heldest me. From my mother's womb thou art my God. From my mother's womb, my mother's womb did not cause that. As a babe, I should be forgetful of thee. 
thou art my God. Verse 11, depart not from me, for trouble is hard at hand. Thou art therefore my God, depart not from me, for trouble is nigh unto me, for it is in my body, for there is none to help, for who helpeth if thou helpest not? Verse 12, many calves come about me, the multitude of the wanton populace came about me, fat bulls closed me in, and their leaders, glad at my oppression, closed me in. Verse 13, they open their mouths upon me, they open their mouth upon me, not out of thy scripture, but of their own lusts, as a ravening and roaring lion, as a lion whose ravening is that I was taken and led, and whose roaring, crucify, crucify. Verse 14, I was poured out like water, and all my bones were scattered. I was poured out like water when my persecutors fell, and through fear the stays of my body, that is, the church, my disciples were scattered from me. My heart became as melting wax in the midst of my belly. My wisdom, which was written of me in the sacred books, was, as if hard and shut up, not understood. But after that, the fire of my passion was applied. It was, as if melted, manifested, and entertained in the memory of my church. Verse 15. My strength dried up as a potsherd. My strength dried up by my passion. Not as hay, but a potsherd, which is made stronger by fire and my tongue cleaved to my jaws. And they, through whom I was soon to speak, kept my precepts in their hearts. And thou broughtest me down to the dust of death, and to the ungodly appointed to death, whom the wind casteth forth dust from the face of the earth, thou broughtest me down. Verse 16. For many dogs come about me, for many came about me, barking, not for truth, but for custom, the counsel of the malignant came about me. The counsel of the malignant besieged me. They pierced my hands and feet. They pierced with nails my hands and feet. Verse 17. They numbered distinctly all my bones. They numbered distinctly all my bones while extended on the wood of the cross. Yea, these same regarded and beheld me. Yea, these same, that is, unchanged, regarded and beheld me. Verse 18, they divided my garments for themselves and cast the lot upon my vesture. Verse 19, but thou, O Lord, withhold not thy help far from me, but thou, O Lord, raise me up again, not as the rest of men at the end of the world, but immediately look to my defense, look that they in no wise hurt me. Verse 20, Deliver my soul from the sword, deliver my soul from the tongue of dissension, and my only one from the hand of the dog, and from the power of the people, barking after their custom, deliver my church. Verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth, save me from the mouth of the kingdom of this world, and my humility from the horns of the unicorns, and from the loftiness of the proud, exalting themselves to special preeminence and enduring no partakers save my humility. Verse 22. I will declare thy name to my brethren. I will declare thy name to the humble and to my brethren that love one another as they have been beloved by me. In the midst of the church will I sing of thee. In the midst of the church will I with rejoicing preach thee. Verse 23. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. Ye that fear the Lord, seek not your own praise, but praise him. All ye seed of Jacob, magnify him. All ye seed of him whom the elder shall serve, magnify him. Let all the seed of Israel fear him. Let all who have been born to a new life and restored to the vision of God fear him. Verse 24 since he hath not despised nor disregarded the prayer of the poor man, since he hath not despised the prayer, not of him who, crying unto God in the words of sins, was loath to overpass a vain life, but the prayer of the poor man, 
not swollen up with transitory pomps, nor hath he turned away his face from me, as from him who said, I will cry unto thee, but thou wilt not hear. And when I cried unto him, he heard me. Verse 25. With thee is my praise, for I seek not mine own praise, for thou art my praise, who dwellest in the holy place. And, praise of Israel, thou hearest the Holy One now beseeching thee. In the great church I will confess thee. In the church of the whole world I will confess thee. I will offer my vows in the sight of them that fear him. I will offer the sacraments of my body and blood in the sight of them that fear him. Verse 26. The poor shall eat and be filled. The humble and the despisers of the world shall eat and imitate me. For so they will neither desire this world's abundance nor fear its want. And they shall praise the Lord who seek him. For the praise of the Lord is the pouring out of that fullness. Their hearts shall live for ever and ever, for that food is the food of the heart. Verse 27. All the borders of the earth shall remember themselves and be turned to the Lord. They shall remember themselves, for by the Gentiles, born in death and bent on outward things, God had been forgotten. And then shall all the borders of the earth be turned to the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship in his sight, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship in their own consciences. Verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he shall rule over the nations. For the kingdom is the Lord's, not proud men's, and he shall rule over the nations. Verse 29. All the rich of the earth have eaten and worshipped. The rich of the earth, too, have eaten the body of their Lord's humiliation. And though they have not, as the poor, been filled even to imitation, yet they have worshipped. In his sight shall fall all that descend to earth, for he alone seeth how all they fall, who, abandoning a heavenly conversation, make choice on earth to appear happy to men, who see not their fall. And my soul shall live to him, and my soul, which in the contempt of this world seems to men, as it were to die, shall live, not to itself, but to him, and my seed shall serve him. Verse 30. And my deeds, or they who through me believe on him, shall serve him. Verse 31. The generation to come shall be declared to the Lord. The generation of the New Testament shall be declared to the honor of the Lord. And the heaven shall declare his righteousness. And the evangelist shall declare his righteousness to a people that shall be born whom the Lord hath made, to a people that shall be born to the Lord through faith. Second Exposition a sermon delivered on the anniversary of the Lord's Passion. What God would not have passed over in silence in his scripture must not either by us be passed over in silence, and by you must be heard. The Lord's Passion, as we know, happened once, for once hath Christ died, the just for the unjust. And we know, and are sure, and hold fast, with faith unshaken, that Christ rising from the dead dieth no more, and death shall have no more dominion over him. These are the apostles' words. Yet, that we may not forget what once occurred, it is transacted in our memory every year. Does Christ die as often as the Easter celebration comes round? But yet, the yearly memorial does, as it were, represent what occurred long since, and causes in us such emotions as if we saw the Lord hanging on the cross not of course as mocking but believing in him for as he hung on the cross he was mocked as he sitteth in heaven he is worshipped or haply is he mocked still and now we must not be angry with the jews who mocked him at all events as he was dying not as he was reigning and who is there who mocks christ still would it were one would it were two would that they could be numbered All the chaff of his threshing floor mocks him, and the wheat sighs for the mocking of the Lord. 
This I would sigh for with you, for it is the season of sorrow. The Lord's passion is in course of celebration. It is the season of sighing, the season of weeping, the season of confession and supplication. And which of us is sufficient for shedding tears answerable to the just demands of so great sorrow? But what now saith the prophet, who will give my head water and mine eyes a fountain of tears? If there were really a fountain of tears in our eyes, even this would not suffice Christ mocked in a matter that is clear, in a matter where no one can say, I understood it not. For to him who possesses the whole world a part is offered, and to him who sitteth at the right hand of the Father it is said, See what thou hast here, and for the whole earth Africa alone is shewn him. The words which we have just heard, brethren, where shall we place them? Oh, that they could be written with our tears. Who was the woman who came in with the ointment? Of what was she the type? Was she not of the church? Whereof was the ointment the figure? Was it not of that sweet savor of which the apostle says, We are a sweet savor of Christ in every place? For the apostle too was speaking in the person of the same church. In the words, We are, he said, to the faithful. And what said he? We are a sweet savor of Christ in every place. In every place, Paul said that all the faithful are a sweet savor of Christ, and he is contradicted, and it is said, Africa alone has a sweet savor, all the world besides stinketh. Who says, We are a sweet savor of Christ in every place? The church. This sweet savor, that box of ointment figured, with which the Lord was anointed. Let us see if the Lord himself do not also bear witness to it. When some who sought their own things, covetous thieves, that is, that Judas, said of the ointment, to what purpose is this loss? The costly thing might be sold and benefit the poor, for he wished to sell the sweet savor of Christ. What was the Lord's answer? Why trouble ye the woman? She hath wrought a good work upon me, and what shall I say more? When he himself said, And wheresoever the gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told. Is there aught to add to this? Is there aught to take away? Is there any reason why we should lend our ears to revilers? Has the Lord spoken this falsely, or been deceived? Let them make their choice which to say, let them say either that the truth hath spoken falsely, or let them say that the truth was deceived. Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached, and as if thou wouldest ask him, but where shall it be preached? He answers, in the whole world. Let us listen to the psalm, let us see if it say the same. Let us listen to that which is sung in lamentation, and truly a matter it is worthy of plaint when it is sung to the deaf. I wonder, brethren, if this psalm is read today among the party of the Donatists too. I ask you, my brethren, I confess to you, Christ's mercy knoweth that I wonder thus, as though they were made of stone, and cannot hear. What thing more plain can be spoken to the deaf? Christ's passion is set forth as clearly as the gospel, and it was written, I know not how many years before the Lord was born of the Virgin Mary. It was a herald announcing the future judge. Let us peruse it as far as the stress of time permits, not as the promptings of our sorrow would move us, but as, I said, as far as the stress of time permits. Verse 1. O God, my God, look upon me. Why hast thou forsaken me? This first verse we heard on the cross where the Lord said, Eli, Eli, that is, my God, my God, Lama Sabachthani, which is, why hast thou forsaken me? The evangelist hath interpreted this, and said that he spoke in the Hebrew tongue, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What did the Lord intend to say? For God had not forsaken him, for as much as he was himself God, of course as the Son of God, God, of course as the Word of God, God. Here, at the very commencement, 
that evangelist who poured forth what he had drunk in the Lord's breast. Let us see whether Christ be God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The very Word then that was God was made flesh and dwelt in us. And when the Word, God, was made flesh, he was hanging on the cross and said, My God, my God, look upon me, why hast thou forsaken me? Why is it said, but because we were there, but because the church is the body of Christ? Wherefore, said he, my God, my God, look upon me, why hast thou forsaken me? Unless in some sort as rousing our attention and saying, was this psalm written concerning me? Far from my salvation are the words of my sins. What sins in him of whom it is said, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth? How then saith he, My sins, unless that he prayeth for our sins, and made our sins his sins, that he might make his righteousness our righteousness? Verse 2 My God, I will cry unto thee in the daytime, and thou wilt not hear, and in the night season, and not to my folly. He spake, of course, of me, of thee, of such an one, for he bare his body, that is, the church. Unless haply ye think, brethren, that when the Lord said, Father, if it be possible that this cup pass from me, he was afraid to die. The soldier is not braver than the captain. It is enough for the servant that he be as his Lord. Paul, a soldier of Christ, the king says, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to be dissolved and to be with Christ. He wishes for death that he may be with Christ, and is Christ himself afraid of death? But what bear he but our weakness, and in behalf of those who, having a place in his body, yet fear death, did he speak thus? Hence came that voice, it was the voice of his members, not of the head, and so also in these words, I have cried by day and by night season, and thou wilt not hear. For many cry in tribulation, and are not heard, but unto salvation, not to folly. Paul cried that the thorn in the flesh might be taken away from him, and he was not heard for it to be taken away. And it was said to him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore was he not heard, but not to folly, but to wisdom, to the end that man may understand that God is a physician, and that tribulation is a remedy for salvation, not a punishment for condemnation. While under treatment thou art cauterized, cut, Christ out. The physician heeds not for thy wish, but he heeds for thy health. Verse 3. But thou dwellest in the holy place, O thou praise of Israel. Thou dwellest in them whom thou hast sanctified, and whom thou makest to understand that some to their profit thou hearest not, and some to their condemnation thou hearest. To his prophet Paul was not heard, to condemnation the devil was heard. He asked to tempt Job, and it was granted. The devils asked to go into the swine, and they were heard. Devils are heard, an apostle is not heard, but they are heard unto condemnation. The apostle is not heard unto salvation. For not to my folly, but thou dwellest in the holy place, O thou praise of Israel. Why dost thou not even hear thine own? Why say I this? Remember, that it is always said, Thanks be to God. And there is a great concourse here, and those who are not in the habit of coming have come. I say to all that the Christian, when under tribulation, is tried, whether he have not forsaken his God. For when it is well with a man, the Christian is left to himself. The fire is brought to the furnace, and the refiner's furnace is a thing of high mysterious meaning. There is gold there, there is chaff, there is fire working in a confined space. This fire is not diverse, yet its effects are diverse. It turns chaff into ashes, from gold it takes away its impurities. Now they in whom God dwelleth are assuredly made better in tribulation, proved as gold. And if perchance the adversary, the devil, ask to prove any, and it be granted him, whether by some bodily pain, or some loss, or bereavement, let him keep his heart fixed on him who withdraweth not himself, 
and if he seem to withdraw his ear from his lamentations, yet he sheweth mercy to his supplications. He who made us knoweth what to do, he knoweth how to remake us. He is a good builder who built the house, and if anything therein hath fallen to decay, he knoweth how to repair it. And see what he says. Verse 4. Our fathers hoped in thee, they hoped, and thou didst deliver them. We know and read how many of our fathers God hath delivered who hoped in him. He delivered the whole people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He delivered the three children out of the fiery furnace. He delivered Daniel out of the den of lions. He delivered Susanna from a false accusation. They all called upon him and were delivered. What? Was he wanting to his own son that he should not hear him when he was hanging on the cross? But why is he not delivered forthwith, who said, Our fathers hoped in thee, and thou didst deliver them? Verse 6. But I am a worm, and no man. A worm, and no man. For a man is a worm also, but he is a worm, and no man. How no man? Because God. Why then did he so abase himself as to say a worm? Is it because a worm is born of the flesh without coition? as Christ of the Virgin Mary? But a worm even, and yet no man. Why a worm? Because mortal, because born of the flesh, because born without coition. Why not a man? Because the word was in the beginning, and the word was with God, and the word was God. A scorn of men, and the outcast of the people. Consider how great things he suffered. Now that we may speak of the passion, and that we may approach it with the greater grief, Consider first how great things he suffers, and then consider wherefore. For what was the fruit thereof? Lo, our fathers hoped, and were delivered out of the land of Egypt. And as I said, so many called upon God, and immediately at the time, not in the life to come, but forthwith were delivered. Job himself was given up to the devil at his request, corrupted with worms, yet he recovered his health in this life, and received twice as much as he had lost. But the Lord was scourged, and there was none to help. He was defiled with spittle, and there was none to help. He was smitten with buffetings, and there was none to help. He was crowned with thorns, and there was none to help. He was raised on the tree, there was none to deliver. He cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There is no help. Wherefore, my brethren, wherefore? What the recompense of so great sufferings? All these his sufferings are a price. What so great sufferings are the price of? Let us repeat. Let us see what he says. Let us first inquire what he suffered. After that, wherefore? And let us see how much they are Christ's enemies, who confess that he endured so great sufferings, and take away the wherefore. Hence, let us hear the whole in this psalm, both what he suffered and wherefore. Keep to these two, the what and the wherefore. At present, let me explain the what. Let us not dwell at length on this, so the very words of the psalm will come to you the better. See what the Lord suffers. Take heed, ye Christians, the scorn of men and the outcast of the people. Verse 7. All that saw me laughed me to scorn. They spake with the lips and shook the head. Verse 8. He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him save him, since he desireth him. But why said they this? Because he was made man. They said it as against a man. Verse 9. Since thou art he who drew me out of the womb, would they ever say this to that which in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God? For that word, by which all things were made, was not drawn out of the womb, save that the word was made flesh and dwelt in us. Since thou hast drawn me out of the womb, my God, from my mother's breasts, for before the worlds, my father, from my mother's breasts, my God. Verse 10. I was cast upon thee from the womb. That is, that thou only shouldest be my hope, now as man, now as weak, now the word made flesh. From my mother's womb thou art my God. Not from thyself, my God, for from thyself, my father, but from my mother's womb, my God. Verse 11. 
depart not from me, for trouble is hard at hand, for there is none to help. See him forsaken, and woe to us if he forsake us, for there is none to help. Verse 12. Many calves come about me, fat bulls closed me in. The people and their leaders, the people, many calves, their leaders, fat bulls. Verse 13. They open their mouth upon me as a ravening and a roaring lion. Let us hearken to their roaring in the gospel. Crucify, crucify. Verse 14. I was poured out like water, and all my bones were scattered. He calleth his strong ones his bones, for his bones are strong in the body. When did he scatter his bones? When he said to them, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Then scattered he his strong ones, and he was poured out like water. For when water is poured out, it either cleanses or waters. Christ was poured out like water. The filthy were cleansed. Minds were watered. My heart became as melting wax in the midst of my belly. He calls the weak ones in his church his belly. How did his heart become as wax? His heart is his scripture, that is, his wisdom which was in the scriptures. For the scripture was closed. No one understood it. The Lord was crucified, and the scripture was melted like wax, that all the weak ones should understand it. For hence, too, the veil of the temple was rent, because what was veiled hath been unveiled. Verse 15. My strength dried up as a potsherd, gloriously expressed, for my name has been made stronger by tribulation. For as a potsherd is before the fire soft, after the fire hard, so the Lord's name was before the passion despised, after the passion it is honored, and my tongue cleaved to my jaws. As that member in us is of use only for speaking, so he said that his preachers, his tongue, cleaved to his jaws, that from his inward parts they might derive wisdom. And thou broughtest me down to the dust of death. For many dogs came about me, the counsel of the malignant ones came about me. See here the very gospel, they pierced my hands and my feet. Then were the wounds made, the scars whereof the doubting disciple handled. The same who said, Unless I shall put my fingers into the scars of his wounds, I will not believe. Whereupon he said to him, Come, thou heart of belief, put thy hand. And he put his hand and cried out, My Lord and my God. And he answered, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that see not and believe. They pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 17. They numbered distinctly all my bones. When he was hanging extended on the tree, the extension of his body on the tree could not be better described than by the words, they numbered distinctly all my bones. Yea, they regarded and beheld me, they regarded and understood not, they beheld and saw not, they lifted up their eyes to the flesh, not their heart unto the word. Verse 18, they divided my garments for themselves, his garments, his sacraments, Mark, brethren, his garments, his sacraments, could be divided by heresies, but there was a garment which no one divided, and cast a lot upon my vesture. There was there, says the evangelist, a coat woven from above, from heaven therefore, from the Father therefore, from the Holy Ghost therefore. What is this coat but love, which no man can divide? What is this coat but unity? Upon it is the lot cast, no man divideth it. The sacraments heretics have been able to divide for themselves, they have not divided love, and because they could not divide it, they withdrew, but it abideth entire, it falls by lot to some, whoso hath it is safe, no one moves him from the church catholic, and if being without he begin to have it, he is received within, as the olive branch by the dove. Verse 19 but thou, O Lord, withhold not thy help far from me. And it was so. After three days he rose again. Look to my defense. Verse 20. Deliver my soul from the sword, that is, from death, from framia, is a sword, and by a sword. He would have us understand death, and thine only one from the hand of the dog. My soul, mine only one, the head and the body. 
By only one, he meant the church from the hand, that is, from the power of the dog. Who are dogs? They that bark like dogs, and understand not against whom. Nothing is done to them, and they bark. What will a man do to a dog when he is going on his way? Yet he barks. They that bark with blinded eyes, not discerning against whom or for whom are dogs. Verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth. You know who is the roaring lion going about and seeking whom he may devour, and my humility from the horns of the unicorns. By unicorns he would mean only the proud, therefore he added, my humility. You have heard what his sufferings were, and what he prayed, that he might be delivered from them. Let us now give heed to the wherefore he suffered. Now then, brethren, consider, whoso is not in that lot for which Christ suffered, wherefore he is a Christian. Lo, we know what he suffered. His bones were numbered distinctly. He was mocked. His garments were divided. Moreover, the lot was cast upon his vesture. Men in furiousness and raging stood around him, and all his bones were scattered. We hear it here, and we read it in the gospel. Let us see wherefore, O Christ, Son of God, if thou hadst not willed, thou couldst not suffer. O shew us the fruit of thy passion. Here, saith he, the fruit. I am not silent, but men are deaf. Here, saith he, the fruit wherefore I suffered all these things. Verse 22. I will declare thy name to my brethren. Let us see whether he declareth God's name to his brethren in any separate part. I will declare thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing of thee. So is it accomplished now. But let us see what the church is. For he said, In the midst of the church will I sing of thee. Let us see the church for which he suffered. Verse 23. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. Wheresoever God is feared and praised, there is the church of Christ. See, my brethren, whether in these days throughout the whole world it is said without a cause, Amen and Hallelujah. Is not God feared there? Is not God praised there? Donatus has gone out and says, He is altogether not feared. The whole world is lost. Without any reason thou sayest, the whole world is lost. Has then a small portion only remained in Africa? Doth Christ then say nothing, whereby to stop these men's mouths? Doth he say nothing, whereby to pluck out the tongues of such as speak thus? Let us see, if haply we may find. Still it is said to us, in the midst of the church, he speaketh of our church. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. Let us see whether they praise the Lord, and let us understand whether he speaketh of them, and whether in the midst of their church he be praised. How do they praise Christ who say, He hath lost the whole world, the devil hath taken all from him, and he hath remained in a part only? But let us look farther. Let him declare himself more openly. Let him speak more openly. Let it not be a matter for interpretation or conjecture. All ye seed of Jacob, magnify him. Perhaps they still say, We are the seed of Jacob. Let us see whether they be. Let all the seed of Israel fear him. Let them still say, We are the seed of Israel. Let us allow them. Let them say it. Verse 24. Since he hath not despised nor disregarded the prayer of the poor, what poor? Not they that rely upon themselves. Let us see whether they be poor who say, We are the righteous. Christ crieth out, Far from my salvation are the words of my sins. But let them still say what they will. Nor hath turned away his face from me. And when I cried unto him, he heard me. Wherefore heard he? To what purpose? Verse 25. With thee is my praise. With God he hath put his praise. He hath taught us not to rely on man. Let them still say what they will. Already indeed they begin to burn. The fire begins to draw nigh. There is none may hide himself from the heat thereof. But let them still say, We too have put our praise with him. We too rely not on ourselves. Let them still say so. In the great church will I confess thee. 
Now here, I suppose, he has begun to touch the quick. The great church brethren. What is it? Is a scanty portion of the earth the great church? The great church is the whole world. Now if one would wish to gainsay Christ, tell us thou hast said, In the great church I will confess thee. What great church? Thou art reduced to a morsel in Africa. The whole world thou hast lost. Thou hast shed thy blood for the whole, but thou hast suffered from the invader. Thus have we spoken to the Lord, as if by way of inquiry, yet knowing what we are about to say. Let us suppose that we do not know what he would say. Doth not he answer us? Peace, I will yet say what no one can raise a doubt about. Let us await, then, what he is about to say. I would wish at once to pass sentence, and not admit men to give any other explanation, for as much as Christ saith in the great church, and you say that he hath continued in an extreme part, and they still dare to say, and ours is the great church. What think you of Bege and Tamugade, if he say not something to stop their mouths, let them still say that the great church is Numidia only. Let us see, let us hear the Lord further, I will offer my vows in the sight of them that fear him. What are his vows? The sacrifice which he offered to God. Know ye what sacrifice? The faithful know the vows which he offered in the sight of them that fear him. For there follows, verse 26, The poor shall eat and be filled. Blessed poor who eat to the end that they may be filled. For it is the poor that eat, but they that are rich are not filled, because they are not hungry. The poor shall eat. From them came Peter the fisherman, from them came the other fishermen, John and James his brother, from them came too Matthew the publican. These were the poor who ate and were filled, having suffered such things as they ate. He gave his supper, he gave his passion, he is filled, who imitates it. The poor imitated it. For they so suffered as to follow Christ's footsteps. The poor shall eat, but why poor? And they shall praise the Lord who seek him. The rich praise themselves, the poor praise the Lord. Why are they poor? Because they praise the Lord and seek the Lord. The Lord is the riches of the poor. For therefore is the house empty, that the heart may be full of riches. Let the rich seek wherewith to fill their chest. The poor seek wherewith to fill their heart, and when they have filled it, they praise the Lord who seek him. And see, brethren, wherein they that are truly poor are rich, that it is not in the chest, not in the garner, not in the storehouse, their hearts shall live for ever and ever. Now then, give heed, the Lord hath suffered, all that ye have heard hath the Lord suffered. We ask why he suffered. And he begins to declare it. I will declare thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing of thee. But they still say, This is the church. Let all the seed of Israel fear him. They say, We are the seed of Israel. Since he hath not despised, nor disregarded the prayer of the poor, still they say, We are they. Nor hath he turned away his face from me. Christ the Lord himself hath not turned away his face from himself, that is, from his church which is his body. With thee is my praise. Ye would praise yourselves. But they answer, Nay, without a doubt, we too praise him. I will offer my vows unto the Lord in the sight of them that fear him, the sacrifice of peace, the sacrifice of love, the sacrifice of his body, the faithful know. On this I cannot now enlarge. I will offer my vows in the sight of them that fear him. Let the publicans eat, let the fishermen eat, let them feed, let them imitate the Lord, let them suffer, let them be filled. The Lord himself hath died, the poor die also. And the death of the disciples is added to the death of the master. Wherefore, give me the fruit. Verse 27. All the borders of the earth shall remember themselves and be turned to the Lord. See here, brethren, why ask ye of me what answer we should give to the Donatist party? Look at the psalm. Both among us is it read today, and among them is read today. Let us write it on our foreheads. Let us go forth with it. 
Let not our tongue keep silence. Let it repeat the words, See, Christ hath suffered. See, the merchant displayeth his gains. See, the price which he gave, his blood was shed. In a scrip he bare our price. He was smitten with a spear. The scrip was rent, and the price of the whole world floweth forth. What answereth thou, O heretic? Is it not the price of the whole world? Hath Africa only been redeemed? Thou darest not say, the whole world was redeemed, but is lost. From what spoiler's hand hath Christ so suffered as to lose his own possession? Lo, all the borders of the earth shall remember themselves, and be turned to the Lord. Let this satisfy thee, and let him speak. Had he said the ends of the earth, and not all the borders of the earth, they had been able to say, Lo, we have the ends of the earth in Mauritania. He said, All the borders of the earth. O heretic, he said, All. What outlet is there for thee to escape the difficulty? Outlet hast thou none, but thou hast whereby to enter. I appeal to you. I am unwilling to enlarge upon this, lest it should be said that my words are of any influence. Attend to the psalm. Read the psalm. Lo, Christ hath suffered. His blood hath been shed. Lo, our Redeemer. Lo, our price. Let me be told, what hath he brought? Why do we ask? What if one say to me, Why, O foolish man, dost thou ask? Thou hast the volume in thine hands. Thou hast therein wherewith he bought. Seek therein what he bought. Lo, there thou hast. All the borders of the earth shall remember themselves and be turned to the Lord. For the borders of the earth shall remember themselves. But heretics have forgotten, and therefore do they hear it every year. Do they give ear to this, think ye, when their reader says, All the borders of the earth shall remember themselves and turn to the Lord? Well, perchance it is but one verse. Thy thoughts were elsewhere. Thou wast talking idly with thy brother when he spoke thus. Mark how he repeats it and knocks at deaf man's ears. And all the kindreds of the nation shall worship in his sight. He is still deaf. He does not hear. Let the knocking be repeated. Verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he shall rule over the nations. Remember these three verses, brethren. Today have they been sung even among them, or it may be they have erased them. Believe me, my brethren, I am so embarrassed, I am so pressed, that I am astonished at the strange deafness and hardness of their hearts, that I sometimes doubt whether they have it in their copies. All run today to the church, all today attentively listen to the psalm, all listen with uplifted heart, but suppose that they are not attentive. Is it one verse only? All the borders of the earth shall remember themselves and be turned to the Lord. Thou art awaking, but art still rubbing thine eyes, and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship in his sight. Shake off sleep, thou art still drowsy. Listen, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he shall rule over the nations. Whether they have anything yet to allege, I know not. Let them contend with the scriptures, not with us. See the volume itself. Let them contend against it. Where is their saying, We preserve the scriptures from being burnt? They have been preserved, whereby thou mayest be burnt. What did ye preserve? Open, read. Thou didst preserve, and thou dost impugn them. Why preservest thou from the flames what thou wouldst destroy with the tongue? I do not believe. I do not believe that thou preservedest them. I do not at all believe it. Thou didst not preserve them. Most truly do our party say that thou didst deliver them up. He is proved to be the deliverer of them up, who when on reading the testament doth not follow it. See, it is read, and I follow. It is read, and thou refusest to follow. Whose hand hath cast them into the flames? He that believes and follows, or he that grieves that there is aught to be read. I do not wish to know who may have preserved them. In what place soever the volume hath been found, from what cave soever, our Father's testament hath come to light. For some thieves or other wish to take it away, some persecutors or other wish to burn it. From what place soever it hath been brought forth, let it be read. Why dost thou quarrel? We are brethren. Why do we quarrel? 
The father hath not died intestate, he hath made a testament, and so died. He died and rose again. So long does the dispute touching the inheritance of the dead last until the testament is publicly produced, and when the testament has been publicly produced, all are silent, that the instrument may be opened and read. The judge listens with attention, the advocates hold their peace, the heralds procure silence, every body is in suspense that the words of the deceased, unconscious in the tomb, may be read. He lies without consciousness in the tomb, and his words have force. Christ sitteth in heaven, and his testament gainsaid, Open, let us read, we are brethren, why do we contend together? Let us calm our temper, the Father hath not left us without a testament. He who made the testament liveth forever, he heareth our words, he recognizeth his own. Let us read, why do we quarrel? When the whole inheritance shall have been found, let us hold to it. Open the testament, read in the very beginning of the Psalter itself, ask of me. But who speaketh? Peradventure, not Christ. You have there, the Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The Son of God then speaketh, or the Father speaketh to his Son. What then saith he to his Son? Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the bounds of the earth for thy possession. It is usual, brethren, when there is a question of possession, for the borderers to be sought. Between this and that borderer the heir is sought out, either to whom it is given, or who it has brought it. Between what borders is he sought? between this and that man in possession. He who hath left all borders hath left no borders, wheresoever thou turnest thyself. Christ is. Thou hast the borders of the earth for thine inheritance. Come hither, with me possess the whole. Why by quarreling dost thou call to a part only? Come hither, to thine own good, thou shalt be conquered, thou shalt have the whole. Dost thou wrangle still? I have already read the testament, and thou wranglest, and thou still wrangling, because he said, The borders of the earth, and not all the borders of the earth. Let us read on then. How does it stand? All the borders of the earth shall remember themselves, and turn to the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship in his sight. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he shall rule over the nations. His it is, not yours. Acknowledge ye the Lord, acknowledge the Lord's possession. But ye again, because ye would possess your goods privately, and not in common unity, and with Christ, for ye wish to rule on earth yourselves, not to reign with him in heaven, ye have your own houses. And sometimes we come to them, saying, Let us seek the truth, let us find the truth. They answer, Keep what you have, thou hast thy sheep, I have mine. Forbear to meddle with my sheep, for I do not meddle with thine. Thanks be to God, the sheep are mine, the sheep are his. What hath Christ bought? Nay, let them be neither mine nor thine, but his. Who hath bought them? His who hath marked them. Neither is he that planteth anything, nor he that watereth, but God who giveth the increase. Why have I mine, and thou thine? If Christ be there, let mine go thither. But they are not mine. If Christ be here, let thine come hither, for they are not thine. Let us kiss head and hands for possessions, and let the strange children perish. It is not my possession, he says. What is this? Let us see whether it be not thy possession. Let us see whether thou dost not claim it for thyself. I labor for the name of Christ, thou for the name of Donatus. For if thou look to Christ, Christ is everywhere. Thou sayest, Lo, here is Christ. I say, He is throughout the world. Praise the Lord, ye servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Wherefrom do they praise? Whereunto do they praise? From the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Praise ye the name of the Lord. See the church which I shew to you. See what Christ hath bought. See what he hath redeemed. See for what he hath given his blood. But what sayest thou? I gather for him too. He that gathereth not with me, Christ saith, scattereth. Thou dividest unity. 
Thou seekest thine own possessions, and why have they Christ's name? Because for the defense of thine own possession thou hast affixed Christ's titles. Do not some do the same with their own houses? Lest some powerful person should attack his house, he affixes thereon the title of some powerful one, a false title. He would be himself the owner, and would have the front of his house protected by another man's title, that on reading the title one may be scared at the power of the name, and abstain from attacking the house. This they did when they condemned the Maximinianist. They pleaded before judges and induced their own counsel, as it were, shewing their titles, that they might appear to be bishops. Then the judge asked, Who is the other bishop here, of the party of Donatus? The official answered, We know none but Aurelius the Catholic. In fear of the laws they made answer of one bishop only, but they, that they might gain the ear of the judge affixed Christ's name, on their own possession they affixed his title. Gracious is the Lord to spare them, and claim that for his own possession, wheresoever he findeth his title, powerful is his mercy, who doeth that for them, who gathers together, whomsoever he findeth bearing the name of Christ. And consider, brethren, when any powerful one findeth his title, doth he not justly claim it for his own, and say, He would not affix my title, unless it were my property. He hath affixed my title, it is my property, that whereon I find my name, is mine. Does he change the title? The title is the very same as before. The owner is changed, the title is not changed. So also, with those who have the baptism of Christ, if they return to unity, we do not change or destroy their title, but we acknowledge the title of our king, the title of our captain. But what do we say, O wretched house, may he own thee, whose title thou bearest? Thou bearest Christ's title, be not the possession of Donatus. We have spoken at great length, brethren, but let not that which is read today, depart from your recollection. Lo, I repeat it, and often must it be repeated, by this very day, that is, by the mysteries of this day, I adjure you that it go not out of your hearts. All the borders of the earth shall remember themselves and be turned to the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship in his sight, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he shall rule over the nations. Against so clear and so manifestly, proven a possession of Christ. Listen not to the words of the wrangler. Whatever they say to gainsay it, they are men that say it. But this God saith. End of Psalm 22